Section 1 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Night Among the Horses by Juna Barnes. Recording by Marion Carwin. Toward dusk, in the summer of the year, a man dressed in a frock coat and top hat and carrying a cane crept through the underbrush bordering the corral of the buckler farm as he moved small twigs snapped fell and were silent his knees were green from wounded shrubbery and grass and his outspread hands tore unheeded plants his wrists hurt him and he rested from time to time always caring for his hat and knotted yellow cane blowing through his moustache Dew had been falling, covering the twilight leaves like myriad faces, damp with the perspiration of the struggle for existence. And a half mile away, standing out against the darkness of the night, a grove of white birches shimmered like teeth in a skull. He heard the creaking of a gate and the splashing of late rain into the depths of a dark cistern. His heart ached with the nearness of the earth the faint murmur of it moving upon itself like a sleeper who turns to throw an arm about a beloved a frog began moaning among the skunk cabbages and john thrust his hand deep into his bosom something somnolent seemed to be here and he wondered it was like a deep heavy yet soft prison where without sin one may suffer intolerable punishment presently he went on feeling his way he reached a high plank fence and sensing it with his fingers he lay down resting his head against the ground he was tired he wanted to sleep but he searched for his hat and cane and straightened out his coat beneath him before he turned his eyes to the stars and now he could not sleep and wondered why he had thought of it something quick was moving the earth it seemed to live to shake with sudden immensity he heard a dog barking, and the dim light from the farm window kept winking as the trees swung against its square of light. The odor of daisies came to him in the assuring, powerful smell of the stables. He opened his mouth and drew in his mustache. A faint tumult had begun. A tremor ran under the length of his body and trembled off into the earth like a shudder of joy, died down, and repeated itself and presently he began to tremble, answering, throwing out his hands, curling them up weakly, as if the earth were withholding something precious, necessary. His hat fell off, striking a log with a dull, hollow sound, and he pressed his red moustache against the grass, weeping. Again he heard it, felt it. A hundred hoofs beat upon the earth, and he knew the horses had gone wild in the corral on the other side of the fence. For animals greet the summer, striking the earth, as friends strike the back of friends. He knew, he understood, a hail to summer, to life, to death. He drew himself against the bars, pressing his eyes under them, peering, waiting. He heard them coming up across the heavy turf, rounding the curve in the willow road. He opened his eyes and closed them again. The soft, menacing sound deepened, as heat deepens, strikes through the skin into the very flesh, head on, with long legs rising, falling, rising again, striking the ground insanely, like needles taking terrible impossible and purposeless stitches. He saw their bellies, fawn-colored, pitching from side to side, flashing by, straining the fence, and he rose up on his feet and silently, swiftly, fled on beside them. Something delirious, hysterical, came over him and he fell. Blood trickled into his eyes down from his forehead. It had a fine feeling for a moment, like a mane, like that roan mare's mane that had passed him red and long and splendid. He lifted his hand and closed his eyes once more, but the soft pounding did not cease. 
though now, in his sitting position, it only jogged him imperceptibly, as a child on a knee. It seemed to him that he was smothering, and he felt along the side of his face, as he had done in youth when they had put a cap on him that was too large. Twining green things moist with earth blood crept over his fingers. The hot impatient leaves pressed in, and the green of the matted grass was deathly thick. He had heard about the freeness of nature, thought it was so, and it was not so. A trailing ground pine had torn up small blades in its journey across the hill, and a vine, wrist thick, twisted about a pale oak, hideously, gloriously killing it, dragging it into dust. A wax patrick pipe leaned against his neck, staring with black eyes, and John opened his mouth, running his tongue across his lips, snapping it off, sighing. Move as he would, the grass was always under him, and the crackling of last autumn's leaves and last summer's twigs minute dead of the infinite greatness troubled him something portentous seemed connected with the patient noises about him an acorn dropped striking a thin fine powder out of a frail oak pod he took it up tossing it he had never liked to see things fall he sat up with the dim thunder of the horses far off but quickening his heart he went over the scene he had with Frida Buckler back there in the house. The long quivering spears of pot grass standing by the window as she walked up and down, pulling at them, talking to him. Small, with cunning, fiery eyes and a pink and pointed chin. A daughter of a mother who had known too many admirers in her youth. A woman with an ample lap, on which she held a Persian kitten, or a trifle of fruit. Bounty, avarice, desire, intelligence, both of them had always what they wanted. He blew down his mustache again, thinking of Frida in her floating yellow veil, that he had called ridiculous. She had not been angry. He was nothing but a stable boy then. It was the way with those small, intriguing women, whose nostrils were made delicate, through the pain of many generations, that they might quiver whenever they caught a whiff of the stables. As near as they can get to the earth, he had said, and was Frida angry? She stroked his arm, always softly, looking away, an inner bitterness drawing down her mouth. She said, walking up and down quickly, looking ridiculously small, I'm always gentle, John, frowning trailing her veil, thrusting out her chin. He answered, I liked it better where I was. Horses, she said, showing sharp teeth, are nothing for a man with your bile, poi boy, curry comber, smelling of saddle soap. Lovely. She shriveled up her nose, touching his arm. Yes, but better things I will show you. You shall be a gentleman. Fine clothes. You will like them. They feel nice. And laughing, she turned on one high heel, sitting down. I like horses. They make people better. You are amusing, intelligent. You will see. A lackey, he returned passionately, throwing up his arm. What is there in this for you? What are you trying to do to me? The family? Askance, perhaps? I don't know. He sat down, pondering. He was getting used to it, or thought he was, all but his wordy remonstrances. He knew better when thinking of his horses, realizing that when he should have married this small, unpleasant, and clever woman, he would know them no more. It was a game between them. Which was the shrewder? Which would win out? He, a boy of ill-breeding, grown from the gutter, fancied by this woman because he had called her ridiculous, or for some other reason that he would never know. This kind of person never tells the truth, and this, more than most things, troubled him. Was he a thing to be played with, debased into something better than he was? 
than he knew, partly because he was proud of himself in the costume of a groom, partly because he was timid, he desired to get away, to go back to the stables. He walked up to the mirrors as if to challenge them, peering in. He knew he would look absurd, and then knew, with shame, that he looked splendidly better than most of the gentlemen that Frieda Buckler knew. He hated himself, a man who had grown out of the city streets, a fine common thing. She saw him looking into the mirrors, one after the other, and drew her mouth down. She got up, walking beside him in the end, between him and them, taking his arm. You shall enter the army. You shall rise to general, or lieutenant, at least. And there are horses there, and the sound of stirrups. With that physique you will be happy. Authority, you know, she said, shaking her chin, smiling. Very well, but a common soldier. As you like. Afterward. Afterward. Very well, a common soldier. He sensed something strange in her voice, a sort of irony, and it took the patience out of him. I have always been common. I could commit crimes, easily, gladly. I'd like to. She looked away. That's natural, she said faintly. It's an instinct all strong men have. She knew what was troubling him. Thwarted instincts, common beautiful instincts that he was being robbed of. He wanted to do something final to prove his lower order, caught himself making faces, idiot faces, and she laughed. If only your ears stuck out, chin receded, she said, you might look degenerate, common, but as it is, and he would creep away in hat, coat, and cane to peer at his horses, never daring to go in near them. Sometimes, when he wanted to weep, he would smear one glove with harness grease, but the other one he held behind his back, pretending one was enough to prove his revolt. She would torment him with vases, books, and pictures, making a fool of him gently, persistently, making him doubt by cruel means, the means of objects he was not used to, eternally taking him out of his sphere. We have the best collection of miniatures she would say with one knee on a low ottoman, bringing them out in her small palm. Here, look. He would put his hands behind him. She was a great woman, Lucretia Borgia. Do you know history? She put it back again because he did not answer, letting his mind, a curious one, torment itself. You love things very much, don't you? She would question because she knew that he had a passion for one thing only. She kept placing new ladders beneath his feet only to saw them off at the next rung, making him nothing more than a nervous, irritable experiment. He was uneasy, like one given food to smell and not to taste, and for a while he had not wanted to taste, and then curiosity began, and he wanted to, and he also wanted to escape and he could do neither. Well, after he had married her, what then? Satisfy her whim, and where would he be? He would be nothing, neither what he had been, nor what other people were. This seemed to him, at times, her wish, a sort of place between lying down and standing up, a cramped position, a slow death, a curious woman. This same evening he had looked at her attentively for the first time. Her hair was rather pretty, though too mousy, yet just in the nape of the neck, where it met the lawn of the collar, it was very attractive. She walked well for a little woman, too. Sometimes she would pretend to be lively, would run a little, catch herself at it, as if she had not intended to do it, and calm down once more, or, creeping up to him, Stroking his arm, talking to him, she would walk beside him softly, slowly, that he might not step out, that he would have to crawl across the carpet. Once he had thought of trying her with honesty, with the truth of the situation. Perhaps she would give him an honest answer, 
and he tried. Now, Miss Rita, just a word. What are you trying to do? What is it you want? What is there in me that could interest you? I want you to tell me. I want to know. I have got to ask someone. I haven't got anyone to ask but you. And for a moment she almost relented, only to discover that she could not if she had wished. She did not know always what she meant herself. I'll tell you, she said, hoping that this somehow might lead her into the truth. For herself, if not for him. But it did not. You are a little nervous. You will get used to it. You will even grow to like it. Be patient. You will learn soon enough that there is nothing in the world so agreeable as climbing, changing. Well, he said, trying to read her, and then, that's all. You will regret the stables in the end. That's all. Her nostrils quivered. A light came into her eyes, a desire to defy, to be defied. And then on his last night he had done something terrible. He had made a blunder. There had been a party. The guests, a lot of them, were mostly drunk or touched with drink, and he too had too much. He remembered having thrown his arms about a tall woman, gowned in black with loose shoulder straps, dragging her through a dance. He had even sung a bit of a song, madly, wildly, horribly, and suddenly he had been brought up sharp by the fact that no one thought his behavior strange, that no one even thought him presumptuous. Frida's mother had not even moved or dropped the kitten from her lap where it sat, its loud resolute purr, shaking the satin of her gown. And he felt that Frida had got him where she wanted him, between two rungs. Going directly up to her, he said, You are ridiculous and twirled his mustache, spitting into the garden, and he knew nothing about what happened until he found himself in the shrubbery crawling toward the corral, through the dusk and the dampness of the leaves, carrying his cane, making sure of his hat, looking up at the stars. And now he knew why he had come. He was with his horses again. His eyes, pressed against the bars, stared in. The black stallion in the lead had been his special pet, a rough animal, but kindly, knowing, and here they were once more, tearing up the grass, galloping about in the night, like a ballroom full of real people, people who wanted to do things, who did what they wanted to do. He began to crawl through the bars, slowly, deftly, and when halfway through he paused, thinking. Presently he went on again, and drawing himself into the corral, his hat and cane thrown in before him, he lay there mouth to the grass. They were still running, but less madly. One of them had gone up the willow road leading into a farther pasture, in a flare of dust, through which it looked immense and faint. On the top of the hill three or four horses were standing, testing the weather. He would mount one, he would ride away, he would escape and his horses, the things he knew, would be his escape. Bareback, he thought, would be like the days when he had taken what he could from the rush of the streets. Joy, exhilaration, life, and he was not afraid. He wanted to stand up, to cry aloud, and he saw ten or twelve of them rounding the curve, and he did stand up. They did not seem to know him, did not seem to know what to make of him, and he stared at them wondering. He did not think of his white shirt front, his sudden arising, the darkness, their excitement. Surely they would know in a moment more. Wheeling, flaring their wet nostrils, throwing up their manes, striking the earth in a quandary, they came on, whinnied faintly, and he knew what it was to be afraid. He had never been afraid, and he went down on his knees, with a new horror in his heart. He damned them. He turned his eyes up, but he could not open them. He thought rapidly, calling on Frida in his heart, speaking tenderly, promising. A flare of heat passed his throat and descended into his bosom. I want to live. I can do it. Damn it. I can do it. 
I can forge ahead, make my mark. He forgot where he was for a moment, and found new pleasure in this spoken admission, this new rebellion. He moved with a faint shaking of the earth, like a child on a woman's lap. The upraised hoofs of the first horse missed him, but the second did not, and presently the horses drew apart, nibbling here and there, switching their tails, avoiding a patch of tall grass. End of A Night Among the Horses by Juna Barnes Section number two of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dreams, Waking Thoughts, and Incidents in a Series of Letters from Various Parts of Europe by William Beckford, 1760 to 1844. British Art Collector writer wealthy author of the oriental novel vathek in 1786 letter one june 19th 1780 shall i tell you my dreams to give an account of my time is doing i assure you but little better never did there exist a more ideal being a frequent mist hovers before my eyes and through its medium i see objects so faint and hazy that both their colors and forms are apt to delude me this is a rare confession say the wise for a traveler to make pretty accounts will such a one give of outlandish countries his correspondence must reap great benefit no doubt from such purblind observations but stop my good friends patience a moment I really have not the vanity of pretending to make a single remark during the whole of my journey if be contented with my visionary way of gazing i am perfectly pleased and shall write away as freely as mr a mr b mr c and a million others whose letters are the admiration of the politest circles all through kent did i doze as usual now and then I opened my eyes to take in an idea or two of the green woody country through which I was passing and then closed them again Transported myself back to my native hills Thought I led a choir of those I loved best through their shades and was happy in the arms of illusion The Sun set before I recovered my senses enough to discover plainly the variegated slopes near Canterbury waving with slender birch trees and gilt with a profusion of broom I thought myself still in my beloved solitude, but missed the companion of my slumbers. Where are they? Behind yon blue hills, perhaps, or to the side of that thick forest. My fancy was travelling after these deserters till we reached the town, vile enough for conscience, and fit only to be passed in one sleep. The moment after I got out of the carriage brought me to the cathedral, an old haunt of mine. I had always venerated its lofty pillars, dim aisles, and mysterious arches. Last night they were more solemn than ever, and echoed no other sound than my steps. I strayed about the choir and chapels till they grew so dark and dismal that I was half inclined to be frightened, looking over my shoulder, thought of spectres that have an awkward trick of syllabling men's names in dreary places and fancied a sepulchral voice exclaiming worship my toe at ghent my ribs at florence my skull at Bologna, siena and rome beware how you neglect this order for my bones as well as my spirit have the miraculous property of being here there and everywhere these injunctions you may suppose were received in a becoming manner and noted all down in my pocket-book by inspiration for i could not see and hurrying into the open air i was whirled away in the dark to margate don't ask what were my dreams thither nothing but horrors deep vaulted tombs and pale though lovely figures extended upon them shrill blasts that sung in my ears and filled me with sadness and the recollection of happy hours fleeting away perhaps for ever i was not sorry when the bustle of our coming in dispelled these phantoms the change however in point of scenery was not calculated to dissipate my gloom for the first object in this world that presented itself was a vast expanse of sea just visible by the gleamings of the moon bathed in watery clouds 
a chill air ruffled the waves i went to shiver a few melancholy moments on the shore how often did i try to wish away the reality of my separation from those i love and attempt to persuade myself it was but a dream this morning i found myself more cheerfully disposed by the queer dutch faces with short pipes and gingerbread complexions that came smirking and scraping to get us on board their respective vessels but as i had a ship engaged for me before their invitations were all in vain the wind blows fair and should it continue of the same mind a few hours longer we shall have no cause to complain of our passage adieu think of me sometimes if you write immediately i shall receive your letter at the hague it is a bright sunny evening the sea reflects a thousand glowing colors and in a minute or two i shall be gliding on its surface End of section two dreams waking thoughts and incidents in a series of letters from various parts of europe by william beckford section three of lavender lit 101 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the cornelian by lord byron no specious splendour of this stone endears it to my memory ever with lustre only once it shone and blushes modest as the giver some who can sneer at friendship's ties have for my weakness oft reproved me yet still the simple gift i prize for i am sure the giver loved me he offered it with downcast look as fearful that i might refuse it i told him when the gift i took my only fear should be to lose it this pledge attentively i viewed and sparkling as i held it near methought one drop the stone bedewed and ever since i've loved a tear still to adorn his humble youth nor wealth nor birth their treasures yield but he who seeks the flowers of truth must quit the garden for the field tis not the plant upreared in sloth which beauty shows and sheds perfume the flowers which yield the most of both in nature's wild luxuriance bloom had fortune aided nature's care for once forgetting to be blind his would have been an ample share if well proportioned to his mind but had the goddess clearly seen his form had fixed her fickle breast her countless hordes would his have been and none remained to give the rest editor's footnote the cornelian was a present from his friend edelston a cambridge chorister afterwards a clerk in a mercantile house in london edelston died of consumption may eleventh eighteen eleven their acquaintance began by byron saving him from drowning end of section three the cornelian by lord byron recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Section 4 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Near Enemy by Natalie Clifford Barney. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. The Near Enemy. Rash games of chess do hateful lovers play 
their towers, queens, and kings all thrown away in wild offensives, desperate retreats to that sick inner-sounding drum that beats in terror of some tender thing just killed. New warriors on the battlefield, unskilled in prudent warfare, friends of yesterday, what they most cherish seem most keen to slay. More treacherous than Prussians in command, entrenched and feigning not to understand, they plan how best to poison, maim, and mar, masked in bad silence, turned against their star. Through what black forces are so changed to foes, those fed on our high hearts? Yes, even those. End of The Near Enemy by Natalie Clifford Barney Section 5 of Lavender Lit 101 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fragments from Igor Stravinsky and the Russian Ballet by Jean Cocteau Translated from the French by Rollo H. Myers I prefer, myself, a talented childhood which grows up in bad surroundings, takes wrong turnings, spends itself futilely, and at length suddenly discovers its error in time to escape the consequences, to a childhood which makes its first faux pas on correct paths, and which progresses normally, holding out no hope of startling developments. I accept the early flame of genius, sometimes sublime, which dies down again unless the prodigy, combining wisdom with genius, retires in time under some pretext or other. No, in discipline and bad taste, those characteristics of youth preserve qualities which exist in embryo and which are delivered in due course painfully, delicately, gradually, by spade work, like a buried Venus. For this reason, do not regret your mistakes, even public and notorious ones, heavy drags though they be, and which do not alleviate the fatigues of the journey towards the left. One turns round, takes a sponge down, looks to see where one has come from, and is astonished. The chief stumbling block people put in the way of this Herculean task is ingratitude. One passes through many milieus in order to attain a relative solitude, and these milieus reproach one with having shared their table, and with having cleared out on the quiet. The result is the heart suffers much from a pilgrimage which the world commonly attributes to egoism, disorder, and versatility. And the flower maidens! Amongst the most recent flower maidens, the most maidenly and the most flowery, I class the Russian ballet. I had a presentiment that I should have to find an excuse for my enthusiasm for this Barnum, a last scruple before clearing out on the quiet. It was in 1910. Nijinsky was dancing the Spectre de la Rose. Instead of going to see the piece, I went to wait for him in the wings. There it was really very good. After embracing the young girl, the Spectre of the Rose hurls himself out of the window and comes to earth amongst the stagehands, who throw water in his face and rub him down like a boxer. What a combination of grace and brutality! I shall always hear that thunder of applause. I shall always see that young man, smeared with grease paint, gasping and sweating, pressing his heart with one hand and holding on with the other to the scenery, or else fainting on a chair. Afterwards, having been smacked and douched and shaken, he would return to the stage and smile his acknowledgments. It was in this semi-obscurity, under the moonlight of the limelights, that I met Stravinsky. Stravinsky was then finishing Petrushka. He described it to me in the casino at Monte Carlo, astonishing those people whom nothing can astonish by his gesticulations, his grimaces, and jewelry fit for a negro king. Petrushka was given in Paris on June 13th, 1911. I remember the private rehearsal at the Châtelet. The work which, today, gives off its whole aroma, at that time withheld it, so much so that it displeased the public. The dilettanti, used to clichés, 
were unable to follow a synthesis of the soul of the Russian people whose melancholy is not expressed in a whine and which goes straight from beginning to end like a drum roll. One or two specialists recognized the master, and gradually the concert halls consecrated Petrushka. Petrushka then was recognized, firstly on account of the folklore it contained, secondly as a defense against still newer things. For it is the public's way to hobble from one work to another, always one behind, adopting what precedes in order to use it to blame what is going to follow, and never keeping to the page, as the expression goes. We saw very little of Stravinsky until the famous premiere of the Sacre du Printemps. The Sacre du Printemps was given in May 1913, in a new theater, untarnished by time, too comfortable and too cold for a public used to emotions at close quarters in the warmth of red velvet and gold. I do not for a moment think that the Sacre would have met with a more polite reception on a less pretentious stage, but this luxurious theater seemed, at first glance, symbolic of the misunderstanding which was confronting a decadent public with a work full of strength and youth, a tired public reposing amidst Louis Seize garlands, Venetian gondolas, luxurious divans, and cushions of an Orientalism for which the Russian ballet must be held responsible. Under such conditions one digests, as it were, in a hammock, dozing. The really new is driven away like a fly. It is disturbing. The natural trend of bad taste is already marked. But since 1912, a false audacity, tempting some and mistaken by others, hating both alike, for true audacity, has taken possession of innumerable categories of fashionable esthetes. Dilettanti and precious women thought themselves the thing, and a class made its appearance in the world belonging to no class neither that of respectable bad taste, for which it was most fitted, nor the one of new ideas, happily out of reach of its attainment. The provinces out-provincialized in the very heart of Paris. Let us recall the theme of the Sacre. First Tableau The prehistoric youth of Russia are engaged in springtide games and dances. They worship the earth, and the wise elder reminds them, of the sacred rites. Second tableau. These simple men believe that the sacrifice of a young girl chosen from amongst all her peers is necessary in order that spring may recommence. She is left alone in the forest. The ancestors come out of the shadows like bears and form a circle. They inspire the chosen one with the rhythm of a long, drawn-out convulsion. When she falls dead, the ancestors draw near, receive her body, and raise it towards heaven. This theme, so simple, so devoid of symbolism, today seems to hold a symbol. I see in it the prelude to the war. It would perhaps be of interest to trace the part played by each of the collaborators in the ensemble of this work. Stravinsky, musician, Rurik, painter, and Nijinsky, choreographer. We were then, musically, in the heyday of Impressionism. Everyone was trying to find a new way of being vague and indistinct. Then suddenly, in the midst of these charming ruins, grew up the Stravinsky tree. When all is said and done, the Sacre is still a Fauvist work, an organized Fauvist work. Gauguin and Matisse pay homage to it. But if the backwardness of music as compared to painting prevented the sacre of necessity from coinciding exactly with other disturbing elements, it nonetheless contributed an indispensable dynamitic force. Moreover, it must not be forgotten that Stravinsky's unbroken collaboration with Diaghilev's company and his attentiveness to his wife in Switzerland kept him at a distance from the center of things. His audacity was, therefore, quite gratuitous. In brief, the work, as it stands, was and is a masterpiece, a symphony impregnated with a wild sadness of primitive earth, 
camp and farmyard noises, fragments of melodies emerging from the depths of time, animal paintings, profound upheavals, the Georgics of a prehistoric age. Certainly Stravinsky had studied Gauguin's canvases, but in the process of transformation, the weak decorative register became a colossus. At that time, I was not au courant with the more trivial factions of the left, and thanks to my ignorance, I was able to enjoy the Sacre to the full, away from the petty schisms and narrow formulae which condemn free values and too often serve to mask a lack of spontaneity. Rerick is a mediocre painter. On the one hand, he designed costumes and scenery for the Sacre which were in keeping with the work. On the other hand, he enfeebled it by the softness of his accents. There remains Vaslav Nijinsky. I will show you a phenomenon. When he is at home, that is to say in the palace hotels where he bivouacs, this young Ariel frowningly examines folios and revolutionizes the grammar of gesticulation. Badly informed, his modern models are not of the best. He makes use of the Salon d'Automne. Too familiar with the triumph of grace, he rejects it. He seeks systematically the opposite to that to which he owes his fame. In order to escape from old formulae, he hems himself in with new ones. But Nijinsky is a mujik, a Rasputin. He carries in him that fluid which stirs crowds and despises the public, whom he does not refuse to gratify. Like Stravinsky, he metamorphoses into strength the weakness of whatever he derives his inspiration from. By means of all these atavisms, this absence of culture, this meanness, this humanity, he escapes the German danger, the system which desiccates a Reinhardt. I have heard the Sacre again without the dances. I ask to see them again. In my recollection, impulse and order are equally balanced in them as in the orchestra. The fault lies in the parallelism of music and movement, in their want of play, of counterpoint. We had the proof that the same chord repeated often tires the ear less than the frequent repetition of the same gesture tires the eye. Laughter was caused by a monotony, as of automata, rather than by the abruptness of the attitudes, and by the abruptness of the attitudes rather than by the polyphony. The choreographer's work may be divided into two parts, one part dead, e.g. keeping the feet motionless, merely with the idea of contradicting the traditional pose of the danseuse, toes out, and one part alive, e.g. the storm and that dance of the chosen one, foolish and naive, the dance of an insect, of a hind fascinated by a boa, of a factory explosion. In fact, the most stupefying spectacle I ever remember having seen in the theater. These different elements formed, then, an ensemble which was both homogeneous and heterogeneous, and what shortcomings there may have been as regards detail were volatilized and eradicated by sheer force of temperament. Thus we made the acquaintance of this historic work in the midst of such an uproar that the dancers could no longer hear the orchestra and had to keep time to the rhythm which Nijinsky, stamping and shouting, was beating in the wings. After this sketch of what was going to happen on the stage, let us pass through the little iron door to the auditorium. It is packed. A practiced eye could discern there all the material for a scandal. A fashionable public, décolleté, decked with pearls, aigrettes, and ostrich plumes, and, rubbing shoulders with tulle gowns and tailcoats, the jackets and headbands and conspicuous garments of that species of esthete who acclaims no matter what novelty in season and out of season, through detestation of the dress circle, the unintelligent applause of the former being more insufferable than the sincere hisses of the latter. Add to these the musicians of the feverish school, a handful of moutons de panurge, hesitating between public opinion and the admiration one ought to entertain for the Russian ballets, 
and, without insisting further, mention ought to be made of the thousand varieties of snobbism, super-snobbism, anti-snobbism, which would require a whole chapter to themselves. A feature of our audience ought to be recorded, namely the absence, with one or two exceptions, of the young painters and their masters an absence due, as I afterwards learnt in the case of the former, to their ignorance of these functions to which Diakilev, to whom they were as yet unknown, did not invite them, in the case of the latter, to social prejudices. This condemnation of luxury, which Picasso professes like a cult, has its merits and demerits. I fling myself upon this cult as upon an antidote, but it may be that it restricts the horizon of certain artists, who avoid contact with luxury from motives of envious hatred rather than conviction. In any case, Montparnasse is still ignorant of the Sacre du Printemps, and the Sacre du Printemps, played on the orchestra at the Concert Manteau, had the same bad reputation amongst artists of the left as the Russian ballets and Picasso heard Stravinsky for the first time with me in Rome in 1917. Let us now return to the theater in the Avenue Montaigne, while we wait for the conductor to wrap his desk and the curtain to go up on one of the noblest events in the annals of art. The audience behaved as it ought to. It revolted straight away. People laughed, booed, hissed, imitated animal noises, and possibly would have tired themselves out before long had not the crowd of esthetes and a handful of musicians, carried away by their excessive zeal, insulted and even roughly handled the public in the loge. The uproar degenerated into a free fight. Standing up in her loge, her diadem awry, the old Countess de P. flourished her fan and shouted scarlet in the face, it's the first time for sixty years that anyone's dared to make a fool of me. The good lady was sincere. She thought there was some mystification. At two o'clock in the morning, Stravinsky, Nijinsky, Diakilev and I piled into a taxi and drove to the Bois de Boulogne. No one spoke. The night was fresh and agreeable. We recognized the first trees by the smell of the acacias. When we had reached the lakes, Diaghilev, enveloped in opossum furs, began to mutter in Russian. I felt Stravinsky and Nijinsky listening, and when the driver lit the lamps I saw that there were tears on the impresario's face. He went on muttering, slowly and indefatigably. "'What is it?' I asked. "'Pushkin.' Again there was a long silence. Then Diaghilev stammered out a short sentence and the emotion of my two companions seemed so acute that I could not refrain from interrupting in order to know the reason. It is hard to translate, said Stravinsky, really very hard, T too Russian, too Russian. It means roughly, Votu faire en tour aux îles. Yes, that's it. It's a very Russian expression, because, you know, in our country, one goes to the islands in the same way as we are going to the Bois de Boulogne tonight, and it was in going to the islands that we conceived the Sacre du Printemps. It was the first time the scandal had been alluded to. We came back at dawn. You cannot imagine the state of softness and nostalgia of these men, and whatever Diaghilev may have done since, I shall never forget his great, wet face in the cab, reciting Pushkin in the Bois de Boulogne. It is from this meeting in the cab that our real friendship with Stravinsky dates. He went back to Switzerland. We corresponded. I had the idea of David and went to join him at Lazen. An acrobat, was to do the parade for David, a big spectacle which was supposed to be taking place inside. A clown who subsequently became a box, a kind of theatrical pastiche of the traveling phonograph, a modern equivalent of the mask of the ancients, was to sing through a megaphone the prowess of David and implore the public to enter to see the piece inside. It was, in a sense, the first sketch of parade, but uselessly complicated by the Bible and a text. It contained good and bad features. The idea was too fresh, too reactive, 
and I congratulate myself that circumstances saved us from committing a half-blunder, worse than a blunder. For me, it was a time of transformations. I was molting. I was in a state of growth. It was natural that frivolity, lack of concentration, and talkativeness should have been followed by an excessive desire for sobriety, method, and silence. Moreover, without knowing what the painter's opinion was, I realized thoroughly the antagonism between the genius of Igor and the chevre choux atmosphere of the Russian ballets, and also the difficulty for an artist to concentrate within the limits of a frame so vast and encumbered with such elaborate accessories. But my idea was not ripe. End of Fragments from Igor Stravinsky and the Russian Ballet by Jean Cocteau Translated from the French by Rollo H. Myers Recording by Ben Adams Section 6 of Lavender Lit 101 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. E. Maxwell Snurge by Noel Coward. Recording by 2 Win. I will not seek to write of E. Maxwell Snurge as his friends have written of him, tall, courageous, and vitally intelligent, nor as his enemies have chronicled him, short, fat, and intensely stupid. I will endeavor, with a few brief flourishes of the pen, to portray the various intricacies of his character as I see them, clearly and dispassionately, with the eyes of a psychological observer, whose hand is uncorrupted by the bribes of ruthless profiteers, grafters, and the like. It is my desire to convey to the reader the real E. Maxwell Snurge, shorn of tawdry trappings of party politics and the illusion and glamour of public idolatry, a man just a man, but what a man. To dwell on the widely circulated story of his life would be needless, and to follow his political career merely futile. What is there left, you ask? And I answer you with extreme firmness. There is one aspect of E. Maxwell's snurge which has never been seriously analyzed, his soul. And it is that, and that alone, which will be the foundation stone of my structural portrayal of his character. Why wasn't E. Maxwell Snurge President of the United States? Many have asked that question. He frequently used to ask it himself. And his wife, the sainted Amy Snurge of ever-revered memory, would rest her thin, ascetic hand upon his coat sleeve and answer him with yearning sympathy but little satisfaction. Why? Let us turn to an early episode in his career in our search for the key to the complexities of his mind an episode slight in itself but well worthy of recording if only for the illumination it throws upon the much-questioned motives of his later actions. He was spending a weekend with friends on Long Island, a fishing weekend. Mrs. Jake Van Opus, formerly the lovely Consuela Root, out of consideration for her eminent guest and with great tact and charm, immediately he arrived, made a point of forbidding politics as a subject for discussion in the house, and confined the general conversation exclusively to fish. That this thoughtful act was appreciated by the overworked politician, it is needless to remark. He settled down to his brief respite with a tranquil contentment and complete blankness of mind, which only the cleverest of us can assume at will. Athletic from birth, Snurge cast his line repeatedly far out to sea with the strength and dogged perseverance which characterize his every deed. But alas, nearly fifteen hours went by before his patience was rewarded. Day had turned to dusk, and the sun was setting when he was suddenly jerked from the fishing stand into the water. With an exultant shout, he clambered onto a rock, still clasping his rod. A bite! A bite! he cried in tones strangely alien from those he customarily employed when addressing a civic conference. A bite at last! Playing his submarine quarry with extraordinary finesse, he eventually, amid laudatory shouts and frantic cheering, landed an exquisitely striped bass, which lay at his feet gasping, apparently quite exhausted by its struggles to evade captivity. Now comes the point of the story. 
Snurge surveyed his catch quietly for a few moments. Those standing nearby noticed sternly repressed tears in his eyes. Then he said a thing which, come what may, will eternally prove him the possessor of unparalleled insight and humanity. Touching the recumbent fish gently with his foot, he sighed deeply. This bass is democracy, he murmured, and see what I have done with it. Superstitious observers state that at this point the bass closed its eyes wearily, but this may only be a fanatical exaggeration. Then with a set face he lifted the fish high above his head and flung it back into its native element, thereby undoing the efforts of many hours untiring labor and patience. I have told this story in order to illustrate definitely the initial weakness in his lifelong policy. Call it folly, if you like, or even imbecility, but I prefer to assign to it the one all-embracing word, generosity. He was too generous all through his career. He sacrificed everything through his generous capacity for seeing and sympathizing with both sides of every question. Many, many times he would shelve the carefully formulated schemes of months on the sudden realization of what the opposition would suffer if he carried them through. Think, as I sometimes think, what a sad thing. What a vortex of conflicting emotions the heart of Amy Snurge must have been during those hard years, knowing her husband's strength and resource, deploring yet loving his weakness, encouraging, aiding, and abetting his every act with the feminine pertinacity which has characterized the world's greatest heroines. Poor woman, no wonder the grave claimed her so soon, for like the bass, like democracy, her vitality was exhausted by the destructive and constructive force of Snurge. Only unlike the bass, she couldn't swim well. And unlike democracy, she had the man to contend with as well as the politician. Snurge was by no means a revolutionary. He possessed too many ideals and too little passion. He was essentially a passionless man. Except, of course, the one historic occasion during his campaign against Prohibition when he completely lost control, and flying low in a government aeroplane broke a bottle of green chartreuse over the head of the Statue of Liberty. The uproar, which was the natural outcome of this defiant protest, was abruptly stemmed by the sudden reversal of his tactics on the day following the event, when he made a spirited appeal in West 42nd Street for Prohibition. This resulted in a hopeless gloom enveloping the metropolis. The populace commenced to realize, in a measure, the unreliability of Snurge as a savior of the state, while at the same time fully appreciating his many sterling qualities. Dark things were whispered in the White House. One need not go far, then, to seek the reason for his fall from grace, his utter failure as a Republican candidate for the presidency. It was his generosity, his innate humanity, and his extraordinary breadth and clarity of vision. If this man had but been president in 1914, there might not have been any war. Had he been president in 1776, there might not have been any revolution. And had he but been president in 1491, God knows what there might not have been. End of section 6 E. Maxwell Snurge by Noel Coward Recording by Two Win Section 7 of La Vendelette 101 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Hymen by H.D. Recording by Christine G. As from a temple service, tall and dignified, with slow pace, each a queen, the sixteen matrons from the temple of Hera pass before the curtain. A dark purple hung between ionic columns, of the porch or open hall of a palace. Their hair is bound as the marble hair of the temple Hera. Each wears a crown or diadem of gold. They sing. The music is temple music, deep, simple chanting notes from the closed garden 
where our feet pace back and forth each day this gladiolus white this red this purple spray gladiolus tall with dignity as your slady we lay before your feet and pray of all the blessings youth joy ecstasy may one gift last as the tall gladiolus may outlast a wind flower winter rose or rose one gift above encompassing all those for for him for all within these palace walls beyond the feast beyond the cry of hymen and the torch beyond a night and music echoing through the porch till day the music with its deep chanting notes dies away the curtain hangs motionless in rich full folds then from this background of darkness dignity and solemn repose a flute gradually detaches itself becomes clearer and clearer pipes alone one shrill simple little melody from the distance four children's voices blend with the flute and four very little girls pass singly before the curtain small maids or attendants of the sixteen matrons their hair is short and curls at the back of their heads like the hair of the chrysolaphantine hermes they sing where the first crocus buds unfold we found these petals here the cold swift river bed beneath the rocks where ivy frond puts forth new leaves to gleam beyond those lately dead the very smallest two or three of gold gold pale as ivory we gathered when the little girls have passed before the curtain a woodwind weaves a richer note into the flute melody then the two blend into one song but as the woodwind grows in mellowness and richness the flute gradually dies away into a secondary theme and the woodwind alone evolves the melody of a new song two by two like two sets of medallions with twin profiles distinct one head slightly higher bent forward a little the four figures of four slight rather fragile taller children are outlined with sharp white contour against the curtain the hair is smooth against the heads falling to the shoulders but slightly waved against the nape of the neck they are looking down each at a spray of a winter rose the tunics fall to the knees in sharp marble folds they sing never more will the wind cherish you again never more will the rain never more shall we find you bright in the snow and wind snow is melted the snow is gone and you are flown like a bird out of a hand like a light out of a heart you are gone as the wistful notes of the woodwind gradually die away there comes a sudden shrill swift piping 
free and wild like the wood maidens of artemis is this last group of four very straight with heads tossed back they sing in rich free swift notes they move swiftly before the curtain in contrast to the slow important pace of the first two groups their hair is loose and rayed out like that of the sun god they are boyish in shape and gesture they carry hyacinths in baskets strapped like quivers to their backs they reach to draw the flower sprays from the baskets as the huntress her arrows as they dart swiftly to and fro before the curtain they are youth they are spring they are the celedonia their song is the swallow song of joy between the hollows of the little hills the spring spills blue turquoise sapphire lapis lazuli on a brown cloth outspread i see how carefully we lay them now each hyacinth spray across the marble floor a pattern your bent eyes may trace and follow to the short bridal door lady alava dear our bride most fair they grew among the hollows of the hills as if the sea had spilled its blue as if the sea had risen from its bed and sinking to the level of the shore left hyacinths on the floor there is a pause flute pipe and woodwind blend in a full rich movement there is no definite melody but full powerful rhythm like soft but steady wind above forest trees into this like rain gradually creeps a note of strings as the strings grow stronger and finally dominate the whole the bride chorus passes before the curtain there may be any number in this chorus the figures tall young women clothed in long white tunics follow one another closely yet are all distinct like a procession of a temple frieze. The bride in the centre is not at first distinguishable from her maidens, but as they begin their song, the maidens draw apart into two groups, leaving the veiled symbolic figure standing alone in the centre. The two groups range themselves to right and left, like officiating priestesses. The veiled figure stands with her back against the curtain, the others being in profile, her head is swathed in folds of diaphanous white, through which the features are visible, like the veiled Tanagra. When the song is finished, the group to the bride's left turns about, also the bride, so that all face in one direction. In processional form, they pass out, the figure of the bride again merging, not distinguishable from the maidens. Strophe Part of her who can say if she is fair bound with fillet bound with myrtle underneath her flowing veil only the soft length beneath her dress of saffron shoe is bright as a great lily heart in its wide loveliness and distrofe but of her we can say that she is fair we bleached a fillet brought the metal to us the task was set of knotting the fine threads of silk we first and the veil and over the white foot drew on the painted shoe steeped in Strophe. But of her, who can say if she is fair? For her head is covered over with a mantle white on white, snow on white a hammer and snow on hoar frost, snow on snow, snow on whitest bits of mirror. 
and distrove. But of her we can say that she is fair, for we know underneath all the vainness, all the heat in her blanched face of desire is caught in her eyes as fire in the dark center leaf of the white Tyrian iris. The rather hard hieratic precision of the music, its stately pause and beat, is broken now into irregular lilt and rhythm of strings. Four tall young women, very young matrons, enter in a group. They stand clear and fair, but this little group entirely lacks the austere precision of the procession of maidens just preceding them. They pause in the centre of the stage, turn, one three-quarter, two in profile and the fourth full face. They stand, turn as if confiding in each other like a Tanagra group. They sing lightly, their flower trace under their arms. Along the yellow sand, above the rocks, the laurel bushes stand against the shimmering heat. Each shepherd leaf is bright and cold, and through the bronze of shining bark and wood run the fine threads of gold. Here in the wicked trace we bring the first faint blossoming of fragrant base. Lady, their blushes shine as faint in you, as when through petals of a laurel rose the sun shines through and throws a purple shadow on a marble vase. Allah, so her fair breast will shine where the faint shadow above. The harp chords become again more regular in simple definite rhythm. The music is not so intense as the bright chorus, and quieter, more sedate, than the notes preceding the entrance of the last group. Five or six slightly older serene young women enter in processional form, each holding before her, with precise bending of arms, coverlets and linen, carefully folded, as if for the bride couch. The garments are purple, scarlet and deep blue, with edge of gold. They sing to blending of woodwind and harp. From citron power be her bed, cut from branch of tree or flower, fashion for her maiden head. From Lydian apple sweet of you, cut the widths of board and lay, carve the feet from myrtle wood, let the palings of a bed be crimson boxwood overlaid with the scented bark of you that all the wood in blossoming may calm her heart and cool her blood for loosing of a maidenhood the woodwinds become more rich and resonant a tall youth crosses the stage as if seeking the bridal the music becomes very rich full of colour the figure itself is a flame, an exaggerated symbol. The hair aflame, the wings, deep red or purple, stand out against the curtains in a contrasting or almost clashing shade of purple. The tunic, again a rich purple or crimson, falls almost to the knees. The knees are bare, the sandals elaborately strapped over and over. The curtain seems a rich purple cloud, the figure still brighter like a flamboyant bird, half emerged in the sunset. Love pauses just outside the bride's door with his gift, a tuft of black purple cyclamen. 
he sings to the accompaniment of woodwinds in a rich resonant voice the crimson cover of her bed is not so rich nor so deeply bled the purple fish that dyed it red as when in a heart sheltered glen there flowered these stalks of cyclamen purple with honey points of horns for petals sweet and dark and crisp as fragrant as her maiden kiss there with his honey-seeking lips the beaklings close and warmly sips and there seeks with honey thighs to sway and drink the very flower away ah stand the petals drawing back ah rare a virgin all her breath crimson with honey seeking lips the sun lies hot across his back the gold is decked across his wings quivering he sways and quivering clings a rare her shoulders drawing back one moment then the plunderer slips between the purple flower lips love passes out with a crash of cymbals there is a momentary pause and the music falls into its calm wave-like rhythm a band of boys passes before the curtain they pass from side to side crossing and recrossing but their figures never confuse one another the outlines are never blurred they stand out against the curtain with symbolic gesture stopping as if to gather up the wreaths or swaying with long stiff branch as if to sweep the fallen petals from the floor there is no marked melody from the instruments but the boys voices humming lightly as they enter gradually evolve a little dance song there are no words but the lilt up and down of the boys tenor voices then as if they had finished the task of gathering up the reeds and sweeping the petals they stand in groups of two before the pillars where the torches have been placed they lift the torches from the brackets they hold them aloft between them one torch to each two boys their figures are cut against the curtain like the simple triangular design on the base of a vase or frieze the boys' heads on a level the torches above them they sing in clear half-subdued voices where love is king ah there is little need to dance and sing with bridal torch to flare amber and scatter light across the purple air to sing and dance to flute note and to read where love is come ah love is come indeed our limbs are numb before his fiery need with all their glad rapture of speech unsaid before his fire he lips our lips are mute and dumb a sound of rage a flute and trumpet wail a joy decreed the fringes of her veil are sad and white across the flare of light blinded the torches fail ah love is come indeed at the end of the song the torches flicker out and the figures are no longer distinguishable in the darkness they pass out like shadows the purple curtain hangs black and heavy the music dies away and is finally cut short with a few deep muted chords end of section seven hymen by h d section eight 
of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 from Howard's End Describing Leonard Bast by E. M. Forster. We are not concerned with the very poor. They are unthinkable and only to be approached by the statistician or the poet. This story deals with gentlefolk, or with those who are obliged to pretend that they are gentlefolk. The boy, Leonard Bast, stood at the extreme verge of gentility. He was not in the abyss, but he could see it, and at times people whom he knew had dropped in and counted no more. He knew that he was poor and would admit it. He would have died sooner than confess any inferiority to the rich. This may be splendid of him, but he was inferior to most rich people. There is not the least doubt of it. He was not as courteous as the average rich man, nor as intelligent, nor as healthy, nor as lovable. His mind and his body had been alike underfed because he was poor, and because he was modern they were always craving better food. Had he lived some centuries ago in the brightly colored civilizations of the past, he would have had a definite status. His rank and his income would have corresponded. But in his day the angel of democracy had arisen, enshadowing the classes with leathern wings, and proclaiming, All men are equal, all men, that is to say, who possess umbrellas. And so he was obliged to assert gentility, lest he slip into the abyss where nothing counts and the statements of democracy are inaudible. As he walked away from Wickham Place, his first care was to prove that he was as good as the Miss Schlegels. Obscurely wounded in his pride, he tried to wound them in return. They were probably not ladies. Would real ladies have asked him to tea? They were certainly ill-natured and cold. At each step his feeling of superiority increased. Would a real lady have talked about stealing an umbrella? Perhaps they were thieves after all, and if he had gone into the house, they would have clapped a chloroformed handkerchief over his face. He walked on complacently as far as the Houses of Parliament. There an empty stomach asserted itself and told him that he was a fool. Evening, Mr. Bast. Evening, Mr. Deltry. Nice evening. Evening. Mr. Deltry, a fellow clerk, passed on, and Leonard stood wondering whether he would take the tram as far as a penny would take him or whether he would walk. He decided to walk. It's no good giving in, and he had spent money enough at Queen's Hall. And he walked over Westminster Bridge in front of St. Thomas's Hospital, and through the immense tunnel that passed under the southwestern main line at Vauxhall. In the tunnel he paused and listened to the roar of the trains. A sharp pain darted through his head, and he was conscious of the exact form of his eye sockets. He pushed on for another mile, and did not slacken speed until he stood at the entrance of a road called Camellia Road, which was at present his home. Here he stopped again and glanced suspiciously to right and left, like a rabbit that is going to bolt into its hole. A block of flats, constructed with extreme cheapness, towered on either hand. Farther down the road two more blocks were being built, and beyond these an old house was being demolished to accommodate another pair. It was the kind of scene that may be observed all over London, whatever the locality, bricks and mortar rising and falling with the restlessness of the water in a fountain, as the city receives more and more men upon her soil. Camellia Road would soon stand out like a fortress, and command, for a little, an extensive view. Only for a little. Plans were out for the erection of flats in Magnolia Road also, and again a few years and all the flats in either road might be pulled down and new buildings of a vastness at present unimaginable might arise where they had fallen evening mr bast evening mr cunningham very serious thing this decline of the birth rate in manchester i beg your pardon very serious thing this decline of the birth rate in manchester repeated mr cunningham tapping the sunday paper in which the calamity in question had just been announced to him ah yes said leonard who was not going to let on that he had not bought a sunday paper if this kind of thing goes on the population of england will be stationary in nineteen sixty you don't say so i call it a very serious thing eh 
Good evening, Mr. Cunningham. Good evening, Mr. Bast. Then Leonard entered Block B of the flats and turned, not upstairs, but down into what is known to house agents as a semi-basement, and to other men as a cellar. He opened the door and cried, Hello, with a pseudo-geniality of the cockney. There was no reply. Hello, he repeated. The sitting-room was empty, though the electric light had been left burning. A look of relief came over his face, and he flung himself into an armchair. The sitting-room contained, besides the armchair, two other chairs, a piano, a three-legged table, and a cosy corner. On the walls, one was occupied by the window, the other by a draped mantel-shelf bristling with cupids. Opposite the window was the door, and beside the door a bookcase, while over the piano there extended one of the masterpieces of Maud Goodman. It was an amorous and not unpleasant little hole when the curtains were drawn and the lights turned on and the gas stove unlit but it struck that shallow makeshift note that is so often heard in the dwelling place it had been too easily gained and could be relinquished too easily as leonard was kicking off his boots he jarred the three-legged table and a photograph frame honorably poised upon it slid sideways fell off into the fireplace and smashed he swore in a colorless sort of way and picked the photograph up it represented a young lady called jackie and had been taken at the time when young ladies called jackie were often photographed with their mouths open teeth of dazzling whiteness extended along either of jackie's jaws and positively weighed her head sideways so large were they and so numerous take my word for it that smile was simply stunning and it is only you and I who will be fastidious and complain that true joy begins in the eyes and that the eyes of Jackie did not accord with her smile but were anxious and hungry Leonard tried to pull out the fragments of glass and cut his fingers and swore again a drop of blood fell on the frame another followed spilling over on to the exposed photograph he swore more vigorously and dashed into the kitchen where he bathed his hands the kitchen was the same size as the sitting-room beyond it was a bedroom this completed his home he was renting the flat furnished of all the objects that encumbered it none were his own except the photograph frame the cupids and the books damn damn damnation he murmured together with such other words as he had learned from older men then he raised his hand to his forehead and said Oh damn it all which meant something different he pulled himself together he drank a little tea black and silent that still survived upon an upper shelf he swallowed some dusty crumbs of a cake and then he went back to the sitting-room settled himself anew and began to read a volume of Ruskin seven miles to the north of Venice how perfectly the famous chapter opens how supreme its command of admonition and of poetry the rich man is speaking to us from his gondola seven miles to the north of venice the banks of sand which near the city rise little above low water mark attain by degrees a higher level and knit themselves at last into fields of salt morass raised here and there into shapeless mounds and intercepted by narrow creeks of sea leonard was trying to form his style on ruskin he understood him to be the greatest master of english prose he read forward steadily occasionally making a few notes let us consider a little each of these characters in succession and first for the shafts enough have been said already which is very peculiar to this church its luminousness was there anything to be learned from this fine sentence could he adapt it to the needs of daily life could he introduce it with modifications when he next wrote a letter to his brother the lay reader for example let us consider a little each of these characters in succession and first for of the absence of ventilation enough has been said already what is very peculiar to this flat its obscurity something told him that the modifications would not do and that something had he known it was the spirit of english prose my flat is dark as well as stuffy those were the words for him and the voice in the gondola rolled on piping melodiously of effort and self-sacrifice full of high purpose full of beauty full even of sympathy and the love of men 
and yet somehow eluding all that was actual and insistent in Leonard's life. For it was the voice of one who had never been dirty or hungry, and had not guessed successfully what dirt and hunger are. Leonard listened to it with reverence. He felt that he was being done good to, and that if he kept on with Ruskin, and the Queen's Hall concerts, and some pictures by Watts, he would one day push his head out of the grey waters and see the universe. He believed in sudden conversion, a belief which may be right, but which is peculiarly attractive to a half-baked mind. It is the basis of much popular religion. In the domain of business it dominates the stock exchange, and becomes that bit of luck by which all successes and failures are explained. If only I had a bit of luck, the whole thing would come straight. He's got a most magnificent place down at Streatham, and a twenty-horsepower Fiat. But then, mind you, he's had luck. I'm sorry the wife's so late, but she never has any luck over catching trains. Leonard was superior to these people. He did not believe in effort, and in a steady preparation for the change that he desired, but of a heritage that may expand gradually. He had no conception. He hoped to come to culture suddenly, much as the revivalist hopes to come to Jesus. Those Miss Schlegels had come to it. They had done the trick. Their hands were upon the ropes once and for all, and meanwhile his flat was dark as well as stuffy. Presently there was a noise on the staircase. He shut up Margaret's card in the pages of Ruskin and opened the door. A woman entered of whom it is simplest to say that she was not respectable her appearance was awesome she seemed all strings and bell pulls ribbons chains bead necklaces that clinked and caught and a boa of azure feathers hung round her neck with the ends uneven her throat was bare wound with a double row of pearls her arms were bare to the elbows and might again be detected at the shoulder through cheap lace her hat which was flowery resembled those punnets covered with flannel which we sewed with mustard and cress in our childhood and which germinated here yes and there no she wore it on the back of her head as for her hair or rather hairs they are too complicated to describe but one system went down her back lying in a thick pad there while another created for a lighter destiny rippled around her forehead the face the face does not signify it was the face of the photograph but older and the teeth were not so numerous as the photographer had suggested and certainly not so white yes jackie was past her prime whatever that prime may have been she was descending quicker than most women into the colorless years and the look in her eyes confessed it what ho said leonard greeting the apparition with much spirit and helping it off with its boa Jackie in husky tones replied what ho Been out he asked the question sounds superfluous, but it cannot have been really for the lady answered no Adding oh, I am so tired you tired eh? I'm tired said he hanging the boa up. Oh Len. I am so tired I've been to that classical concert. I told you about said Leonard. What's that? I came back as soon as it was over Anyone been round to our place asked Jackie not that I've seen I met mr. Cunningham outside and we passed a few remarks What not mr. Cunningham? Yes. Oh, you mean mr. Cunningham? Yes, mr. Cunningham I've been out to tea at a lady friends Her secret being at last given to the world and the name of the lady friend being even adumbrated Jackie made no further experiments in the difficult and tiring art of conversation she never had been a great talker even in her photographic days she had relied upon her smile and her figure to attract and now that she was on the shelf on the shelf boys boys i'm on the shelf she was not likely to find her tongue occasional bursts of song of which the above is an example still issued from her lips but the spoken word was rare she sat down on leonard's knee and began to fondle him she was now a massive woman of thirty-three, and her weight hurt him, but he could not very well say anything. And then she said, Is that a book you're reading? And he said, That's a book. And he drew it from her unreluctant grasp. Margaret's card fell out of it, 
It fell face downwards, and he murmured, Bookmarker. Len, what is it? he asked a little wearily, for she only had one topic of conversation when she sat upon his knee. You do love me? Oh, Jackie, you know that I do. How can you ask such questions? But you do love me, Len, don't you? Of course I do. A pause. The other remark was still due. Len, well, what is it? Len, you will make it all right. I can't have you ask me that again, said the boy, flaring up into a sudden passion. I've promised to marry you when I'm of age, and that's enough. My word's my word. I've promised to marry you as soon as ever I'm twenty-one, and I can't keep on being worried. I've worries enough. It isn't likely I'd throw you over, let alone my word, when I've spent all this money. Besides, I'm an Englishman, and I never go back on my word. Jackie, do be reasonable. Of course I'll marry you. Only do stop badgering me. When's your birthday, Len? I've told you again and again the 11th of November next. Now get off my knee a bit. Someone must get supper, I suppose. Jackie went through to the bedroom and began to see to her hat. This meant blowing at it with short, sharp puffs. Leonard tidied up the sitting-room and began to prepare their evening meal. He put a penny into the slot of the gas-meter, and soon the flat was reeking with metallic fumes. Somehow he could not recover his temper, and all the time he was cooking he continued to complain bitterly. It's really too bad when a fellow isn't trusted. It makes one feel so wild. When I've pretended to the people here that you're my wife, all right, all right, you shall be my wife, and I've bought you the ring to wear, and I've taken this flat furnished, and it's far more than I can afford, and yet you aren't content, and I've also not told the truth when I've written home. He lowered his voice. He'd stop it. In a tone of horror that was a little luxurious, he repeated, My brother'd stop it. I'm going against the whole world, Jackie. That's what I am, Jackie. I don't take any heed of what anyone says. I just go straight forward. I do. That's always been my way. I'm not one of your weak, knock-kneed chaps. If a woman's in trouble, I don't leave her in the lurch. That's not my street. No, thank you. I'll tell you another thing, too. I care a good deal about improving myself by means of literature and art, and so getting a wider outlook. For instance, when you came in, I was reading Ruskin's Stones of Venice. I don't say this to boast, but just to show you the kind of man I am. I can tell you I enjoyed that classical concert this afternoon. To all his moods, Jackie remained equally indifferent. When supper was ready, and not before, she emerged from the bedroom, saying, "'But you do love me, don't you?' They began with a soup square, which Leonard had just dissolved in some hot water. It was followed by the tongue, a freckled cylinder of meat with a little jelly at the top, and a great deal of yellow fat at the bottom, ending with another square dissolved in water, jelly pineapple, which Leonard had prepared earlier in the day. Jackie ate contentedly enough, occasionally looking at her man with those anxious eyes, to which nothing else in her appearance corresponded, and which yet seemed to mirror her soul, and Leonard managed to convince his stomach that it was having a nourishing meal. After supper they smoked cigarettes and exchanged a few statements. She observed that her likeness had been broken. He found occasion to remark for the second time that he had come straight back home after the concert at Queen's Hall. Presently she sat upon his knee. The inhabitants of Camellia Road tramped to and fro outside the window, just on a level with their heads, and the family in the flat on the ground floor began to sing, Hark, my soul, it is the Lord. That tune fairly gives me the hump, said Leonard. Jackie followed this and said that for her part she thought it a lovely tune. No, I'll play you something lovely. Get up, dear, for a minute. He went to the piano and jingled out a little Grieg. He played badly and vulgarly, but the performance was not without its effect, for Jackie said she thought she'd be going to bed. As she receded, a new set of interests possessed the boy, and he began to think of what had been said about music by that odd Miss Schlegel, the one that twisted her face about so when she spoke. Then the thoughts grew sad and envious. There was the girl named Helen who had pinched his umbrella, 
and the German girl who had smiled at him pleasantly, and her someone, and Aunt someone, and the brother, all, all with their hands on the ropes. They had all passed up that narrow, rich staircase at Wickham Place to some ample room whither he could never follow them, not if he read for ten hours a day. Oh, it was no good, this continual aspiration. Some are born cultured. The rest had better go in for whatever comes easy. To see life steadily and to see it whole was not for the likes of him. From the darkness beyond the kitchen a voice called, Len! You in bed, he asked, his forehead twitching. All right. Presently she called him again. I must clean my boots ready for the morning, he answered. Presently she called him again. I rather want to get this chapter done. What? He closed his ears against her. What's that? All right, Jackie, nothing. I'm reading a book. What? What? He answered, catching her degraded deafness. Presently she called him again. Ruskin had visited Torcello by this time, and was ordering his gondoliers to take him to Murano. It occurred to him, as he glided over the whispering lagoons, that the power of nature could not be shortened by the folly, nor her beauty altogether saddened by the misery of such as Leonard. End of Section 8 You've just heard Chapter 6 from Howard's End, Describing Leonard Bast by E. M. Forster. Section 9 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 9 of Lavender Lit 101. Recollections of Oscar Wilde by Andre Gide. Translated from the French by Percival Pollard. Those who came to know Wilde only in the latter years of his life can scarcely, in view of that feeble and infirm existence, have any conception of this wonderful personality. It was in 1891 that I first saw him. Wilde had at that time what Thackeray termed the most important of talents, success. His gestures, his look, were triumphant. So complete was his success that it seemed as if it had preceded him, and Wilde had nothing to do but follow it up. His books were talked about. Plays of his were on at several London theatres. He was rich, he was famous, he was beautiful. Happiness and honors were his. One likened him to an Asiatic Bacchus, or to a Roman emperor, or even to Apollo himself. What is certain is that he was radiant. When he came to Paris, his name traveled from lip to lip. One told the most absurd anecdotes about him. Wilde was pictured as everlastingly smoking gold-tipped cigarettes and strolling about with a sunflower in his hand. For Wilde had always the gift of playing up to those who nowadays fashion fame, and he made for himself an amusing mask that covered his actual countenance. I heard him spoken of at Mallarmé's as of a brilliant causeur. A friend invited Wilde to dinner. There were four of us, but Wilde was the only one who talked. Wilde was not a causeur. He narrated. During the entire meal he hardly once ceased his narrating. He spoke slowly, gently, in a soft voice. He spoke admirable French, but as if he tapped a little for the words he was using. Hardly any accent at all, or just the faintest that he chose to adopt, giving the words often a quite novel and foreign air. The stories he told us that evening were confused, and not of his best. Wilde was not sure of us, and was testing us. Of his wisdom, or his folly, he gave only what he thought his listeners might like. To each he served a dish to suit the taste. Those who expected nothing of him received nothing, or the merest froth. And since all this was just amusement for him, many who think they know him know him only as an entertainer. As we left the restaurant on that occasion, my friends went ahead. I followed with Wilde. "'You listen with your eyes,' he said to me rather abruptly, 
That is why I tell you this story. When Narcissus died, the pool of his pleasure changed from a cup of sweet waters into a cup of salt tears, and the Oreads came weeping through the woodland that they might sing to the pool and give it comfort. And when they saw that the pool had changed from a cup of sweet waters into a cup of salt tears, they loosened the green tresses of their hair and cried to the pool and said, we do not wonder that you should mourn in this manner for Narcissus, so beautiful was he. But was Narcissus beautiful? said the pool. Who should know that better than you? answered the Oreads. Us did he ever pass by, but you he sought for, and would lie on your banks and look down at you, and in the mirror of your waters he would mirror his own beauty. And the pool answered, But I loved Narcissus because... As he lay on my banks and looked down at me, in the mirror of his eyes I saw my own beauty mirrored. As I said, before others Wild wore a mask to deceive, to amuse, sometimes to anger. He never listened and bothered little about any thought that was not his own. If he could not shine quite alone, he withdrew into the shadow. One found him there only when one was alone with him. But, so, alone, he began, What have you done since yesterday? And, as my life had then a very ordinary routine, what I told about it could hardly interest him at all. I rehearsed this very ordinary matter, and Wilde's frown showed. Really only that? Really, nothing new. Then why tell it? You must see yourself that all that is very uninteresting. There are just two worlds— the one exists without one ever speaking of it. That is called the real world, for one does not need to speak of it to perceive its existence. The other is the world of art. One must talk of that, for without such talk it would not exist. There was once a man who was beloved in his village for the tales he told. Every morning he left the village, and when he returned at evening, the villagers, who had tired themselves in labor all day long, assembled before him and said, Tell us now what you saw today. He told them, I saw a fawn in the wood piping a dance to little wood gods. What else? Tell us, said the people. As I came to the sea, I saw on the waves three sirens combing their green locks with a golden comb. And the people loved him because he told them stories. One morning he left the village as usual, but as he reached the sea, he saw three sirens, three sirens on the waves, combing with golden combs their green tresses. And as he fared on, he saw in the wood a fawn piping before dancing wood nymphs. When he reached his village that evening, and one asked him as of old, Tell us, what have you seen? He answered, I have seen nothing. Wilde paused a little, and let the story work into me. Then, I do not like your lips. They are the lips of one who has never lied. I shall teach you to lie, that your lips may grow beautiful and curved as those of an antique mask. Do you know what is art and what is nature, and the difference between them? For after all, a flower is as beautiful as any work of art, so the difference between them is not merely beauty. Do you know the difference? The work of art is always unique. Nature that creates nothing permanent forever repeats itself, so that nothing of what she has created may be lost. There are many Narcissi, so each can live but one day. And every time that nature invents a new form, she repeats it. A sea monster in one sea knows that its image exists in some other sea. When God made a Nero, a Borgia, a Napoleon, he was only replacing their likes. We do not know those others, but what matter? What is important is that one succeeded. For God achieves man, and man achieves the work of art. That Wilde was convinced of his aesthetic mission was made clear to me more than once. The gospel disquieted the pagan Wilde. He did not forgive its miracles. Pagan miracles... Those were works of art. Christianity robbed him of those. 
When Jesus returned to Nazareth, he said, Nazareth was so changed that he did not know the place. The Nazareth of his day had been full of misery and tears. This town laughed and sang. And as the Lord descended into the town, he saw flower-laden slaves hastening up the white steps of a marble house. He went into the house and saw in a jasper hall, reclining upon a marble couch, one in whose hair were twined red roses and whose lips were red with wine. And the Lord stepped behind him, touched his shoulder, and spoke to him, Why do you spend your life like this? The man turned around, knew him, and said, I was a leper once, and you healed me. How else should I live? And the Lord left the house and returned upon the street. And after a little while he saw one whose face and garments were painted, and whose feet were shod with pearls. And after her followed a youth, softly, slowly, like a hunter, and his coat was of two colors, and lust was in his eyes. But the face of the woman was as the lovely face of a goddess. And the Lord touched the youth's hand and said, Why look you so upon this woman? And the youth turned around, knew him, and said, I was blind, and you restored my sight. Upon what else shall I look? And the Lord approached the woman. The way you go is the way of sin. Why do you go that way? And the woman knew him, and said, The way I go is a joyful way, and you forgave me my sins. Then the Lord's heart filled with sorrow, and he wished to depart from the town. As he came to the gates, a youth was sitting by the roadside, weeping. The Lord approached him, touched his hair, and said to him, Why do you weep? And the youth looked up, knew him, and said, I was dead, and you waked me from the dead. What else should I do but weep? Shall I tell you a secret? Wilde began another time. It was at Heredia's. He had taken me aside in the middle of the crowded salon and was confiding this to me. Do you know why Christ did not love his mother? He spoke quite softly into my ear, as if in shame. Then he made a slight pause, took me by the arm, and suddenly breaking into a loud laughter, because she was a virgin. One morning Wilde bade me read a review in which a somewhat unskillful critic had congratulated him upon the fact that he, quote, gave form and vesture to his ideas by way of daintily invented stories, end quote. They imagine, Wilde began, that all ideas come naked into the world. They do not understand that I can think in no other way save in stories. The sculptor does not translate his thought into marble, he thinks in marble. Wilde believed in a sort of fate in art, and that ideas were stronger than men. There are, he said, two sorts of artists. These offer us answers. Those offer questions. One must know to which of these sorts one belongs, for he who asks is never he who answers. There are works of art that stand waiting, that one does not understand for a long time, for the reason that they offer answers to questions that one has not yet put, for often the question comes dreadfully long after the answer. And, he said also, the soul comes old into the body which must age to give her youth. Plato was the youth of Socrates. Then I did not see Wilde again for three years. A stubborn rumor that grew with his success as playwright ascribed extraordinary habits to Wilde, about which some people voiced their irritation smilingly, others not at all. It was added that Wilde made no secret of it, and spoke of it without embarrassment. Some said he spoke with bravado, some with cynicism, some with affectation. I was very much astonished. Nothing in the time I had known Wilde had led me to suspect this but already his old friends were cautiously leaving him. Not yet did one quite disown him, but one no longer spoke of having known him. 
an unusual accident brought us together again. It was in January 1895. A fit of the blues had driven me to travel, seeking solitude rather than change. I hurried through Algiers to Bilda, left Bilda for Biskra. Leaving the hotel, my eyes fall, in weary curiosity, upon the black tablet that bears the names of the hotel guests. And next to my own, I see Wilde's name. I was hungry for solitude, and I took the sponge and wiped my name out. Even before I reached the station, I was in doubt as to whether I had not acted as a coward, and I had my trunk brought back and rewrote my name on the tablet. In the three years since last I had seen him, I do not count a very hasty encounter in Florence, Wilde had changed visibly. One felt less softness in his look, and there was something coarse in his laughter, something forced in his gaiety. At the same time, he seemed more certain of pleasing and less anxious to succeed. He was bolder, greater, more sure of himself. And curiously enough, he spoke no longer in parables. Not one single story did I hear from him the whole time. At first I voiced my wonder at finding him in Algiers. I am running away from art, he replied. I want to worship only the sun. Have you never noticed how the sun despises all thought? He always discourages thought. It flies to the shadows. Thought once dwelt in Egypt. The sun conquered Egypt. Long it lived in Greece. The sun conquered Greece, then Italy, then France. Today, all thought is crowded out, driven into Norway and Russia, where the sun never comes. The sun is jealous of art. To worship the sun, that was to worship life. Wilde's lyric worship grew fierce and dreadful. A destiny determined him. He could not and would not escape it. He seemed to apply all his care, all his courage, to the task of exaggerating his fate and making it worse for himself. He went about his pleasure as one goes about one's duty. It is my duty, he said, to amuse myself frightfully. Nietzsche did not surprise me so much later, because I had heard Wilde say, not happiness, anything but happiness, but pleasure, yes, pleasure, joy. One must always want what is most tragic. As he walked through the streets of Algiers, he was the center of a most strange crew. He chatted with each of these fellows. They delighted him, and he threw his money at their heads. I hope, he said, that I have thoroughly demoralized this town. I thought of Flaubert's reply when he had been asked what glory he held most worthy. La gloire de demoralisateur. All this filled me with astonishment, wonder, and dread. I was aware of his shattered condition, of the attacks and enmities aimed at him, and what dark disquiet he concealed under his abandonment of gaiety. One evening he appeared to have made up his mind to say absolutely nothing serious or sincere. His paradoxes irritated me, and I told him his plays, his books, were far from being as good as his talk. Why did he not write as well as he talked? Yes, said Wilde, the plays are not great. I think nothing of them. But if you only knew how amusing they are. Incidentally, most of them are the results of bets. So is Dorian Gray. I wrote that in a few days because one of my friends asserted I would never write a novel. He leaned towards me and added, Do you wish to know the great drama of my life? I have given my genius to my life, to my work only my talent. Wilde spoke of returning to London. The Marquis of Q was abusing him and accusing him of flight. But... I asked, if you go to London, do you know what you are risking? That is something one should never know. My friends are funny. They advise caution. Caution? How can I have that? That would mean my immediate return. I must go as far away as possible. And now I can go no further. Something must happen. Something different. The next morning Wilde was on his way to London. 
the rest is well known. That something different was hard labor in prison. From prison, Wilde came to France. In B, a remote little village near Dieppe, there settled a Sebastian Melmoth. That was he. Of his French friends, I had been the last to see him. I wished to be the first to see him again. I arrived about midday without having announced myself in advance. Melmoth, whom friendship with T brought often to Dieppe, was not expected back that evening. He did not arrive until midnight. It was still nearly winter, cold and bitter. All day long I mooned about the deserted strand, bored and moody. How could Wilde have chosen this bee to live in? This boded no good. Night came and I went into the hotel, the only one in the place, where Melmoth, too, lodged. It was eleven, and I had begun to despair of my waiting, when I heard wheels. Monsieur Melmoth had returned. He was numb with cold. On the way home he had lost his overcoat. A peacock's feather that his servant had brought him the day before may have given him a foreboding of ill luck. He expresses himself as fortunate to have got off with only the loss of his overcoat. He shakes with the cold, and the whole hotel is astir to make him a hot grog. He scarcely has a greeting for me. He does not wish to show his emotion before the others. And my own excited expectation quiets down, as I find in Sebastian Melmoth so completely the Oscar Wilde, not the hard, strained, forceful Wilde of Algiers, but the soft, pliable Wilde of before the crisis. I feel myself set back not two years, but four or five. The same arresting look, the same winning smile, the same voice. He lodged in two rooms, the best in the house, and had furnished them tastefully. Many books on the table, among which he showed me my nourriture terrestre, then but just out. On a high pedestal, in the shadow, a gothic Madonna. We sat at a table by lamplight, and Wilde sipped his grog. Now, in the better light, I note how the skin of his face has roughened and coarsened, and his hands still more, those hands with their fingers still covered by the same rings, even the lapis lazuli in its pendant setting, to which he was so much attached. His teeth are horribly decayed. We chat. I speak of our last meeting in Algiers, and if he recalls my then foretelling his catastrophe. You must have foreseen the danger into which you were plunging. Of course! I knew a catastrophe would come, this one or that one. I expected it. It had to end like that. Think, going on was impossible. An end had to be. Prison has utterly changed me, and I have counted on that. D is terrible. He will not understand my not taking up my old life. He accuses the others of having changed me. But one can never take up the same life. My life is like a work of art. An artist never begins the same thing twice. My life before I was in prison was a success. Now it is quite ended. Wilde lit a cigarette. The public is dreadful. It judges only by what one has done last. If I return to Paris, it would see only the condemned man. I shall not appear again until I have written a play. And then, abruptly, was I not quite right to come here? My friends wanted to order me south for rest, for at first I was quite unstrung. But I begged them to find me a quiet little village somewhere in northern France where I would see nobody, where there is some cold and hardly any sunshine. I have all that here. Everyone is very nice to me here, especially the clergyman. His little church is a great pleasure to me. Think, it is called the Church of Our Lady of Joy. Isn't that delightful? And now I am quite sure I shall never be able to leave B, for this very morning the clergyman has offered me a pew. And the customs officers, how bored such people are! I asked them if they had nothing to read, and now I am getting for them all the novels of the Elder Dumas. I must stay here, eh? 
and the children here worship me. On the Queen's birthday I gave a feast to forty school children. The whole school was there with the teacher. For the Queen's day. Isn't that delightful? You know, I am very fond of the Queen. I always have her picture by me. And he showed me Nicholson's portrait of the Queen pinned to the wall. I arise to examine it. A small bookcase is underneath it. I look at the books. I wished to induce Wilde to talk more seriously. I sit him down again and ask him, somewhat timidly, if he has read the recollections in a morgue. He does not reply directly. These Russian writers are extraordinary. What makes their books so great is the pity they put into them. Formerly I adored Madame Bovary, but Flaubert would have no pity in his books, and the air in them is close. Pity is the open door through which a book can shine eternally. Do you know, it was pity that kept me from suicide. For the first six months I was so dreadfully unhappy that I longed to kill myself, but I saw the others. I saw their unhappiness. It was my pity for them that saved me. Oh, the wonder of pity. And once I did not know pity. He said this quite softly and without any exaltation. Do you know how wonderful pity is? I thanked God every night, yes, on my knees I thanked him, that he had made me acquainted with pity. For I entered prison with a heart of stone and thought only of my own pleasure. But now my heart is quite broken. Pity has entered in. I know now that pity is the greatest and loveliest thing in the world. And that is why I can have nothing against those who condemned me, for without them I would not have experienced all this. D. writes me horrible letters. He writes that he does not understand me, does not understand my not taking arms against the whole world, since all have been abominable to me. No, he does not understand, cannot understand me. In every letter I tell him that our ways lie apart. His is the way of pleasure, mine is not. His is that of Alcibiades, mine that of St. Francis of Assisi. Do you know, St. Francis, will you do me a very great pleasure? Send me the best life of our Savior. I promised, and he went on. Yes, towards the last we had a splendid warden, a charming man. But for the first six months I was utterly, completely unhappy. The warden then was a horrible creature, a cruel Jew, without any imagination. I had to laugh at the absurdity of this rapidly uttered comment, and Wilde laughed too. Yes, he did not know what to invent for our torturing. You shall see how void of imagination the man was. You must know that in prison one has but an hour in the sunshine, that is, one marches around the yard in a circle, one after the other, and is forbidden to say a word. One is watched and there are dreadful punishments if one is caught talking. The novices who are in prison for the first time can be distinguished by their inability to speak without moving their lips. For ten weeks I had been there, and had not spoken a word to a soul. One evening, just as we are making our round, one behind the other, I suddenly hear my name spoken behind me. It was the prisoner behind me, who was saying, Oscar Wilde. I pity you, for you are suffering more than me. I made the greatest efforts not to be observed, and said without turning around, No, my friend, we all suffer alike. And on that day I did not think of suicide. In this way we often talked together. I knew his name and what he was in for. He was called P, and was a fine fellow. But I had not yet the trick of speaking with motionless lips, and one evening, C-33, that was I, C-33 and C-48, fall out. We left the rank, and the turnkey said, You are to go before the warden. And as pity was already in my heart, I had fear only for him. I was even happy that I must suffer on his account. Well, the warden was simply a monster. He called P first, he wished to hear us separately, 
since the punishment for the one who has spoken first is twice as heavy as for the other. Usually the former gets a fortnight in the dark cell, the latter only a week. So the warden wanted to know which of us two had been the first. And of course P said he was. And when the warden interrogated me presently, of course I too said it had been I. That enraged the man so that his face went scarlet, for he could not understand such a thing. But P declares also that he began. I don't understand. What do you say to that, mon cher? He could not understand. He was very much embarrassed. But I have already given him fourteen days. And then, very well, if this is the case, you simply both get fourteen days. Splendid that, eh? The man simply had not an atom of imagination. Wilde was greatly amused. He laughed and then went on talking gaily. Naturally, after the fourteen days, our desire to talk was all the keener. You know how sweet is the sensation of suffering for others. Gradually, one did not always parade in just the same sequence, gradually I managed to talk with all of them. I knew the name of every single one, his story, and when he would be leaving prison. And to each I said, the first thing you are to do when you come out is to go to the post office. There will be a letter there for you with money. There were some splendid fellows among them. Will you believe me if I tell you that already some three of my fellow prisoners have visited me here? Is that not wonderful? The unimaginative warden was succeeded by a very nice one. Now I could ask to read whatever I wished. I thought of the Greeks, and that they would please me. I asked for Sophocles, but he was not to my taste. Then I thought of the writers on religion. Those, too, failed to hold me. And suddenly I thought of Dante. Oh, Dante! I read Dante every day in the Italian, every page of him. But neither the purgatory nor the paradise was intended for me. But the inferno! What else was I to do but adore it? Hell! Were we not dwelling in it? Hell, that was the prison. The same night he spoke to me of his dramatic scheme of a pharaoh and of a spirited story on Judas. The following morning, Wilde took me to a charming little house not far from the hotel that he had rented and was beginning to furnish. Here he meant to write his plays, first the pharaoh, then an Achab and Isabella, the story of which he told marvelously. The carriage that is to drive me off is ready. Wilde gets in with me to accompany me a little distance. He speaks of my book, praises it cautiously. The carriage stops. Wilde gets out and says good-bye. Then abruptly, Look here, mon cher, you must promise me something. The nourriture terrestre is good, very good. But, mon cher, promise me never to write I again. In art there is no first person. Back in Paris again, I told D my news. He declared, All that is quite ridiculous. Wilde is incapable of suffering boredom. I know him very well. He writes to me every day. I dare say he may finish his play first, but then he will come back to me. He never did anything great in solitude. He needs distractions. He wrote his best while with me. Look at his last letter. D read it out to me. In it, Wilde implored D to let him finish his pharaoh in peace, that then he would return, return to him. The letter closed with this glorious sentence, And then I shall be king of life once more. Soon afterward, Wilde returned to Paris. The play was and remained unwritten. When society wishes to destroy a man, she knows what is needed, and she has methods more subtle than death. Wilde had for two years suffered too much and too passively. His will was broken. For the first few months he was still able to set up illusions for himself, but soon he gave up even those. It was an abdication. Nothing was left of his crushed life but the sorrowful memory of what he had once been. Some wit was still there. Occasionally he tested it, as if to try whether he was still capable of thought but it was a crackling, unnatural, tortured wit. I only saw Wilde twice again. One evening on the boulevards, as I was walking with G, I heard myself called by name. 
I turn around, it was wild. How changed he was. If I should reappear before I have written my play, the world will see in me only the convict, he had said. He had returned without his play, and when some doors closed against him, he sought entry nowhere else. He turned vagabond. Friends often tried to save him. One tried to think what was to be done for him. One took him to Italy. Wilde soon escaped, slipped back. Of those who had remained longest faithful to him, some had several times told me that Wilde had disappeared. Hence I was, I admit, a trifle embarrassed to see him again like that, in that place. Wilde was sitting on the terrace of a café. He ordered two cocktails for myself and G. I sat down facing him so that my back was to those passing. Wilde noticed that and ascribed it to an absurd shame on my part, and not altogether, I regret to say, with injustice. Oh, he said, sit down here next to me, and pointed to a chair by his side. I am so utterly alone now. Wilde was still quite well dressed, but his hat no longer was brilliant. His collar was still of the old cut, but not quite so immaculate, and the sleeves of his coat showed faint fringes. When once I met Verlaine, he began with a touch of pride, I did not blush at him. I was rich, joyous, famous, but I felt that it was an honor for me to be seen with Verlaine, even though he was drunk. Perhaps because he feared to bore G, he suddenly changed his tone, attempted to be witty, to jest. His talk became mere stumbling. As we arose, Wilde insisted upon paying. When I was bidding him farewell, he took me aside and said in a low and confused tone, Listen, you must pay. I am quite without means. A few days later I saw him again, for the last time. Let me mention but one thing of those we talked of. He bewailed his inability to undertake his art once more. I reminded him of his promise that he had made to himself not to return to Paris without a completed play. He interrupted me, laid his hand on mine, and looked at me quite sadly. One must ask nothing of one who has failed. Oscar Wilde died in a miserable little hotel in the Rue des Beaux-Arts. Seven persons followed to his funeral, and not all of these accompanied him to his last resting place. Flowers and wreaths lay on the coffin. Only one piece bore an inscription. It was from his landlord, and on it one read these words, A mon locataire. End of section 9 Recollections of Oscar Wilde by André Guide Translated from the French by Percival Pollard Section 10 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ode to Sappho by Radcliffe Hall. If not from far on, I must hope for ease. Ah, oh, let me seek it from the raging seas. To raging seas unpitied I'll remove, And either cease to live or cease to love. Ovid's Heroic Epistle, number 15 Immortal lesbian, canst thou still behold From some far sphere wherein thy soul doth sing This earth that once was thine, while glimmered gold the joyous beams of youth's forgotten spring can thine unfathomed eyes embrace this sea whose ebb and flow once echoed in thy brain whose tides bear record of thine ecstasy and thy despair that in its arms hath lain those love-burnt lips can death have quenched their fire 
whose words oft stir our senses to unrest whose eager ardour caught and held desire a searing flame against thy living breast passion one lesbian in that awful place where spirits wander lost without a name thou still art sappho and thine ardent face lights up the gloom with love's enduring flame o oh, goddess woman lover all divine and yet divinely mortal where thou art comes not as cadence from some song of thine each throbbing beat that stirs the human heart canst thou forget us who are still thy friends thy lovers o'er the cloudy gulf of years who live and love and dying make amends for life's short pleasures through death's endless fears once thou didst seek the solace of thy kind the madness of a kiss was more to thee than heaven or hell the greatness of thy mind could not conceive more potent ecstasy life was thy slave and gave thee of her store rich gifts and many yet with all the pain of hopeless longing made thy spirit sore in thou didst yearn and couldst not attain o oh, sappho sister by that agony of soul and body hast thou gained a place within each age that shines majestically across the world from out the dusk of space not thy deep pleasures nor thy swiftest joys have made thee thus immortal and yet dear to mortal hearts but that which naught destroys the sacred image of thy falling tear beloved lesbian we would dare to claim by that same tear fond union with thy lot yet tis enough if when we breathe thy name thy soul but listens and forgets us not end of section ten ode to sappho by radcliffe hall recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey Section 11 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Poems by Langston Hughes. Beggar Boy. What is there within this beggar lad that I can neither hear, nor feel, nor see? That I can neither know nor understand? and still it calls to me is not he but a shadow in the sun a bit of clay brown ugly given life and yet he plays upon his flute a wild free tune as if fate had not bled him with her knife my loves i love to see the big white moon a shining in the sky I love to see the little stars when the shadow clouds go by. I love the raindrops falling on my rooftop in the night. I love the soft winds sighing before the dawn's gray light. I love the deepness of the blue in my Lord's heaven above. But better than all these things, I think, I love my lady love. To a dead friend. The moon still sends its mellow light 
through the purple blackness of the night. The morning star is palely bright before the dawn. The sun still shines just as before. The rose still grows beside my door. But you have gone. The sky is blue and the robin sings. The butterflies dance on rainbow wings. Though I am sad. In all the earth no joy can be. Happiness comes no more to me. For you are dead. End of section 11. Three poems by Langston Hughes. Section 12 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Brooksmith by Henry James. Read by Algie Pug. We are scattered now, the friends of the late Mr. Oliver Offord, but whenever we chance to meet, I think we are conscious of a certain esoteric respect for each other. Yes, you too have been in Arcadia, we seem, not too grumpily, to allow. When I pass the house in Mansfield Street, I remember that Arcadia was there. I don't know who has it now, and don't want to know. It's enough to be so sure that if I should ring the bell, there should be no such luck for me as that Brooksmith should open the door. Mr. Offord, the most agreeable, the most attaching of bachelors, was a retired diplomatist, living on his pension, and on something of his own over and above, a good deal confined, by his infirmities, to his fireside, and delighted to be found there any afternoon in the year, from five o'clock on, by such visitors as Brooksmith allowed to come up. Brooksmith was his butler, and his most intimate friend, to whom we all stood, or I should say sat, in the same relation in which the subject of the sovereign finds himself to the Prime Minister. By having been, for years, in foreign lands, the most delightful Englishman any one has ever known, Mr. Offord had, in my opinion, rendered signal service to his country, but I suppose he had been too much liked, liked even by those who didn't like it, so that, as people of that sort never get titles or dotations for the horrid things they've not done, his principal reward was simply that we went to see him. Oh, we went perpetually and it was not our fault if he was not overwhelmed with this particular honour. Any visitor who came once came again. To come merely once was a slight nobody, I'm sure, had ever put upon him. His circle, therefore, was essentially composed of habitués, who were habitués for each other, as well as for him, as those of a happy salon should be. I remember vividly every element of the place, down to the intensely Londonish look of the grey opposite houses, in the gap of the white curtains of the high windows, and the exact spot where, on a particular afternoon, I put down my teacup for Brooksmith, lingering an instant, to gather it up as if he were plucking a flower. Mr. Offord's drawing-room was indeed Brooksmith's garden, his pruned and tended human parterre, and if we all flourished there, and grew well in our places, it was largely owing to his supervision. Many persons have heard much, though most have doubtless seen little, of the famous institution of the Salon, and many are born to the depression of knowing that this finest flower of social life refuses to bloom where the English tongue is spoken. The explanation is usually that our women have not the skill to cultivate it, the art to direct, through a smiling land, between suggestive shores, a sinuous stream of talk. My affectionate, my pious memory of Mr. Offord contradicts this induction only, I fear, more insidiously to confirm it. The sallow and slightly smoked a drawing-room, in which he spent so large a portion of the last years of his life, certainly deserved the distinguished name, 
but on the other hand it couldn't be said at all to owe its stamp to any intervention throwing into relief the fact that there was no mrs offord the dear man had indeed at the most been capable of one of those sacrifices to which women are deemed peculiarly apt he had recognized under the influence in some degree it is true of physical infirmity that if you wish people to find you at home you must manage not to be out he had in short accepted the truth which many dabblers in the social art are slow to learn that you must really as they say take a line and that the only way as yet discovered of being at home is to stay at home finally his own fireside had become a summary of his habits why should he ever have left it since this would have been leaving what was notoriously pleasantest in london the compact charmed cluster thinning away indeed into casual couples round the fine old last century chimney-piece which with the exception of the remarkable collection of miniatures was the best thing the place contained mr offord wasn't rich he had nothing but his pension and the use for life of the somewhat superannuated house when i am reminded by some opposed discomfort of the present hour how perfectly we were all handled there i ask myself once more what had been the secret of such perfection one had taken it for granted at the time for anything that is supremely good produces more acceptance than surprise i felt we were all happy but i didn't consider how our happiness was managed and yet there were questions to be asked questions that strike me as singularly obvious now that there's nobody to answer them mr offord had solved the insoluble he had without feminine help save in the sense that ladies were dying to come to him and that he saved the lives of several established a salon but i might have guessed that there was a method in his madness a law in his success he hadn't hit it off by a mere fluke there was an art in it all and how was the art so hidden who indeed if it had come to that was the occult artist launching this inquiry the other day i had already got hold of the tale of my reply i was helped by the very wonder of some of the conditions that came back to me those that used to seem as natural as sunshine in a fine climate how was it for instance that we never were a crowd never either too many or too few always the right people with the right people there must really have been no wrong people at all always coming and going never sticking fast nor overstaying yet never popping in or out with an indecorous familiarity how was it that we all sat where we wanted and moved when we wanted and met whom we wanted and escaped when we wanted joining according to the accident of inclination the general circle of falling in with a single talker on a convenient sofa why were all the sofas so convenient the accidents so happy the talkers so ready the listeners so willing the subjects presented to you in a rotation as quickly foreordained as the courses at dinner a dearth of topics would have been as unheard of as a lapse in the service these speculations couldn't fail to lead me to the fundamental truth that brooksmith had been somehow at the bottom of the mystery if he hadn't established the salon at least he had carried it on brooksmith in short was the artist we felt this covertly at the time without formulating it and were conscious as an ordered and prosperous community of his even-handed justice all untainted with flunkeyism he had none of that vulgarity his touch was infinitely fine the delicacy of it was clear to me on the first occasion my eyes rested as they were so often to rest again on the domestic revealed in the turbid light of the street by the opening of the house door i saw on the spot that though he had plenty of school he carried it without arrogance he had remained articulate and human l'école anglaise mr offord 
used laughingly to call him when later on it happened more than once that we had some conversation about him but i remember accusing mr offord of not doing him quite ideal justice that he wasn't one of the giants of the school however was admitted by my old friend who really understood him perfectly and was devoted to him as i shall show which doubtless poor brooksmith had himself felt to his cost when his value in the market was originally determined the utility of his class in general is estimated by the foot and the inch and poor brooksmith had only about five feet three to put into circulation he acknowledged the inadequacy of this provision and i am sure was penetrated with the everlasting fitness of the relation between service and stature if he had been mr offord he certainly would have found brooksmith wanting and indeed the laxity of his employer on this score was one of the many things he had had to condone and of which he had at last indulgently adapted himself i remember the old man saying to me oh my servants if they could live with me a fortnight they could live with me forever but it's the first fortnight that tries em it was in the first fortnight for instance the brooksmith had had to learn that he was exposed to being addressed as my dear fellow and my poor child strange and deep must such a probation have been to him and he doubtless emerged from it tempered and purified this was written to a certain extent in his appearance in his spare brisk little person in his cloistered white face and extraordinarily polished hair which told of responsibility looked as if it were kept up to the same high standard as the plate in his small clear anxious eyes even in the permitted though not exactly encouraged tuft on his chin he thinks me rather bad but i've broken him in and now he likes the place he likes the company said the old man i embraced this fully after i had become aware that brooks smith's main characteristic was a deep and shy refinement though i remember i was rather puzzled when on another occasion mr offord remarked what he likes is the talk mingling in the conversation i was conscious that i had never seen brooksmith permit himself this freedom but i guessed in a moment that what mr offord alluded to was a participation more intense than any speech could have represented that of being perpetually present on a hundred legitimate pretexts errands necessities and breathing the very atmosphere of criticism the famous criticism of life quite an education sir isn't it sir he said to me one day at the foot of the stairs when he was letting me out and i've always remembered the words and the tone as the first sign of the quickening drama of poor brooksmith's fate it was indeed an education but to what was this sensitive young man of thirty-five of the servile class being educated practically and inevitably for the time to companionship to the perpetual the even exaggerated reference and appeal of a person brought to dependence by his time of life and his infirmities and always addicted moreover this was the exaggeration to the art of giving you pleasure by letting you do things for him there were certain things mr offord was capable of pretending he liked you to do even when he didn't this i mean if he thought you liked them if it happened that you didn't either which was rare yet might be of course there were cross purposes but brooksmith was there to prevent their going very far this was precisely the way he acted as moderator he averted misunderstandings or cleared them up he had been capable strange as it may appear of acquiring for this purpose an insight into the french tongue which was often used at mr offord's for besides being habitual to most of the foreigners and they were many who haunted the place or arrived with letters letters often requiring a little worried consideration of which brooksmith always had cognizance it had really become the primary language of the master of the house 
I don't know if all the malentendus were in French, but almost all the explanations were, and this didn't a bit prevent Brooksmith's following them. I know Mr. Orford used to read passages to him from Montaigne and Saint-Simon, for he read perpetually when alone, when they were alone, that is, and Brooksmith was always about. Perhaps you'll say no wonder Mr. Offord's butler regarded him as rather mad. However, if I'm not sure what he thought about Montaigne, I'm convinced he admired Saint-Simon. A certain feeling for letters must have rubbed off on him from the mere handling of his master's books, which he was always carrying to and fro and putting back in their places. I often noticed that if an anecdote or a quotation, much more a lively discussion, was going forward, he would, if busy with the fire or the curtains, the lamp or the tea, find a pretext for remaining in the room till the point should be reached. If his purpose was to catch it, you weren't discreet. You were, in fact, scarce human to call him off. And I shall never forget a look, a hard, stony stare. I caught it in its passage which one day, when there were a good many people in the room, he fastened upon the footman who was helping him in the service, and who, in an undertone, had asked him some irrelevant question. It was only the first manifestation of harshness I ever observed on Brooksmith's part, and I at first wondered what was the matter. Then I became conscious that Mr. Offord was relating a very curious anecdote, never before perhaps made so public, and imparted to the narrator by an eye-witness of the fact, bearing on Lord Byron's life in Italy. Nothing would induce me to reproduce it here, but Brooksmith had been in danger of losing it. If I ever should venture to reproduce it, I shall feel how much I lose in not having my fellow auditor to refer to. The first day Mr. Offord's door was closed was therefore a dark date in contemporary history. It was raining hard, and my umbrella was wet. But Brooksmith received it from me, exactly as if this were preliminary for going upstairs. I observed, however, that instead of putting it away, he held it poised and trickling over the rug, and I then became aware that he was looking at me with deep, acknowledging eyes, his air of universal responsibility. I immediately understood there was scarce need of question and answer as they passed between us. When I took in that our good friend had given up, as never before, though only for the occasion, I exclaimed dolefully, What a difference it will make! And to how many people! I shall be one of them, sir, said Brooksmith, and that was the beginning of the end. Mr. Offord came down again, but the spell was broken, the great sign being that the conversation was, for the first time, not directed. It wandered and stumbled, a little frightened, like a lost child. It had let go the nurse's hand. The worst of it is now that we shall talk about my health. C'est la fin de tour, Mr. Offord said when he reappeared. And then I recognised what a note of change that would be for he had never tolerated anything so provincial. We ran to each other's health as little as to the daily weather. The talk became ours, in a word, not his, and, as ours, even when he talked, it could only be inferior. In this form it was a distress to Brooksmith, whose attention now wandered from it altogether. He had so much closer a vision of his master's intimate conditions than our superficialities represented. There were better hours, and he was more in and out of the room, but I could see that he was conscious of the decline, almost of the collapse, of our great institution. He seemed to wish to take counsel with me about it, to feel responsible for its going on in some form or other, when, for the second period, the first had lasted several days, he had to tell me that his employer didn't receive, I half expected to hear him say, after a moment, "'Do you think I ought to, sir, in his place?' As he might have asked me, with the return of autumn, if I had thought he had better light the drawing-room fire. 
he had a resigned philosophic sense of what his guests our guests as i came to regard them in our colloquies would expect his feeling was that he wouldn't absolutely approve of himself as a substitute for mr offord but he was so saturated with the religion of habit that he would have made for our friends the necessary sacrifice to the divinity he would take them on a little further till they could look about them i think i saw him also mentally confronted with the opportunity to deal for once in his life with some of his own dumb preferences his limitations of sympathy weeding a little in prospect and returning to a purer tradition it was not unknown to me that he considered that toward the end of our host career a certain laxity of selection had crept in at last it came to be the case that we all found the closed door more often than the open one but even when it was closed brooksmith managed to crack for me to squeeze through so that practically i never turned away without having paid a visit the difference simply came to be that the visit was to brooksmith it took place in the hall at the familiar foot of the stairs and we didn't sit down at least brooksmith didn't moreover it was devoted wholly to one topic and always had the air of being already over beginning so to say at the end but it was always interesting it always gave me something to think about it's true that the subject of my meditation was ever the same ever it's all very well but what will become of brooksmith even my private answer to this question left me still unsatisfied no doubt mr offord would provide for him but what would he provide that was the great point he couldn't provide society and society had become a necessity of brooksmith's nature i must add that he never showed a symptom of what i may call sordid solicitude anxiety on his own account he was rather livid and intensely grave as befitted a man before whose eyes the shade of that which once was great was passing away he had the solemnity of a person winding up under depressing circumstances a long established and celebrated business he was a kind of social executor or liquidator but his manner seemed to testify exclusively to the uncertainty of our future i couldn't in those days have afforded it i lived in two rooms in german street and didn't keep a man but even if my income had permitted i shouldn't have ventured to say to brooksmith emulating mr offord my dear fellow i'll take you on the whole turn of our intercourse was so much more an implication that it was i who should now want a lift indeed there was a tacit assurance in brooksmith's whole attitude that he should have me on his mind one of the most assiduous members of our circle had been lady kenyon and i remember his telling me one day that her ladyship had in spite of her own infirmities lately much aggravated been in person to inquire in answer to this i remarked that she would feel it more than any one brooksmith had a pause before saying in a certain tone there's no reproducing some of his tones i'll go and see her I went to see her myself and learned he had waited on her but when i said to her in the form of a joke but with a core of earnest that when all was over some of us ought to combine to club together and set brooksmith up on his own account she replied a trifle disappointingly do you mean in a public house i looked at her in a way i think brooksmith himself would have approved and then i answered yes the offord arms what i had meant of course was that for the love of art itself we ought to look to it that such a peculiar faculty and so much acquired experience shouldn't be wasted i really think that if we had caused a few black-edged cars to be struck off and circulated mr brooksmith will continue to receive on the old premises from four to seven business carried on as usual during the alterations the greater number of us would have rallied sometimes he took me upstairs always by his own proposal 
and our dear old friend in bed in a curious flowered and brocaded cassock which made him especially as his head was tied up in a handkerchief to match look to my imagination like the dying voltaire held for ten minutes a sadly shrunken little salon i felt indeed each time as if i were attending the last coucher of some social sovereign he was royally whimsical about his sufferings and not at all concerned quite as if the constitution provided for the case about his successor he glided over our sufferings charmingly and none of his jokes it was a gallant abstention some of them would have been so easy were at our expense now and again i confess there was one at brooksmith's but so pathetically sociable as to make the excellent man look at me in a way that seemed to say do exchange a glance with me or i shan't be able to stand it what he wasn't able to stand was not what mr offord said about him but what he wasn't able to say in return his idea of conversation for himself was giving you the convenience of speaking to him and when he went to see lady kenyon for instance it was to carry her the tribute of his receptive silence where would the speech of his betters have been if proper service had been a manifestation of sound in that case the fundamental difference would have had to be shown by their dumbness and many of them poor things were dumb enough without that provision brooksmith took an unfailing interest in the preservation of the fundamental difference it was the thing he had most on his conscience what had become of it however when mr offord passed away like any inferior person was relegated to the eternal stillness after the manner of a butler above stairs his aspect on the event for the several successive days may be imagined and the multiplication by funereal observance of the things he didn't say when everything was over it was late the same day i knocked at the door of the house of mourning as i so often had done before i could never call on mr offord again but i come literally to call on brooksmith i wanted to ask him if there was anything i could do for him painted with vagueness as this inquiry could only be my presumptuous dream of taking him into my own service had died away my service wasn't worth his being taken into my offer could only be to help him find another place and yet there was an indelicacy as it were in taking for granted that his thoughts would immediately be fixed on another i had a hope that he would be able to give his life a different form though certainly not the form the frequent result of such bereavements of his setting up a little shop that would have been dreadful for i should have wished to forward any enterprise he might embark in yet how could i have brought myself to go and pay him shillings and take back coppers over a counter my visit then was simply an intended compliment he took it as such gratefully and with all the tact in the world he knew i really couldn't help him and that i knew he knew i couldn't but we discussed the situation with a good deal of elegant generality at the foot of the stairs in the hall already dismantled where i had so often discussed other situations with him the executors were in possession as was still more apparent when he made me pass for a few minutes into the dining-room where various objects were muffled up for removal two definite facts however he had to communicate one being that he was to leave the house for ever that night servants for some mysterious reason seem always to depart by night and the other he mentioned it only at the last and with hesitation that he was already aware his late master had left him a legacy of eighty pounds i'm very glad i said and brooksmith was of the same mind it was so like him to think of me that was all that passed between us on the subject and i know nothing of his judgment of mr offord's memento eighty pounds are always eighty pounds and no one has ever left me an equal sum but all the same for brooksmith i was disappointed i don't know what i had expected but it was almost a shock eighty pounds might stock a small shop 
a very small shop. But, I repeat, I couldn't bear to think of that. I asked my friend if he had been able to save a little, and he replied, No, sir, I've had to do things. I didn't inquire what things they might have been. They were his own affair, and I took his word for them as assentingly as if he had had the greatness of an ancient house to keep up, especially as there was something in his manner that seemed to convey a prospect of farther sacrifice. "'I shall have to turn round a bit, sir. I shall have to look about me,' he said. And then he added, indulgently, magnanimously, "'If you should ever happen to hear of anything for me?' I couldn't let him finish. This was, in its essence, too much in the really grand manner. It would be a help my getting him off my mind to be able to pretend I could find the right place. And that help he wished to give me, for it was doubtless painful for him to see me in so false a position. I interposed with a few words to the effect of how well aware I was that wherever he should go, whatever he should do, he would miss our old friend terribly miss him even more than I should, having been with him so much more. This led him to make the speech that has remained with me as the very text of the whole episode. "'Oh, sir, it's sad for you, very sad indeed, and for a great many gentlemen and ladies. That it is, sir. But for me, sir, it is, if I may say so, still graver even than that. It's just the loss of something that was everything.' For me, sir, he went on with rising tears, he was just all, if you know what I mean, sir. You have others, sir, I dare say, not though I'd have you understand me to speak of them as in any way tantamount, but you have the pleasures of society, sir, if it's only in talking about him, sir, as I dare say you do freely, for all his blessed memory has to fear from it, with gentlemen and ladies who have had the same honour. That's not for me, sir, and I've had to keep my associations to myself. Mr. Offord was my society, and now, you see, I just haven't any. You go back to conversation, sir, after all, and I go back to my place, Brooksmith stammered, without exaggerated irony or dramatic bitterness, but with a flat unstudied veracity, and his hand on the knob of the street door. He turned it to let me out, and then he added, I'll just go downstairs, sir, again, and I stay there. My poor child, I replied in my emotion, quite as Mr. Offord used to speak. My dear fellow, leave it to me. We'll look after you. We'll all do something for you. Ah, if you give me someone like him, but there ain't two such in the world, Brooksmith said as we parted. He had given me his address, the place where he would be to be heard of. For a long time I had no occasion to make use of the information. He proved on trial so very difficult a case. The people who knew him, and had known Mr. Offord, didn't want to take him. And yet I couldn't bear to try to thrust him among strangers, strangers to his past, when not to his present. I spoke to many of our old friends about him, and found them all governed by the odd mixture of feelings of which I myself was conscious, as well as disposed, farther, to entertain a suspicion that he was spoiled, with which I then would have nothing to do. In plain terms, a certain embarrassment, a sensible awkwardness, when they thought of it, attached to the idea of using him as a menial, they had met him so often in society. Many of them would have asked him, and did ask him, or rather did ask me to ask him, to come and see them, but a mere visiting list was not what I wanted for him. He was too short for people who were very particular. Nevertheless, I heard of an opening in a diplomatic household which led me to write him a note, though I was looking much less for something grand than for something human. Five days later I heard from him. The secretary's wife had decided, after keeping him waiting till then, that she couldn't take a servant out of a house in which there hadn't been a lady. The note had a postscript. It was a good job there wasn't, sir, such a lady as some. A week later he came to see me, and told me that he was suited, 
committed to some highly respectable people. There was something quite immense in the city, who lived on the Bayswater side of the park. "'I oh dare say it will be rather poor, sir,' he admitted. "'But I've seen the fireworks, haven't I, sir? It can't be fireworks every night. After Mansfield Street there ain't much choice.' There was a certain amount, however, it seemed. For the following year, calling one day on a country cousin, a lady of a certain age, who was spending a fortnight in town with some friends of her own, a family unknown to me and resident in Chester Square, the door of the house was opened, to my surprise and gratification, by Brooksmith and Parson. When I came out I had some conversation with him, from which I gathered that he had found the large city people too dull for endurance. And I guessed, though he didn't say it, that he had found them vulgar as well. I don't know what judgment he would have passed on his actual patrons if my relative hadn't been their friend, but in view of that connection he abstained from comment. None was necessary, however, for before the lady in question brought her visit to a close, they honoured me with an invitation to dinner, which I accepted. There was a largish party on the occasion, but I confess I thought of Brooksmith rather more than of the seated company. They required no depth of attention. They were all referable to the usual irredeemable inevitable types. It was the world of cheerful commonplace and conscious gentility and prosperous density, a full-fed material insular world, a world of hideous florid plate and ponderous order and thin conversation. There wasn't a word said about Byron, or even about a minor bard then much in view. Nothing would have induced me to look at Brooksmith in the course of the repast, and I felt sure that not even my overturning the wine would have induced him to meet my eye. We were in intellectual sympathy. We felt, as regards each other, a degree of social responsibility. In short, we had been in Arcadia together, and we had both come to this. No wonder we were ashamed to be confronted. When he had helped on my overcoat, as I was going away, we parted for the first time since the earliest days of Mansfield Street in silence. I thought he looked lean and wasted, and I guessed that his new place wasn't more human than his previous one. There was plenty of beef and beer, but there was no reciprocity. The question for him to have asked before accepting the position wouldn't have been, how many footmen are kept, but how much imagination? The next time I went to the house, I confess it wasn't very soon, I encountered his successor, a personage who evidently enjoyed the good fortune of never having quitted his natural level. Could any be higher? he seemed to ask, over the heads of three footmen, and even of some visitors. He made me feel as if Brooksmith were dead, but I didn't dare to inquire. I couldn't have borne his, I haven't the least idea, sir. I dispatched a note to the address that worthy had given me after Mr. Offord's death, but I received no answer. Six months later, however, I was favoured with a visit from an elderly, dreary, dingy person, who introduced herself to me as Mr. Brooksmith's aunt, and from whom I learned that he was out of place and out of health, and had allowed her to come and say to me that if I could spare half an hour to look in at him, he would take it as a rare honour. I went the next day. His messenger had given me a new address, and found my friend lodged in a short, sordid street in Marylebone one of those corners of London that were the last expression of sickly meanness. The room into which I was shown was above the small establishment of a dyer and cleaner, who had inflated kid gloves and discoloured shawls in his shop front. There was a deal of grimy infant life up and down the place, and there was a hot moist smell within, as of the boiling of dirty linen. Brooksmith sat with a blanket over his legs at a clean little window where, from behind stiff bluish-white curtains, he could look across at a huckster's and a tinsmith's and a small greasy public-house. He had passed through an illness and was convalescent, and his mother, as well as his aunt, was in attendance on him. 
I liked the nearer relative, who was bland and intensely humble, but I had my doubts of the remoter, whom I connected perhaps unjustly with the opposite public house. She seemed somehow greasy with the same grease, and whose furtive eye followed every movement of my hand to see if it weren't going into my pocket. I didn't take this direction. I couldn't, unsolicited, put myself at that sort of ease with Brooksmith. Several times the door of the room opened, and mysterious old women peeped in and shuffled back again. I don't know who they were. Poor Brooksmith seemed encompassed with vague, prying, beery females. He was vague himself, and evidently weak, and much embarrassed, and not an illusion was made between us to Mansfield Street. The vision of the salon, of which he had been an ornament, hovered before me, however, by contrast, sufficiently. He assured me he was really getting better, and his mother remarked he would come round if he could only get his spirits up. The aunt echoed this opinion, and I became more sure that in her own case she knew where to go for such a purpose. I am afraid I was rather weak with my old friend, for I neglected the opportunity, so exceptionally good, to rebuke the levity which had led him to throw up honourable positions. Fine, stiff, steady baths in Bayswater and Belgravia, with morning prayers, as I knew, attached to one of them. Very likely his reasons had been profane and sentimental. He didn't want morning prayers. He wanted to be somebody's dear fellow, but I couldn't be the person to rebuke him. He shuffled these episodes out of sight. I saw he had no wish to discuss them. I noted, further, strangely enough, that it would probably be a questionable pleasure for him to see me again. He doubted now even of my power to condone his aberrations. He didn't wish to have to explain, and his behaviour was likely in future to need explanation. When I bade him farewell, he looked at me a moment with eyes that said everything. How could I talk about those exquisite years in this place, before these people, with the old women poking their heads in? It was very good of you to come to see me. It wasn't my idea. She brought you. We said everything. It's over. You'll lose all patience with me and I'd rather you shouldn't see the rest. I sent him some money in a letter the next day, but I saw the rest only in the light of a barren sequel. A whole year after my visit to him, I became aware once, in dining out, that Brooksmith was one of the several servants who hovered behind our chairs. He hadn't opened the door of the house to me, nor had I recognised him in the array of retainers in the hall. This time I tried to catch his eye, but he never gave me a chance, and when he handed me a dish I could only be careful to thank him audibly. Indeed, I partook of two entrees, of which I had my doubts, subsequently converted into certainties, in order not to snub him. He looked well enough in health, but much older, and wore, in an exceptionally marked degree, the glazed and expressionless mask of the British domestic, the Russ. I saw, with dismay, that if I hadn't known him, I should have taken him, on the showing of his countenance, for an extravagant illustration of irresponsive servile gloom. I said to myself that he had become a reactionary, gone over to the Philistines, thrown himself into religion, the religion of his place, like a foreign lady, sur la retour. I divined, moreover, that he was only engaged for the evening, he had become a mere waiter, had joined the band of the white waistcoated who go out. There was something pathetic in this fact. It was a terrible vulgarization of Brooksmith. It was a mercenary prose of butlerhood. He had given up the struggle for the poetry. If reciprocity was what he had missed, where was the reciprocity now? Only in the bottoms of the wine glasses and the five shillings or whatever they get, clapped into his hand by the permanent man. However, I suppose he had taken up a precarious branch of his profession, because it, after all, sent him less downstairs. His relations with London society were more superficial, but they were, of course, more various. As I went away on this occasion, 
I looked after him eagerly among the four or five attendants, whose perpendicular persons, fluting the walls of London passages, are supposed to lubricate the process of departure. But he was not on duty. I asked one of the others if he were not in the house, and received the prompt answer. Just left, sir. Anything I could do for you, sir? I wanted to say, please give him my kind regards. But I abstained. I didn't want to compromise him. And I never came across him again. Often and often, in dining out, I looked for him, sometimes accepting invitations on purpose to multiply the chances of my meeting him, but always in vain, so that as I met many others of the casual class, over and over again, I at last adopted the theory that he always procured a list of expected guests beforehand, and kept away from the banquets, which he thus learned I was to grace. At last I gave up hope, and one day at the end of three years I received another visit from his aunt. She was drearier and dingier, almost squalid, and she was in great tribulation and want. Her sister, Mrs. Brooksmith, had been dead a year, and three months later her nephew had disappeared. He had always looked after her a bit since her troubles. I never knew what her troubles had been and now she hadn't so much as a petticoat to pawn. She had also a niece to whom she had been everything before her troubles, for the niece had treated her most shameful. These were details. The great and romantic fact was Brooksmith's final evasion of his fate. He had gone out to wait one evening as usual, in a white waistcoat she had done up for him with her own hands, being due at a large party up Kensington Way but he had never come home again, and had never arrived at the large party, nor at any party that any one could make out. No trace of him had come to light. No gleam of the white waistcoat had pierced the obscurity of his doom. This news was a sharp shock to me, for I had my ideas about his real destination. His aged relative had promptly, as she said, guessed the worst. Somehow, and somewhere, he had got out of the way altogether, and now I trust that, with characteristic deliberation, he is changing the plates of the immortal gods. As my depressing visitant also said, he never had got his spirits up. I was fortunately able to dismiss her with her own, somewhat improved. But the dim ghost of poor Brooksmith is one of those that I see. He had indeed been spoiled. End of section twelve. Brooksmith by Henry James. Section thirteen of Lavender Lit One O One Collection. Prelude to Royal Highness by Thomas Mann. Translated from the German by A. Cecil Curtis. Prelude to Royal Highness by Thomas Mann. The scene is the Albrechtstrasse, the main artery of the capital, which runs from Albrechtsplatz and the old Schloss to the barracks of the Fusiliers of the Guard. The time is noon on an ordinary weekday. The season of the year does not matter. The weather is fair to moderate. It is not raining, but the sky is not clear. It is a uniform light gray, uninteresting and somber, and the street lies in a dull and sober light which robs it of all mystery, all individuality. There is a moderate amount of traffic, without much noise and crowd, corresponding to the not over-busy character of the town. Tram cars glide past, a cab or two rolls by, along the pavement stroll a few residents, colorless folk, passers by, the public people. Two officers, their hands in the slanting pockets of their gray greatcoats, approach each other, a general and a lieutenant. The general is coming from the Schloss, the lieutenant from the direction of the barracks. The lieutenant is quite young, a mere stripling, 
little more than a child. He has narrow shoulders, dark hair, and the wide cheekbones, so common in this part of the world, blue, rather tired-looking eyes, and a boyish face with a kind but reserved expression. The general has snow-white hair, is tall and broad-shouldered, altogether a commanding figure. His eyebrows look like cotton wool, and his moustache hangs right down over his mouth and chin. He walks with slow deliberation. His sword rattles on the asphalt. His plume flutters in the wind, and at every step he takes. The big red lapel of his coat flaps slowly up and down. And so these two draw near each other. Can this rencontre lead to any complication? Impossible. Every observer can foresee the course this meeting will naturally take. We have on one side and the other age and youth, authority and obedience, years of services and docile apprenticeship. A mighty hierarchical gulf, rules and prescriptions separate the two. Natural organization, take thy course, and instead what happens instead the following surprising painful delightful and topsy-turvy scene occurs the general noticing the young lieutenant's approach alters his bearing in a surprising manner he draws himself up yet at the same time seems to get smaller he tones down with a jerk so to speak the splendor of his appearance stops the clatter of his sword and while his face assumes a cross and embarrassed expression he obviously cannot make up his mind where to turn his eyes and tries to conceal the fact by staring from under his cotton-wool eyebrows at the asphalt straight in front of him the young lieutenant too betrays to the careful observer some slight embarrassment which however strange to say he seems to succeed better than the gray-haired general, in cloaking with a certain grace and self-command. The tension of his mouth is relaxed into a smile at once modest and genial, and his eyes are directed with a quiet and self-possessed calm, seemingly without an effort, over the general's shoulder and beyond. By now they have come within three paces of each other, and, instead of the prescribed salute, the young lieutenant throws his head slightly back, at the same time draws his right hand, only his right, mark you, out of his coat pocket, and makes with his same white-gloved right hand a little encouraging and condescending movement, just opening the fingers with palm upward, nothing more. But the general, who has awaited this sign with his arms to his sides, raises his hand to his helmet, steps aside, bows, making a half-circle as if to leave the pavement free, and deferentially greets the lieutenant with reddening cheeks and honest, modest eyes. Thereupon the lieutenant, his hand to his cap, answers the respectful greeting of his superior officer, answers it with a look of childlike friendliness, answers it, and goes on his way. A miracle, a freak of fancy. He goes on his way. People look at him, but he looks at nobody, looks straight ahead through the crowd, with something of the air of a woman who knows that she is being looked at. People greet him. He returns the greeting, heartily and yet distantly. He seems not to walk very easily. It looks as if he were not much accustomed to the use of his legs, or as if the general attention he excites bothers him, so irregular and hesitating in his gait. Indeed, at times, he seems to limp. A policeman springs to attention. A smart woman, coming out of a shop, smiles and curtsies. People turn round to look at him, nudge each other, stare at him, and softly whisper his name. It is Klaus Heinrich, the younger brother of Albrecht, the second, and heir presumptive to the throne, 
there he goes he is still in view known and yet a stranger he moves among the crowd people all around him and yet as if alone he goes on his lonely way and carries on his narrow shoulders the burden of his highness end of prelude to royal highness by thomas mann section fourteen of the lavender lit one hundred and one collection hero and leander by christopher marlowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard hero and leander by christopher marlowe first sestiad on hellespont guilty of true love's blood in view and opposite two cities stood sea borderers disjoined by neptune's might the one abydos the other cestus height at cestus hero dwelt hero the fair whom young apollo courted for her hair and offered as a dower his burning throne where she should sit for men to gaze upon the outside of her garments were of lawn the lining purple silk with gilt stars drawn her wide sleeves green and bordered with a grove where venus in her naked glory strove to please the careless and disdainful eyes of proud adonis that before her lies her kirtle blue whereon was many a stain made with the blood of wretched lovers slain upon her head she wear a myrtle wreath from whence her veil reached to the ground beneath her veil was artificial flowers and leaves whose workmanship both man and beast deceives many would praise the sweet smell as she passed when twas the odour which her breath forth cast and there for honey-bees have sought in vain and beat from thence have lighted there again about her neck hung chains of pebble-stone which lightened by her neck like diamonds shone she wear no gloves for neither sun nor wind would burn or parch her hands but to her mind or warm or cool them for they took delight to play upon those hands they were so white buskins of shells all silvered used she and branched with blushing coral to the knee where sparrows perched of hollow pearl and gold such as the world would wonder to behold those with sweet water oft her handmaid fills which as she went would chirrup through the bills some say for her the fairest cupid pined and looking in her face was stroken blind but this is true so like was one the other as he imagined hero was his mother and oftentimes into her bosom flew about her naked neck his bare arms threw and laid his childish head upon her breast and with still panting rocked there took his rest so lovely fair was hero venus snun as nature wept thinking she was undone because she took more from her than she left and of such wondrous beauty her bereft therefore in sign her treasure suffered rack since hero's time hath half the world been black amorous leander beautiful and young whose tragedy divine musaeus sung dwelt at abydos since him dwelt there none for whom succeeding times make greater moan his dangling tresses that were never shorn had they been cut and unto colchis born would have allured the ventrous youth of greece to hazard more than for the golden fleece fair cynthia wished his arms might be her sphere grief makes her pale because she moves not there 
His body was as straight as Circe's wand. Jove might have sipped out nectar from his hand. Even as delicious meat is to the taste, so was his neck in touching and surpassed the white of Pelop's shoulder. I could tell ye how smooth his breast was and how white his belly and whose immortal fingers did imprint that heavenly path with many a curious dent that runs along his back but my rude pen can hardly blazon forth the loves of men much less of powerful gods let it suffice that my slack muse sings of leander's eyes those orient cheeks and lips exceeding his that leaped into the water for a kiss of his own shadow, and, despising many, died ere he could enjoy the love of any. Had wild Hippolytus, Leander seen, enamoured of his beauty, had he been, his presence made the rudest peasant melt that in the vast uplandish country dwelt. The Barbarous Thracians Soldier Moved with naught was moved with him, and for his favor sought some swore he was a maid in man's attire for in his looks were all that men desire a pleasant smiling cheek a speaking eye a brow for love to banquet royally and such as knew he was a man would say leander thou art made for amorous play why art thou not in love and loved of all though thou be fair yet be not thine own thrall. The men of wealthy Sestos every year, for his sake, whom their goddess held so dear, rose-cheeked Adonis, kept a solemn feast. Thither resorted many a wandering guest to meet their loves, such as had none at all. Came lovers home from this great festival, for every street like to a firmament, Gluster with breathing stars who where they went frighted the melancholy earth which deemed eternal heaven to burn for so it seemed as if another phaeton had got the guidance of the sun's rich chariot but far above the loveliest hero shined and stole away the enchanted gazer's mind or like sea nymphs in vaguely harmony so was her beauty to the standers by nor that night wandering pale and watery star when yawning dragons draw her thirling car from latmus mount up to the gloomy sky where crowned with blazing light and majesty she proudly sits more overrules the flood than she the hearts of those that near her stood even as when gaudy nymphs pursue the chase wretched ixion's shaggy-footed race incensed with savage heat gallop amain from steep pine-bearing mountains to the plain so ran the people forth to gaze upon her and all that viewed her were enamoured on her and as in fury of a dreadful fight their fellows being slain or put to flight poor soldiers stand with fear of death dead stroken so at her presence all surprised and took him await the sentence of her scornful eyes he whom she favors lives the other dies there might you see one sigh another rage and some their violent passions to assuage compile sharp satires but alas too late for faithful love will never turn to hate, and many seeing great princes were denied, pined as they went, and thinking on her died. On this feast day, O oh, cursed day and hour, went Hera through Sestos from her tower to Venus's temple, where unhappily, as after chance, they did each other spy so fair a church as this had venus none the walls were of discolored jasper stone 
wherein was proteus carved and o'erhead a lively vine of green sea agate spread where by one hand light-headed bacchus hung and with the other wine from grapes outrung of crystal shining fair the pavement was the town of cestus called it venus's glass there might you see the gods in sundry shapes committing heady riots incest rapes for know that underneath this radiant floor was danae's statue in a brazen tower jove slyly stealing from his sister's bed to dally with idalian ganymed and for his love europa bellowing loud and tumbling with a rainbow in a cloud blood quaffing mars heaving the iron net which limping vulcan and his cyclops set love kindling fire to burn such towns as troy sylvanus weeping for the lovely boy that now is turned into a cypress tree under whose shade the wood gods love to be and in the midst a silver altar stood there hero sacrificing turtle's blood veiled to the ground veiling her eyelids close and modestly they opened as she rose thence flew love's arrow with the golden head and thus leander was enamoured stone still he stood and evermore he gazed till with the fire that from his countenance blazed relenting hero's gentle heart was struck such force and virtue hath an amorous look it lies not in our power to love or hate for will in us is overruled by fate when two are stripped long ere the course begin we wish that one should lose the other when and one especially do we affect of two gold ingots like in each respect the reason no man knows let it suffice what we behold is censured by our eyes where both deliberate the love is slight whoever loved that loved not at first sight he kneeled but unto her devoutly prayed chaste hero to herself thus softly said were i the saint he worships i would hear him and as she spake those words came somewhat near him he started up she blushed as one ashamed wherewith leander much more was inflamed he touched her hand in touching it she trembled love deeply grounded hardly is dissembled these lovers parlayed by the touch of hands true love is mute and oft amazed stands thus while dumb signs their yielding hearts entangled the air with sparks of living fire was spangled and night deep drenched in misty acturon heaved up her head and half the world upon breathed darkness forth dark night is cupid's day and now begins leander to display love's holy fire with words with sighs and tears which like sweet music entered hero's ears and yet at every word she turned aside and always cut him off as he replied at last like to a bold sharp sophister with cheerful hope thus he accosted her fair creature let me speak without offence i would my rude words had the influence to lead thy thoughts as thy fair looks do mine then shouldst thou be his prisoner who is thine be not unkind and fair misshapen stuff are of behaviour boisterous and rough o oh, shun me not but hear me ere you go god knows i cannot force love as you do my words shall be as spotless as my youth full of simplicity and naked truth this sacrifice whose sweet perfume descending from venus's altar to your footsteps bending doth testify that you exceed her far to whom you offer and whose none you are why should you worship her her 
you surpass, as much as sparkling diamonds flaring glass. A diamond set in lead is worth retains, a heavenly nymph, beloved of human swains, receives no blemish but oft times more grace, which makes me hope, although I am but base, base in respect of thee, divine and pure. Dutiful service may thy love procure, and I, in duty, will excel all other, as thou in beauty dost exceed love's mother. Nor heaven, nor thou, were made to gaze upon, as heaven preserves all things, so save thou one, a stately builded ship, well rigged and tall. The ocean maketh more majestical. Why vowest thou then to live in Sestos here, who on love's seas more glorious wouldst appear? Like untuned golden strings all women are, which long time lie untouched, will harshly jar. Vessels of brass, oft handled, brightly shine. What difference betwixt the richest mine and basest mould but use? For both not used are of like worth, then treasure is abused when misers keep it, being put to loan. In time it will return us two for one. Rich robes themselves and others do adorn. Neither themselves nor others, if not worn, who builds a palace and rams up the gate, shall see it ruinous and desolate. Ah, simple hero, learn thyself to cherish, lone women like to empty houses perish. Less sins the poor rich man that starves himself in heaping up a mass of drossy pelf than such as you. His golden earth remains, which, after his decease, some other gains, but this fair gem, sweet in the loss alone, when you, fleet, hence, can be bequeathed to none. Or, if it could, down from the enameled sky, all heaven would come to claim this legacy, and with intestine broils the world destroy, and quite confound nature's sweet harmony. Well, therefore, by the gods decreed, it is we human creatures should enjoy that bliss. One is no number, maids are nothing, then, without the sweet society of men. Wilt thou live single still? One shalt thou be, though never singling, hymen couple thee. Wild savages that drink of running springs think water far excels all earthly things. But they that daily taste neat wine despise it. Virginity, albeit some, highly prize it. Compared with marriage, had you tried them both, differs as much as wine and water doth. Base bullion, for the stamp's sake we allow. Even so, for men's impression, do we you by which alone our reverend fathers say, Women receive perfection every way. This idol, which you term virginity, is neither essence subject to the eye, no, nor to any one exterior sense, nor hath it any place of residence, nor is't of earth or mould celestial, or capable of any form at all. Of that which hath no being, do not boast. Things that are not at all are never lost. Men foolishly do call it virtuous. What virtue is it that is born with us? Much less can honor be ascribed thereto. Honor is purchased by the deeds we do. Believe me, hero, honor is not won until some honorable deed be done. Seek you for chastity immortal fame and know that some have wronged diana's name whose name is it if she be false or not so she be fair but some vile tongues will blot but you are fair i me so wondrous fair so young so gentle and so debonair as greece will think if thus you live alone some one or other 
keeps you as his own. Then Hera, hate me not, nor from me fly to follow swiftly blasting infamy. Perhaps thy sacred priesthood makes thee loathed. Tell me, to whom mayst thou that heedless oath? To Venus, answered she, and as she spake, forth from those two translucent cisterns break a stream of liquid pearl which down her face made milk-white paths whereon the gods might trace to jove's high court he thus replied the rites in which love's beauteous empress most delights are banquets doric music midnight revel plays masks and all that stern age counted evil thee as a holy idiot doth she scorn for thou in vowing chastity hast sworn to rob her name and honour and thereby commit'st a sin far worse than perjury even sacrilege against her deity through regular and formal purity to expiate which sin kiss and shake hands such sacrifice as this venus demands thereat she smiled and did deny him so as put thereby yet might he hope for mo which makes him quickly reinforce his speech and in her humble manner thus beseech though neither gods nor men may thee deserve yet for her sake whom you have vowed to serve abandon fruitless cold virginity the gentle queen of love's sole enemy then shall you most resemble venus's nun when venus's sweet rites are performed and done flint breasted palace joys in single life but palace and your mistress are at strife love hero then and be not tyrannous but heal the heart that thou hast wounded thus nor stain thy youthful years with avarice fair fools delight to be accounted nice the richest corn dies if it be not reaped beauty alone is lost too warily kept these arguments he used and many more wherewith she yielded that was one before hero's looks yielded but her words made war women are one when they begin to jar thus having swallowed cupid's golden hook the more she strived the deeper was she struck yet evilly feigning anger strove she still and would be thought to grant against her will so having paused a while at last she said who taught thee rhetoric to deceive a maid ay me such words as these should i abhor and yet i like them for the orator with that leander stooped to have embraced her but from his spreading arms away she cast her and thus bespake him gentle youth forbear to touch the sacred garments which i wear upon a rock and underneath a hill far from the town where all is whist and still save that the sea playing on yellow sand sends forth a rattling murmur to the land whose sound allures the golden morpheus in silence of the night to visit us my turret stands and there god knows i play with venus's swans and sparrows all the day a dwarfish beldam bears me company that hops about the chamber where i lie and spends the night that might be better spent in vain discourse and apish merriment come thither as she spake this her tongue tripped for unawares come thither from her slip and suddenly her former colour changed and here and there her eyes through anger ranged and like a planet moving several ways at one self instant she poor soul assays loving not to love at all and every part strove to resist the motions of her heart and hands so pure so innocent nay such as might have made heaven stoop to have a touch did she uphold to venus and again vowed spotless chastity but all in vain cupid beats down her prayers with his wings 
or vows above the empty air he flings all deep enraged his sinewy bow he bent and shot a shaft that burning from him went wherewith she struck him looked so dolefully as made love sigh to see his tyranny and as she wept her tears to pearl he turned and wound them on his arm and for her mourned then towards the palace of the destinies laden with languishment and grief he flies and to those stern nymphs humbly made request both might enjoy each other and be blessed but with a ghastly dreadful countenance threatening a thousand deaths at every glance they answered love nor would vouchsafe so much as one poor word their hate to him was such hearken a while and i will tell you why heaven's winged herald jove born mercury the self-same day that he asleep had laid enchanted argus spied a country maid whose careless hair instead of pearl to adorn it glistened with dew as one that seemed to scorn it her breath as fragrant as the morning rose her mind pure and her tongue untaught to glows yet proud she was for lofty pride that dwells in towered courts is oft in shepherd cells and too too well the fair vermilion knew and silver tincture of her cheeks that drew the love of every swain on her this god enamoured was and with his snaky rod did charm her nimble feet and made her stay the while upon a hillock down he lay and sweetly on his pipe began to play and with smooth speech her fancy to essay till in his twining arms he locked her fast and then he wooed with kisses and at last as shepherds do her on the ground he laid and tumbling in the grass he often strayed beyond the bounds of shame in being bold to eye those parts which no eye should behold and like an insolent commanding lover boasting his parentage would needs discover the way to new elysium but she whose only dower was her chastity having striven in vain was now about to cry and craved the help of shepherds that were nigh herewith he stayed his fury and began to give her leave to rise away she ran after went mercury who used such cunning as she to hear his tale left off her running maids are not won by brutish force and might but speech is full of pleasure and delight and knowing hermes courted her was glad that she such loveliness and beauty had as could provoke his liking yet was mute and neither would deny nor grant his suit still vowed he love she wanting no excuse to feed him with delays as women use or thirsting after immortality all women are ambitious naturally imposed upon her lover such a task as he ought not perform nor yet she asked a draught of flowing nectar she requested wherewith the king of gods and men is feasted he ready to accomplish what she willed stole some from hebe hebe jove's cup filled and gave it to his simple rustic love which being known as what is hid from jove he endly stormed and waxed more furious than for the fire filched by prometheus and thrusts him down from heaven he wandering here in mournful terms with sad and heavy cheer complained to cupid cupid for his sake to be revenged on jove did undertake and those on whom heaven earth and hell relies i mean adamantine destinies he wounds with love and forced them equally to dote upon deceitful mercury they offered him the deadly fatal knife that shears the slender threads of human life at his fair feathered feet the engines laid which the earth from ugly chaos's den upweighed these he regarded not but did entreat that jove usurper of 
his father's seat might presently be banished into hell and aged saturn in olympus dwell they granted what he craved and once again saturn and ops began their golden reign murder rape war lust and treachery were with jove closed in stygian empery but long this blessed time continued not as soon as he his wished purpose got he reckless of his promise did despise the love of the everlasting destinies they seeing it both love and him abhorred and jupiter unto his place restored and but that learning in despite of fate will mount aloft and enter heaven gate and to the seat of jove itself advanced hermes had slept in hell with ignorance yet as a punishment they added this that he in poverty should always kiss and to this day is every scholar poor gross gold from them runs headlong to the boar likewise the angry sisters thus deluded to avenge themselves on hermes have concluded that midas's brood shall sit in honour's chair to which the muses sons are only heir and fruitful wits that in aspiring are shall discontent run into regions far and few great lords in virtuous deeds shall joy but be surprised with every garish toy and still enrich the lofty servile clown who with encroaching guile keeps learning down then muse not cupid's suit no better sped seeing in their loves the fates were injured the end of the first cestia second cestia by this sad hero with love unacquainted viewing leander's face fell down and fainted he kissed her and breathed life into her lips wherewith as one displeased away she trips yet as she went full often looked behind and many poor excuses did she find to linger by the way and once she stayed and would have turned again but was afraid in offering parley to be counted light so on she goes and in her idle flight her painted fan of curled plumes let fall thinking to train leander therewithal he being a novice knew not what she meant but stayed and after her a letter sent which joyful hero answered in such sort as he had hoped to scale the beauteous fort wherein the liberal graces locked their wealth and therefore to her tower he got by stealth wide open stood the door he need not climb and she herself before the pointed time had spread the board with roses strode the room and oft looked out and mused he did not come at last he came oh who can tell the greeting these greedy lovers had at their first meeting he asked she gave and nothing was denied both to each other quickly were applied look how their hands so were their hearts united and what he did she willingly requited sweet are the kisses the embracements sweet when like desires and affections meet for from the earth to heaven is cupid raised where fancy is in equal balance paised yet she this rashness suddenly repented and turned aside and to herself lamented as if her name and honour had been wronged by being possessed of him for whom she longed ay and she wished albeit not from her heart that he would leave her turret and depart the mirthful god of amorous pleasure smiled to see how he this captive nymph beguiled for hitherto he did but fan the fire and kept it down that it might mount the higher now waxed she jealous lest his love abated fearing her own thoughts made her to be hated therefore unto him hastily she goes and like light salmasus her body throws upon his bosom where with yielding eyes she offers up herself a sacrifice 
to slake his anger if he were displeased oh what god would not therewith be appeased like aesop's cock this jewel he enjoyed and as a brother with his sister toyed supposing nothing else was to be done now he her favour and good will had won but know you not that creatures wanting sense by nature have a mutual appetence and wanting organs to advance a step moved by love's force unto each other lep much more in subjects having intellect some hidden influence breeds like effect albeit leander rude in love and raw long dallying with hero nothing saw that might delight him more yet he suspected some amorous rites or other were neglected therefore unto his body hers he clung she fearing on the rushes to be flung strived with redoubled strength the more she strived the more a gentle pleasing heat revived which taught him all that elder lovers know and now the same gan so to scorch and glow as in plain terms yet cunningly he craved it love always makes those eloquent that have it she with a kind of granting put him by it and ever as he thought himself most nigh it like to the tree of tantalus she fled and seeming lavish saved her maidenhead ne'er king more sought to keep his diadem than hero this inestimable gem above our life we love a steadfast friend yet when a token of great worth we send we often kiss it often look thereon and stay the messenger that would be gone no marvel then though hero would not yield so soon to part from that she dearly held jewels being lost are found again this never tis lost but once and once lost lost forever now have the morn espied her lover's steeds whereat she starts puts on her purple weeds and red for anger that he stayed so long all headlong throws herself the clouds among and now leander fearing to be missed embraced her suddenly took leave and kissed long was he taking leave and loath to go and kissed again as lovers used to do sad hero wrung him by the hand and wept saying let your vows and promises be kept then standing at the door she turned about as loath to see leander going out and now the sun that through the horizon peeps as pity these lovers downward creeps so that in silence of the cloudy night though it was morning did he take his flight but what the secret trusty knight concealed leander's amorous habit soon revealed with cupid's myrtle was his bonnet crowned about his arms the purple riband wound wherewith she wreathed her largely spreading hair nor could the youth abstain but he must wear the sacred ring wherewith she was endowed when first religious chastity she vowed which made his love through sestos to be known and thence unto abydos sooner blown than he could sail for incorporeal fame whose weight consists in nothing but her name is swifter than the wind whose tardy plums are reeking water and dull earthly fumes home when he came he seemed not to be there but like exiled air thrust from his sphere set in a foreign place and straight from thence a city's like by mighty violence he would have chased away the swelling main that him from her unjustly did detain like as the sun in a diameter fires and inflames objects removed far and heated kindly shining laterally so beauty sweetly quickens when tis nigh but being separated and removed burns where it cherished murders where it loved therefore even as an index to a book so to his mind was young leander's look oh none but gods have power 
their love to hide affection by the countenance is descried the light of hidden fire itself discovers and love that is concealed betrays poor lovers his secret flame apparently was seen leander's father knew where he had been and for the same mildly rebuked his son thinking to quench the sparkles new begun but love resisted once grows passionate and nothing more than counsel lovers hate for as a hot proud horse highly disdains to have his head controlled but breaks the reins spits forth the ring of bit and with his hoofs checks the submissive ground so he that loves the more he is restrained the worse he fares what is it now but mad leander dares o oh, hero hero thus he cried full oft and then he got him to a rock aloft where having spied her tower long stared he on it and prayed the narrow toiling hellas bunk to part in twain that he might come and go but still the rising billows answered no with that he stripped him to the ivory skin and crying love i come leapt lively in whereat the sapphire visaged god grew proud and made his capering trite sound aloud imagining that ganymede displeased had left the heavens therefore on him he seized leander strived the waves about him wound and pulled him to the bottom where the ground was strewed with pearl and in low coral groves sweet singing mermaids sported with their loves on heaps of heavy gold and took great pleasure to spurn in careless sort the shipwreck treasure for here the stately azure palace stood where kingly neptune and his train abode the lusty god embraced him called him love and swore he never should return to jove but when he knew it was not ganymede for under water he was almost dead he heaved him up and looking on his face beat down the bold waves with his triple mace which mounted up intending to have kissed him and fell in drops like tears because they missed him leander being up began to swim and looking back saw neptune follow him whereat aghast the poor soul gan to cry oh let me visit hero ere i die the god put hella's bracelet on his arm and swore the sea should never do him harm he clapped his plump cheeks with his tresses play and smiling wantonly his love bewrayed he watched his arms and as they opened wide at every stroke betwixt them would he slide and steal a kiss and then run out and dance and as he turned cast many a lustful glance and threw him gaudy toys to please his eye and dive into the water and there cry upon his breast his thighs and every limb and up again and close beside him swim and talk of love leander made reply you are deceived i am no woman i thereat smiled neptune and then told a tale how that a shepherd sitting in a vale played with a boy so fair and kind as for his love both earth and heaven bind that of the cooling river durst not drink lest water nymphs should pull him from the brink and when he sported in the fragrant lawns goat-footed satyrs and upstaring fawns would steal him thence ere half this tale was done ay me leander cried the enamoured sun that now should shine on thetis glassy bower descends upon my radiant hero's tower oh that these tardy arms of mine were wings and as he spake upon the waves he springs neptune was angry that he gave no ear and in his heart revenging malice bare he flung at him his mace but as it went he called it in for love made him repent the mace returning back his own hand hit as meaning to be venged for darting it when this fresh bleeding wound leander viewed his colour went and came 
as if he rued the grief which neptune felt in gentle breasts relenting thoughts remorse and pity rest and who have hard hearts and obdurate minds but vicious hair-brained and illiterate hinds the god seeing him with pity to be moved thereon concluded that he was beloved love is too full of faith too credulous with folly and false hope deluding us wherefore leander's fancy to surprise to the rich ocean for gifts he flies tis wisdom to give much a gift prevails when deep persuading oratory fails by this leander being near the land cast down his weary feet and felt the sand breathless albeit he were he rested not till to the solitary tower he got and knocked and called at which celestial noise the longing heart of hero much more joys than nymphs and shepherds when the timbrel rings or crooked dolphin when the sailor sings she stayed not for her robes but straight arose and drunk with gladness to the door she goes where seeing a naked man she screeched for fear such sights as this to tender maids are rare and ran into the dark herself to hide rich jewels in the dark are soonest spied and to her was he led or rather drawn by those white limbs which sparkled through the lawn the nearer that he came the more she fled and seeking refuge slipped into her bed whereon leander sitting thus began through numbing cold all feeble faint and wan if not for love yet love for pity's sake me in thy bed and maiden bosom take at least vouchsafe these arms some little room who hoping to embrace thee cheerly swum this head was beat with many a churlish billow and therefore let it rest upon thy pillow herewith affrighted hero shrunk away and in her lukewarm place leander lay whose lively heat like fire from heaven fent would animate gross clay and higher set the drooping thoughts of base declining souls than dreary mars carousing nectar bowls his hands he cast upon her like a snare she overcome with shame and sallow fear like chaste diana when Actaeon spied her, being suddenly betrayed and dived down to hide her. And as her silver body downward went, with both her hands she made the bed a tent, and in her own mind thought herself secure, or cast with dim and darksome coverture. And now she lets him whisper in her ear, flatter, entreat, promise, protest, and swear, yet ever, as he greedily essayed to touch those dainties she the harpy played and every limb did as a soldier stout defend the fort and keep the foemen out for though the rising ivory mount he scaled which is with azure circling lines impaled much like a globe a globe may i term this by which love sails to regions full of bliss Yet there with Sisyphus he toiled in vain, Till gentle parley did the truce obtain, Wherein Leander on her quivering breast, Breathless spoke something and sighed out the rest, Which so prevailed, as he with small ado Enclosed her in his arms and kissed her too, And every kiss to her was as a charm. And to Leander as a fresh alarm, so that the truce was broke and she alas poor silly maiden at his mercy was love is not full of pity as men say but deaf and cruel where he means to pray even as a bird which in our hands we wring forth plungeth and oft flutters with her wing she trembling strove this strike of hers like that which made the world another world begat of unknown joy treason was in her thought and cunningly to yield herself she sought seeming not one 
it won she was at length in such wars women use but half their strength leander now like theban hercules entered the orchard of the hesperides whose fruit none rightly can describe but he that pulls or shakes it from the golden tree and now she wished this night were never done and sighed to think upon the approaching sun for much it grieved her that the bright daylight should know the pleasure of this blessed night and then like mars and erisine display both in each other's arms chained as they lay again she knew not how to frame her look or speak to him who in a moment took that which so long so charily she kept and fain by stealth away she would have crept and to some corner secretly have gone leaving leander in the bed alone but as her naked feet were whipping out he on the sudden clinged her so about that mermaid-like unto the floor she slid one half appeared the other half was hid thus near the bed she blushing stood upright and from her countenance behold ye might a kind of twilight break which through the hair as from an orient cloud glimpsed here and there and round about the chamber this false morn brought forth the day before the day was born so hero's ruddy cheek hero betrayed and here all naked to his sight displayed whence his admiring eyes more pleasure took than this on heaps of gold fixing his look by this apollo's golden harp began to sound forth music to the ocean which watchful hesperus no sooner heard but he the bright day bearing car prepared and ran before as harbinger of light and with his flaring beams mocked ugly night till she o'ercome with anguish shame and rage danged down to hell her loathsome carriage the end of a second cestia the end of hero and leander by christopher marlowe Section 15 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faith from Orientations by William Somerset Maugham. Recording by Two Win. The moon shone fitfully through the clouds onto the weary face of Brother Jasper kneeling in his cell. His hands were fervently clasped, uplifted to the crucifix that hung on the bare wall and he was praying, praying as he had never prayed before. All through the hours of night, while the monks were sleeping, Brother Jasper had been supplicating his God for light, but in his soul remained a darkness deeper than that of the blackest night. At last he heard the tinkling of the bell that called the monks to prayers, and with a groan lifted himself up. He opened his cell door and went out into the cloister. With downturned face he walked along till he came to the chapel, and, reaching his seat, sank again heavily to his knees. The lights in the chapel were few enough, for San Lucido was nearly the poorest monastery in Spain. A few dim candles on the altar threw long shadows on the pavement, and in the choir their yellow glare lit up uncouthly the pale faces of the monks. When Brother Jasper stood up, the taper at his back cast an unnatural light over him, like a halo, making his great black eyes shine strangely from their deep sockets, while below them the dark lines and the black shadow of his shaven chin gave him an unearthly weirdness. He looked like a living corpse standing in the brown Franciscan cowl, a dead monk doomed for some sin to wander through the earth till the day, the day of judgment, and in the agony of that weary face one could almost read the terrors of eternal death. The monks recited the service with their heavy drone, and the sound of the harsh men's voices ascended to the vault, dragging along the roof. But Jasper heard not what they said. He rose and knelt as they did. He uttered the words. He walked out of the church in his turn, and through the cloister to his cell. 
and he threw himself on the floor and beat his head against the hard stones, weeping passionately. And he cried out, What shall I do? What shall I do? For Brother Jasper did not believe. Two days before, the monk, standing amid the stunted shrubs on the hill of San Lucido, had looked out on the arid plain before him. It was all brown and gray, the desolate ground strewn with huge granite boulders, treeless, and for the wretched sheep who fed there, thin and scanty grass, the shepherd in his tattered cloak sat on a rock, moodily, playing no heed to his flock, dully looking at the desert round him. Brother Jasper gazed at the scene as he had gazed for three years since he had come to San Lucido, filled with faith and great love for God. In those days he had thought nothing of the cold waste as his eyes rested on it, the light of heaven shed a wonderful glow on the scene, and when at sunset the heavy clouds were piled one above the other, like huge fantastic mountains turned into golden fire, when he looked beyond them and saw the whole sky burning red and then a mass of yellow and gold, he could imagine that God was sitting there on his throne of fire, with Christ on his right hand in robes of light and glory, and Mary the Queen on his left and above them the dove with its outstretched wings, the white bird hovering in a sea of light. And it seemed so near. Brother Jasper felt in him almost the power to go there, to climb up those massy clouds of fire and attain the great joy, the joy of the presence of God. The sun sank slowly, the red darkened into purple, and over the whole sky came a color of indescribable softness, while in the east, very far away, shone out the star. And soon the soft, faint blue sank before the night, and the stars in the sky were countless. But still in the west there was the shadow of the sun, a misty gleam. Over the rocky plain the heavens seemed so great, so high, that Brother Jasper sank down in his insignificance. Yet he remembered the glories of the sunset and felt that he was almost at the feet of God. But now, when he looked at the clouds and the sun behind them, he saw no God. He saw the desert plain, the barrenness of the earth, the overladen wretched donkey staggering under his pannier, and the broad-hatted peasant urging him on. He looked at the sunset and tried to imagine the trinity that sat there, but he saw nothing, and he asked himself, Why should there be a God? He started up with a cry of terror, with his hands clasped to his head. My God, what have I done? He sank to his knees, humiliating himself. What vengeance would fall on him? He prayed passionately. But again the thought came. He shrieked with terror. He invoked the mother of God to help him. Why should there be a God? He could not help it. The thought would not leave him that all this might exist without. How did he know? How could anyone be sure, quite sure? But he drove the thoughts away, and in his cell imposed upon himself a penance. It was Satan that stood whispering in his ear, Satan, lying in wait for his soul. Let him deny God, and he would be damned forever. He prayed with all his strength. He argued with himself. He cried out, I believe, I believe. But in his soul was the doubt. The terror made him tremble like a leaf in the wind, and great drops of sweat stood on his forehead and ran heavily down his cheek. He beat his head against the wall, and in his agony swayed from side to side, but he could not believe. And for two days he had endured the torments of hellfire, battling against himself, in vain. The heavy lines beneath his eyes grew blacker than the night, his lips were pale with agony and fasting. He had not dared to speak to anyone, he could not tell them, and in him was the impulse to shout out, Why should there be? Now he could bear it no longer. In the morning he went to the prior's cell and, falling on his knees, buried his face in the old man's lap. Oh, father, help me, help me! The prior was old and wasted. For fifty years he had lived in the desert Castilian plain in the little monastery, all through his youth and manhood, through his age. And now he was older than anyone at San Lucido, white-haired and wrinkled, but with a clear rosy skin like a boy's. His soft blue eyes had shone with light, but a cataract had developed, and gradually his sight had left him till he could barely see the crucifix in his cell and the fingers of his hand. At last he could only see the light. But the prior did not lose the beautiful serenity of his life. He was always happy and kind, 
and feeling that his death could not now be very distant, he was filled with a heavenly joy that he would shortly see the face of God. Long hours he sat in his chair looking at the light with an indescribably charming smile hovering on his lips. His voice broken by sobs, Brother Jasper told his story, while the prior gently stroked the young man's hands and face. Oh, Father, make me believe. One cannot force one's faith, my dear. It comes, it goes, and no man knows the wherefore. Faith does not come from reasoning. It comes from God. Pray for it and rest in peace. I want to believe so earnestly. I am so unhappy. You are not the only one who has been tried, my son. Others have doubted before you and have been saved. But if I die tonight, I should die in mortal sin. Believe that God counts the attempt as worthy as the achievement. Oh, pray for me, Father, pray for me. I cannot stand alone. Give me your strength. Go in peace, my son. I will pray for you, and God will give you strength. Jasper went away. Day followed day, and week followed week. The spring came and the summer, but there was no difference in the rocky desert of San Lucido. There were no trees to bud and burst into leaf, no flowers to bloom and fade. Biting winds gave way to fury heat. The sun beat down on the plain, and the sky was cloudless. Cloudless. Even the nights were so hot that the monks in their cells gasped for breath, and Brother Jasper brooded over the faith that was dead. And in his self-torment his cheeks became so hollow that the bones of his face seemed about to pierce the skin. The flesh shrunk from his hands, and the fingers became long and thin, like the claws of a vulture. He used to spend long hours with the prior, while the old man talked gently, trying to bring faith to the poor monk, that his soul might rest. But one day, in the midst of the speaking, the prior stopped, and Jasper saw an expression of pain pass over his face. What is it? Nothing, my son, he replied, smiling. We enter the world with pain, and with pain we leave it. What do you mean? Are you ill? Father! Father! The prior opened his mouth and showed a great slewing sore. He put Jasper's fingers to his neck and made him feel the enlarged and hardened glands. What is it? You must see a surgeon. No surgeon can help me, Brother Jasper. It is cancer, the crab. It is the way that God has sent to call me to himself. Then the prior began to suffer the agonies of the disease. Terrible pains shot through his head and neck. He could not swallow. It was a slow starvation. The torment kept him awake through night after night, and only occasionally his very exhaustion gave him a little relief so that he slept. Thinner and thinner he became, and his whole mouth was turned into a putrid, horrible sore. But yet he never murmured. Brother Jasper knelt by his bed, looking at him pitifully. How can you suffer at all? What have you done that God should give you this? Was it not enough that you were blind? Ah, I saw such beautiful things after I became blind. All heaven appeared before me. It is unjust, unjust. My son, all is just. You drive me mad. Do you still believe in the merciful goodness of God? A beautiful smile broke through the pain on the old man's face. I still believe in the merciful goodness of God. There was a silence. Brother Jasper buried his face in his hands and thought brokenheartedly of his own affliction. How happy he could be if he had that faith. But the silence in the room was more than the silence of people who did not speak. Jasper looked up suddenly. The prior was dead. Then the monk bent over the body and looked at the face into the opaque white eyes. There was no difference. The flesh was warm. Everything was just the same. And yet... And yet he was dead. What did they mean by saying the soul had fled? What had happened? Jasper understood nothing of it. And afterwards, before the funeral, when he looked at the corpse again, and it was cold and a horrible blackness stained the lips, he felt sure. Brother Jasper could not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the soul... What do they mean by the soul? 
Then a great loneliness came over him. The hours of his life seemed endless, and there was no one in whom he could find comfort. The prior had given him a ray of hope, but he was gone, and now Jasper was alone in the world. And beyond? Oh, how could one be certain? It was awful, this perpetual doubt, recurring more strongly than ever. Men had believed so long. Think of all the beautiful churches that had been made in the honor of God. And the pictures. Think of the works that had been done for his love. The martyrs who had cheerfully given up their lives. It seemed impossible that it should be all for nothing. But, but Jasper could not believe. And he cried out to the soul of the prior, resting in heaven, to come to him and help him. Surely, if he really were alive again, he would not let the poor monk whom he had loved linger in this terrible uncertainty. Jasper redoubled his prayers. For hours he remained on his knees, imploring God to send him light. But no light came, and exhausted Brother Jasper sank into despair. The new prior was a tall, gaunt man, with a great hooked nose and heavy lips. His keen, dark eyes shone fiercely from beneath his shaggy brows, he was still young, full of passionate energy, and with large gesture and loud metallic voice he loved to speak of hellfire and the pains of the damned, hating the Jews and heretics with a bitter personal hatred. To the stake, he used to say, the earth must be purged of this vermin, and it must be purged by fire. He exacted the most absolute obedience from the monks, and pitiless was the punishment for any infringement of his rules. Brother Jasper feared the man with an almost unearthly terror. When he felt resting upon him the piercing black eyes, he trembled in his seat, and a cold sweat broke out over him. If the prior knew, the thought almost made him faint. And yet the fear of it seemed to drag him on. Like a bird before a serpent, he was fascinated. Sometimes he felt sudden impulses to tell him, but the vengeful eyes terrified him. One day he was in the cloister, looking out at the little green plot in the middle where the monks were buried, wondering confusedly whether all that prayer and effort had been offered up to empty images of what? Of the fear of man? Turning round, he started back and his heart beat, for the prior was standing close by, looking at him with those horrible eyes. Brother Jasper trembled so that he could scarcely stand. He looked down. Brother Jasper! The prior's voice seemed sterner than it had ever been before. Brother Jasper! F Father! What have you to tell me? Jasper looked up at him. The blood fled from his lips. Nothing, my father. The prior looked at him firmly, and Jasper thought he read the inmost secrets of his heart. Speak, Brother Jasper, said the prior, and his voice was loud and menacing. Then hurriedly, stuttering in his anxiety, the monk confessed his misery. A horror came over the prior's face as he listened, and Jasper became so terrified that he could hardly speak. But the prior seemed to recover himself, and interrupted him with a furious burst of anger. You look over the plain and do not see God, and for that you doubt him? Miserable fool! Oh, Father, have mercy on me. I have tried so hard. I want to believe, but I cannot. I cannot, I cannot. What is that? Have men believed for a thousand years? Has God performed miracle after miracle, and a miserable monk dares to deny him? I cannot believe. You must. His voice was so loud that it rang through the cloisters. He seized Jasper's clasped hands raised in supplication before him and forced him to his knees. I tell you, you shall believe. Quivering with wrath, he looked at the prostrate form at his feet, moved by convulsive weeping. He raised his hand as if to strike the monk, but with difficulty contained himself. Then the prior bade Brother Jasper go to the church and wait. The monks were gathered together, all astonished. They stood in their usual places, but Jasper remained in the middle, away from them, with head cast down. The prior called out to them in his loud, clear voice, Pray, my brethren, pray for the soul of Brother Jasper, which lies in peril of eternal death. The monks looked at him suddenly, and Brother Jasper's head sank lower, so that no one could see his face. The prior sank to his knees and prayed with savage fervor. Afterwards the monks went their ways, but when Jasper passed them they looked down, and when by chance he addressed a novice, 
The youth hurried from him without answering. They looked upon him as accursed. The prior spoke no more, but often Jasper felt his stern gaze resting on him, and a shiver would pass through him. In the services, Jasper stood apart from the rest, like an unclean thing. He did not join in their prayers, listening confusedly to their monotonous droning, and when a pause came and he felt all eyes turn to him, he put his hands to his face to hide himself. Pray, my brethren, pray for the soul of Brother Jasper, which lies in peril of eternal death. In his cell, the monk would for days sit apathetically looking at the stone wall in front of him, sore of heart. The hours would pass by unnoticed, and only the ringing of the chapel bell awoke him from his stupor. And sometimes he would be seized with sudden passion and, throwing himself on his knees, pour forth a stream of eager, vehement prayer. He remembered the penances which the seraphic father imposed on his flesh, but he always had faith and Jasper would scourge himself till he felt sick and faint, and hoping to gain his soul by mortification of the body, refuse the bread and water which was thrust into his cell, and for a long while eat nothing. He became so weak and ill that he could hardly stand, and still no help came. Then he took it into his head that God would pity him and send a miracle to drive away his uncertainty. Was he not anxious to believe, if only he could? so anxious. God would not send a miracle to a poor monk. Yet miracles had been performed for smaller folk than he, for shepherds and tenders of swine. But Christ himself had said that miracles only came by faith. But Jasper remembered that often the profligate and the harlot had been brought to repentance by a vision. Even the holy Francis had been but a loose gallant till Christ appeared to him. Yet, if Christ had appeared, it showed Ah, but how could one be sure? It might only have been a dream. Let a vision appear to him, and he would believe. Oh, how enchanted he would be to believe, to rest in peace, to know that before him, however hard the life, were eternal joy and the kingdom of heaven. But Brother Jasper put his hands to his head, cruelly aching. He could not understand. He could not know. The doubt weighed on his brain like a sheet of lead, he felt inclined to tear his skull apart to relieve the insupportable pressure. How endless life was! Why could it not finish quickly and let him know? But supposing there really was a God, he would exact terrible vengeance. What punishment would he inflict on the monk who had denied him, who had betrayed him like a second Judas? Then a fantastic idea came into his crazy brain. Was it Satan that put all these doubts into his head? If it were, Satan must exist, and if he did, God existed too. He knew that the devil stood ready to appear to all who called. If Christ would not appear, let Satan show himself. It meant hellfire. But if God were, the monk felt he was damned already, for the truth he would give his soul. The idea sent a coldness through him, so that he shivered, but it possessed him, and he exulted, thinking that he would know at last. He rose from his bed. It was the dead of night, and all the monks were sleeping, and, trembling with cold, began to draw with chalk strange figures on the floor. He had seen them long ago in an old book of magic, and their fantastic shapes, fascinating him, had remained in his memory. In the center of the strange confusion of triangles he stood and uttered in a husky voice the invocation. He murmured uncouth words in an unknown language, and bade Satan stand forth. He expected a thunderclap, the flashing of lightning, sulfurous fumes, but the night remained silent and quiet. Not a sound broke the stillness of the monastery. The snow outside fell steadily. Next day the prior sent for him and repeated his solemn question. Brother Jasper, what have you to say to me? And absolutely despairing, Jasper answered, Nothing, nothing, nothing. Then the prior strode up to him in wrath and smote him on the cheek. It is a devil within you, a devil of obstinacy and pride. You shall believe. He cried to monks to lay hold of him. They dragged him roughly to the cloisters, and stripping him of his cowl, tied it round his waist, and bound him by the hands to a pillar. And the prior ordered them to give Jasper eight and thirty strokes with the scourge, one less than Christ, 
that the devil might be driven out. The scourge was heavy and knotted, and the porter bared his arms that he might strike the better. The monks stood round in eager expectation. The scourge whizzed through the air and came down with a thud on Jasper's bare shoulders. A tremor passed through him, but he did not speak. Again it came down, and as the porter raised it for the third time, the monks saw great bleeding wheels on Brother Jasper's back. Then, as the scourge fell heavily, a terrible groan burst from him. The porter swung his arm, and this time a shriek broke from the wretched monk. The blows came pitilessly, and Jasper lost all courage. He shrieked with agony, imploring them to stop. But ferociously the prior cried, did Christ bear in silence forty stripes save one, and do you cry out like a woman before you have had ten? The porter went on, and the prior's words were interrupted by piercing shrieks. It is the devil crying out within him, said the monks, gloating on the bleeding back and the face of agony. Heavy drops of sweat ran off the porter's face, and his arm began to tire. But he seized the handle with both hands and swung the knotted ropes with all his strength. Jasper fainted. See, said the prior, see the fate of him who has not faith in God. The cords with which he was tied prevented the monk from falling, and stroke after stroke fell on his back till the number was completed. Then they loosed him from the column, and he sank senseless and bleeding to the ground. They left him. Brother Jasper regained slowly his senses, lying out in the cold cloister with the snow on the graves in the middle. His hands and feet were stiff and blue, he shivered and drew himself together for warmth. Then a groan burst from him, feeling the wounds of his back. Painfully he lifted himself up and crawled to the chapel door. He pushed it open and, staggering forward, fell on his face, looking towards the altar. He remained there, long, dazed, and weary, pulling his cowl close round him to keep out the bitter cold. The pain of his body almost relieved the pain of his mind, he wished dumbly that he could lie there and die, and be finished with it all. He did not know the time. He wondered whether any service would soon bring the monks to disturb him. He took sad pleasure in the solitude, and in the great church the solitude seemed more intense. Oh, and he hated the monks. It was cruel, cruel, cruel. He put his hands to his face and sobbed bitterly. But suddenly a warmth fell on him. He looked up, and the glow seemed to come from the crucified Christ in the great painted window by the altar. The monk started up with a cry and looked eagerly. The bell began to ring. The green color of death was becoming richer. The glass gained the fullness of real flesh. Now it was a soft round whiteness. And Brother Jasper cried out in ecstasy, It is Christ! Then the glow deepened, and from the crucified one was shed a wonderful light like the rising of the sun behind the mountains, and the church was filled with its rich effulgence. Oh God, it is moving! The Christ seemed to look at Brother Jasper and bow his head. Two by two the monks walked silently in, and Brother Jasper lifted up his arms, crying, Behold, a miracle! Christ has appeared to me! A murmur of astonishment broke from them and they looked at Jasper, gazing in ecstasy at the painted window. Christ has appeared to me. I am saved. Then the prior came up to him and took him in his arms and kissed him. My son, praise be to God. You are whole again. But Jasper pushed him aside, so that he might not be robbed of the sight which filled him with rapture. The monks crowded round, questioning, but he took no notice of them. He stood with outstretched arms, looking eagerly, his face lighted up with joy. The monks began to kiss his cowl and his feet, and they touched his hands. I am saved! I am saved! And the prior cried to them, Praise God, my brethren, praise God, for we have saved the soul of Brother Jasper from eternal death. But when the service was over and the monks had filed out, Brother Jasper came to himself and he saw that the light had gone from the window. The Christ was cold and dead, a thing of the handicraft of man. What was it that had happened? Had a miracle occurred? A question flashing through his mind made him cry out. He had prayed for a miracle, and a miracle had been shown him. 
the poor monk of San Lucido, and now he doubted the miracle. Oh, God must have ordained the damnation of his soul to give him so little strength. Perhaps he had sent the miracle that he might have no answer at the day of judgment. Faith thou hadst not. I showed myself to thee in flesh and blood. I moved my head. Thou didst not believe thine own eyes. Next day, at Vespers, Jasper anxiously fixed his gaze on the stained glass window. Again a glow came from it, and as he moved, the head seemed to incline itself. But now Jasper saw it was only the sun shining through the window. Only the sun. Then the heaviness descended into the deepest parts of Jasper's soul, and he despaired. The night came, and Jasper returned to his cell. He leaned against the door, looking out through the little window, but he could only see the darkness, and he likened it to the darkness in his own soul. What shall I do? he groaned. He could not tell the monks that it was not a miracle he had seen. He could not tell them that he had lost faith again, and then his thoughts wandering to the future. Must I remain all my life in this cold monastery? If there is no God, if I have but one life, what is the good of it? Why cannot I enjoy my short existence as other men? Am not I young? Am not I of the same flesh and blood as they? Vague recollections came to him of those new lands beyond the ocean, those lands of sunshine and sweet odors. His mind became filled with a vision of broad rivers, running slow and cool, overshadowed by strange, luxuriant trees, and all was a wealth of beautiful color. Oh, I cannot stay, he cried. I cannot stay. And it was a land of loving kindness, a land of soft-eyed, gentle women. I cannot stay. I cannot stay. The desire to go forth was overwhelming. The walls of his cell seemed drawing together to crush him. He must be free. Oh, for life, life. He started up, not seeing the madness of his adventure. He did not think of the snow-covered desert, the night, the distance from a town. He saw before him the glorious sunshine of a new life, and he went towards it like a blind man, with outstretched arms. Everyone was asleep in the monastery. He crept out of his cell and silently opened the door of the porter's lodge. The porter was sleeping heavily. Jasper took the keys and unlocked the gate. He was free. He took no notice of the keen wind blowing across the desert. He hurried down the hill, slipping on the frozen snow. Suddenly he stopped. He had caught sight of the great crucifix which stood by the wayside at the bottom of the hill. Then the madness of it all occurred to him. Wherever he went, he would find the crucifix, even beyond the sea, and nowhere would he be able to forget his God. Always the recollection, always the doubt, and he would never have rest till he was in the grave. He went close to it and looked up. It was one of those strange Spanish crucifixes, a wooden image with long, thin arms and legs and protruding ribs, with real hair hanging over the shoulders, and a true crown of thorns placed on the head, the ends of the tattered cloth fastened about the loins fluttered in the wind. In the night the lifelikeness was almost ghastly. It might have been a real man that hung there, with great nails through his feet. The common people paid superstitious reverence to it, and Jasper had often heard the peasants tell of the consolations they had received. Why should not he too receive consolation? Was his soul not as worth saving as theirs? A last spark of hope filled him, and he lifted himself up on tiptoe to touch the feet. O Christ, come down to me! Tell me whether thou art indeed a god! O Christ, help me! But the words lost themselves in the wind and night. Then a great rage seized him that he alone should receive no comfort. He clenched his fists and beat passionately against the cross. Oh, you are a cruel god! I hate you! I hate you! If he could have reached it, he would have torn the image down and beat it as he had been beaten. In his impotent rage, he shrieked out curses upon it. He blasphemed. But his strength spent itself, and he sank to the foot of the cross, bursting into tears. In his self-pity, he thought his heart was broken. Lifting himself to his knees, he clasped the wood with his hands and looked up for the last time at the dead face of Christ. 
it was the end. A strange peace came over him as the anguish of his mind fell away before the cold. His hands and his feet were senseless. He felt his heart turning to ice, and he felt nothing. In a little while, the snow began to fall, lightly covering his shoulders. Brother Jasper knew the secret of death at last. The day broke slowly, dim and gray. There was a hurried knocking at the porter's door. A peasant with white and startled face said that a brother was kneeling at the great cross in the snow and would not speak. The monk sallied forth anxiously and came to the silent figure, clasping the cross in supplication. Brother Jasper! The prior touched his hands. They were as cold as ice. He is dead! The villagers crowded round in astonishment, whispering to one another. The monks tried to move him, but his hands, frozen to the cross, prevented them. He died in prayer. He was a saint. But a woman with a paralyzed arm came near him, and in her curiosity touched his ragged cowl. Suddenly she felt a warmth pass through her, and the dead arm began to tingle. She cried out in astonishment, and as the people turned to look, she moved the fingers. He has restored my arm, she said. Look! A miracle, they cried out. A miracle! He is a saint! The news spread like fire, and soon they brought a youth lying on a bed, wasted by a mysterious illness, so thin that the bones protruding had formed angry sores on the skin. They touched him with the hem of the monk's garment, and immediately he roused himself. I am whole. Give me to eat. A murmur of wonder passed through the crowd. The monks sank to their knees and prayed. At last they lifted up the dead monk and bore him to the church, but people all around the country crowded to see him. The sick and the paralyzed came from afar and often went away sound as when they were born. They buried him at last, but still to his tomb they came from all sides, rich and poor, and the wretched monk, who had not faith to cure the disease of his own mind, cured the diseases of those who had faith in him. End of section 15 Faith from Orientations by William Somerset Maugham Recording by Tu Win. Section 16 of the Lavender Lit 101 Collection Keep the Home Fires Burning Composed by Ivor Novello Lyrics by Lena Gilbert Ford This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Singing by Matt Perard. Keep the Home Fires Burning by Ivar Novello and Lena Gilbert Ford. They were summoned from the hillside, they were called in from the glen, and the country found them ready at the rallying call for men let no tears add to their hardships as the soldiers pass along and although your heart is breaking make it sing this cheery song keep the home fires burning while your hearts are yearning though your lads are far away they dream of home there's a silver lining through the dark cloud shining turn the dark cloud inside out till the boys come home overseas there came a pleading help a nation in distress and we gave our glorious laddies honor bade us do no less 
for no gallant son of freedom to a tyrant's yoke should bend and a noble heart must answer to the sacred call of friend keep the home fires burning while your hearts are yearning though your lads are far away they dream of home there's a silver lining through the dark clouds shining turn the dark cloud inside out till the boys come home end of keep the home fires burning by ivor novello and lena gilbert ford end of section sixteen Section 17 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. Recording by David Wales. What passing bells for these who die as cattle! only the monstrous anger of the guns only the stuttering rifles rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons no mockeries for them no prayers nor bells nor any voice of mourning save the choirs the shrill demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires what candles may be held to speed them all not in the hands of boys but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of good-byes the pallor of girls brows shall be their pall their flowers the tenderness of patient minds and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds end of section seventeen anthem for doomed youth by wilfred owen Section 18 of Lavender Lit 101. Excerpt from Overture from Swan's Way or Remembrance of Things Past, Volume 1, by Marcel Proust, as translated by C. K. Scott Moncrief. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org overture for a long time i used to go to bed early sometimes when i had put out my candle my eyes would close so quickly that i had not even time to say i'm going to sleep and a half an hour later the thought that it was time to go to sleep would awaken me i would try to put away the book which i imagined was still in my hands and to blow out the light i had been thinking all the time while i was asleep of what i had just been reading but my thoughts had run into a channel of their own until i myself seemed actually to have become the subject of my book a church a quartet the rivalry between francois i and charles v this impression would persist for some moments after i was awake it did not disturb my mind but it lay like scales upon my eyes and prevented them from registering the fact that the candle was no longer burning then it would begin to seem unintelligible as the thoughts of a former existence must be to a reincarnate spirit the subject of my book would separate itself from me leaving me free to choose whether i would form part of it or no and at the same time my sight would return and i would be astonished to find myself in a state of darkness pleasant and restful enough for the eyes and even more perhaps for my mind to which it appeared incomprehensible without a cause a matter dark indeed i would ask myself what o'clock it could be i could hear the whistling of trains which now nearer and now farther off punctuating the distance like the note of a bird in a forest chewed me in perspective the deserted countryside 
through which a traveller would be hurrying towards the nearest station the path that he followed being fixed for ever in his memory by the general excitement due to being in a strange place to doing unusual things to the last words of conversation to farewells exchanged beneath an unfamiliar lamp which echoed still in his ears amid the silence of the night and to the delightful prospect of being once again at home i would lay my cheeks gently against the comfortable cheeks of my pillow as plump and blooming as the cheeks of babyhood or i would strike a match to look at my watch nearly midnight the hour when an invalid who has been obliged to start on a journey and to sleep in a strange hotel awakens in a moment of illness and sees with glad relief a streak of daylight showing under his bedroom door oh joy of joys it is morning the servants will be about in a minute he can ring and someone will come to look after him the thought of being made comfortable gives him strength to endure his pain he is certain he heard footsteps they come nearer and then die away the ray of light beneath his door is extinguished it is midnight someone has turned out the gas the last servant has gone to bed and he must lie all night in agony with no one to bring him any help i would fall asleep and often i would be awake again for short snatches only just long enough to hear the regular creaking of the wainscot or to open my eyes to settle the shifting kaleidoscope of the darkness to savor in an instantaneous flash of perception the sleep which lay heavy upon the furniture the room the whole surroundings of which i formed but an insignificant part and whose unconsciousness i should very soon return to share or perhaps while i was asleep i had returned without the least effort to an earlier stage in my life now forever outgrown and had come under the thrall of one of my childish terrors such as that old terror of my great-uncle's pulling my curls which was effectually dispelled on the day the dawn of a new era for me on which they were finally cropped from my head i had forgotten that event during my sleep i remembered it again immediately i had succeeded in making myself wake up to escape my great-uncle's fingers still as a measure of precaution i would bury the whole of my head in the pillow before returning to the world of dreams sometimes too just as eve was created from a rib of adam so a woman would come into existence while i was sleeping conceived from some strain in the position of my limbs formed by the appetite that i was on the point of gratifying she it was i imagined who offered me that gratification my body conscious that its own warmth was permeating hers would strive to become one with her and i would awake the rest of humanity seemed very remote in comparison with this woman whose company i had left but a moment ago my cheek was still warm with her kiss my body bent beneath the weight of hers if as would sometimes happen she had the appearance of some woman whom i had known in waking hours i would abandon myself altogether to the sole quest of her like people who set out on a journey to see with their own eyes some city that they have always longed to visit and imagine that they can taste in reality what has charmed their fancy and then gradually the memory of her would dissolve and vanish until i had forgotten the maiden of my dream when a man is asleep he has in a circle round him the chain of the hours the sequence of the years the order of the heavenly host instinctively when he awakes he looks to these and in an instant reads off his own position on the earth's surface and the amount of time that has elapsed during his slumbers but this ordered procession is apt to grow confused and to break its ranks suppose that towards morning after a night of insomnia sleep descends upon him while he is reading in quite a different position from that in which he normally goes to sleep he has only to lift his arm to arrest the sun and turn it back in its course and at the moment of waking he will have no idea of the time but will conclude that he has just gone to bed 
or suppose that he gets drowsy in some even more abnormal position sitting in an armchair say after dinner then the world will fall topsy-turvy from its orbit the magic chair will carry him at full speed through time and space and when he opens his eyes again he will imagine that he went to sleep months earlier and in some far distant country but for me it was enough if in my own bed my sleep was so heavy as completely to relax my consciousness and for then i lost all sense of the place in which i had gone to sleep and when i awoke at midnight not knowing where i was i could not be sure at first who i was i had only the most rudimentary sense of existence such as may lurk and flicker in the depths of an animal's consciousness i was more destitute of human qualities than the cave dweller but then the memory not yet of the place in which i was but of various other places where i had lived and might now very possibly be would come like a rope let down from heaven to draw me up out of the abyss of not being from which i could never have escaped by myself in a flash i would traverse and surmount centuries of civilization and out of a half visualized succession of oil lamps followed by shirts with turn-down collars would put together by degrees the component parts of my ego end of excerpt from swan's way by marcel proust as translated by c k scott moncrief Section number 19 for the Lavender Lit Collection, 101. The Sleeper of the Valley by Arthur Rimbaud. Translation by Ludwig Lewinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Sleeper of the Valley by Arthur Rimbaud. Translated by Louis Lawson. There's a green hollow where a river sings, Silvering the torn grass in its glittering flight, And where the sun from the proud mountain flings Fire, and the little valley brims with light. A soldier young, with open mouth, bare head, Sleeps with his neck in dewy watercress, Under the sky and on the grass his bed pale in the deep green and the light's excess he sleeps amid the iris and his smile is like a sick child's slumbering for a while nature in thy warm lap his chilled limbs hide the perfume does not thrill him from his rest he sleeps in sunshine hand upon his breast tranquil with two red holes in his right side End of section number 19. Section 20 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Full Moon by Vita Sackville West. Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick. Full moon. She was wearing the coral taffeta trousers someone had bought her from Ispahan, and the little gold coat with pomegranate blossoms, and the coral hafted feather fan. But she ran down a Kentish lane in the moonlight, and skipped in the pool of the moon as she ran. She cared not a rap for all the big planets, for Betelgeuse or Aldebaran, and all the big planets cared nothing for her, that small, impertinent charlatan. But she climbed on a Kentish stile in the moonlight, and laughed at the sky through the sticks of her fan. End of Full Moon by Vita Sackville West Section 21 of Lavender Lit 101 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Letter Home by Siegfried Sassoon to Robert Graves 
Here I'm sitting in the gloom of my quiet attic room. France goes rolling all around, fledged with forest May has crowned. And I puff my pipe, calm-hearted, thinking how the fighting started, wondering when we'll ever end it, back to hell with Kaiser send it, gag the noise, pack up and go, clockwork soldiers in a row. I've got better things to do than to waste my time on you. Robert, when I drowse to-night, skirting lawns of sleep to chase, shifting dreams in mazy light, somewhere then I'll see your face, turning back to bid me follow, where I wag my arms and hollow, over hedges hasting after crooked smile and baffling laughter, running tireless, floating, leaping, down your web-hung woods and valleys, garden glooms and hornbeam alleys, where the glowworm stars are peeping, till I find you quiet as stone on a hilltop all alone, staring outward, gravely pondering, jumbled leagues of hillock wandering. You and I have walked together in the starving winter weather. We've been glad because we knew time's too short and friends are few. We've been sad because we missed one whose yellow head was kissed by the gods who thought about him till they couldn't do without him. Now he's here again, I've seen soldier David dressed in green, standing in a wood that swings to the madrigal he sings. He's come back, all mirth and glory, like the prince in a fairy story. Winter called him far away, blossoms bring him home with May. Well, I know you'll swear it's true that you found him decked in blue, striding up through morning land with a cloud on either hand. Out in Wales, you'll say, he marches, arm in arm with oaks and larches, hides all night in hilly nooks, laughs at dawn in tumbling brooks. Yet it's certain here he teaches outpost schemes to groups of beaches, and I'm sure as here I stand that he shines through every land, that he sings in every place where we're thinking of his face. Robert, there's a war in France. Everywhere men bang and blunder, sweat and swear and worship chance, creep and blink through cannon thunder. Rifles crack and bullets flick, sing and hum like hornet swarms, bones are smashed and buried quick. Yet through stunning battle storms, all the while I watch the spark lit to guide me, for I know dreams will triumph though the dark scowls above me where I go. You can hear me, you can mingle, radiant folly with my jingle. War's a joke for me and you while we know such dreams are true. End of section 21。section 22 of Lavender Lit 101 Mrs. Whitehead by Gertrude Stein This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Mrs. Whitehead by Gertrude Stein. But you like it. They can't, any of them, be quite as bad because they learn French, but I never did. He doesn't look dead at all. The wind might have blown him. He comes from that direction. That's the way. They are not knotted. Have you smelt it? What would you suggest? Your advice I have come across three or four. So they are the others. Separate them. It does make one come. He is extraordinarily charming and endearing, once of twice. Only twice, I think. He is not staying out. That's hard beside that what does he do. That's long for his mother. She traveled from this rest. She crocheted from this nest. She crocheted from this nest. I thought it wasn't ever. It's one of my favorite ones, this. And yet, not this. Isn't it funny? It isn't. Break or breaking. Very fair. Break or very wanting. I tried it this way before. Very difficult to change extra places, and yet I can agree. I can agree by that. I rest this piece of it, and it's nearly the same climate. I will tell you why they want a real door. They choose it. They do so in very pure water. They are safe when they take a bath. Oh, it is very. Oh, it is. In a way, a vest. I do think you get what you want. Corrections. 
it is eleven weeks from the middle of september i glance in a way it is eleven weeks from the middle of september total recollect others i glance at and i can recollect others i make a division neatly i close what is wrong with not blue that is right with apples apples four 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 before that next stretching next for that leaf stretching i do not state leaf i like to beg very much stream not exactly in state understate all in so they expect all the blues to take of all the other families the whites are extra they are beside all that they make a little house and through and beside that they live in paris hardly enough for wood not a color even by now a change of grass and wedding rings and all but the rest plan i don't care i won't look i am not sure that yellow is good i am tall allow that i don't want any more out in conversation i can be careful not within wearing it i cannot say to stay no please don't get up and now that yes i see did you pay him for that whether for a spider and such splendor and indeed quitting i meant to gather i see it i see it please ocean spoke please helen land please take it away i saw a spoken leaf leaf and flowers made vegetables and foliage in soil i saw representative mistakes in glass cups i saw a whole appearance of respectable refugees i did not ask actors i asked pearls i did not choose to ask trains i was satisfied with celebrated ransoms i cannot deny bertie henschel is coming to-morrow saturdays are even there is a regular principle if you mention it you mention what happened what do you make of it you exceed all hope and all praise end of mrs whitehead by gertrude stein Section twenty three of Lavender Lit one hundred and one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface to Eminent Victorians by Lytton Strachey. Recording by David Wales. The history of the Victorian age will never be written. We know too much about it. For ignorance is the first requisite of the historian ignorance which simplifies and clarifies which selects and omits with a placid perfection unattainable by the highest art concerning the age which has just passed our fathers and our grandfathers have poured forth and accumulated so vast a quantity of information that the industry of a rank would be submerged by it and the perspicacity of a gibbon would quail before it it is not by the direct method of a scrupulous narration that the explorer of the past can hope to depict that singular epoch if he is wise he will adopt a subtler strategy he will attack his subject in unexpected places he will fall upon the flank or the rear he will shoot a sudden revealing searchlight into obscure recesses hitherto undivined he will row out over that great ocean of material and lower down into it here and there a little bucket which will bring up to the light of day some characteristic specimen from those far depths to be examined with a careful curiosity guided by these considerations i have written the ensuing studies i have attempted through the medium of biography to present some victorian visions to the modern eye they are in one sense haphazard visions that is to say my choice of subjects has been determined by no desire to construct a system or to prove a theory but by simple motives of convenience and of art it has been my purpose to illustrate rather than to explain 
it would have been futile to hope to tell even a precy of the truth about the victorian age for the shortest precy must fill innumerable volumes but in the lives of an ecclesiastic an educational authority a woman of action and a man of adventure i have sought to examine and elucidate certain fragments of the truth which took my fancy and lay to my hand i hope however that the following pages may prove to be of interest from the strictly biographical no less than from the historical point of view human beings are too important to be treated as mere symptoms of the past they have a value which is independent of any temporal processes which is eternal and must be felt for its own sake the art of biography seems to have fallen on evil times in england we have had it is true a few masterpieces but we have never had like the french a great biographical tradition we have had no fontenelles and condorcets with their incomparable elogues compressing into a few shining pages the manifold existences of men with us the most delicate and humane of all the branches of the art of writing has been relegated to the journeyman of letters we do not reflect that it is perhaps as difficult to write a good life as to live one those two fat volumes with which it is our custom to commemorate the dead who does not know them with their ill-digested masses of material their slipshod style their tone of tedious panegyric their lamentable lack of selection of detachment of design they are as familiar as the cortege of the undertaker and wear the same air of slow funereal barbarism one is tempted to suppose of some of them that they were composed by that functionary as the final item of his job the studies in this book are indebted in more ways than one to such works works which certainly deserve the name of standard biographies for they have provided me not only with much indispensable information but with something even more precious an example how many lessons are to be learned from them but it is hardly necessary to particularize to preserve for instance a becoming brevity a brevity which excludes everything that is redundant and nothing that is significant that surely is the first duty of the biographer the second no less surely is to maintain his own freedom of spirit it is not his business to be complimentary it is his business to lay bare the facts of the case as he understands them that is what i have aimed at in this book to lay bare the facts of some cases as i understand them dispassionately impartially and without ulterior intentions to quote the words of a master je n'impose rien je ne propose rien j'expose l s end of section twenty three preface to eminent victorians by lytton strachey section twenty four of lavender lit one o one birds in the night by paul verlaine translated by gertrude hall this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard birds in the night by paul verlaine one you are not over patient with me dear this want of patience one must rightly rate you are so young youth ever was severe and variable and inconsiderate you had not all the needful kindness no nor should one be amazed unhappily you're very young cold sister mine and so tis natural you should unfeeling be behold me therefore ready to forgive not gay of course but doing what i can to bear up bravely deeply though i grieve to be through you the most unhappy man two but you will own that i was in the right when in my downcast moods i used to say that your sweet eyes my hope once and delight were come to look like eyes that will betray it was an evil lie you used to swear 
and your glance which was lying dear would flame poor fire near out one stirs to make it flare and in your soft voice you would say je t'aime alas that one should clutch at happiness in senses seasons everything's despite but twas an hour of gleeful bitterness when i became convinced that i was right three and wherefore should i lay my heart wounds bare you love me not and in there lady mine and as i do not choose that one shall dare to pity i must suffer without sign yes suffer for i loved you well did i but like a loyal soldier will i stand till hurt to death he staggers off to die still filled with love for an ungrateful land oh you that were my beauty and my own although from you derive all my mischance are not you still my home then you alone as young and mad and beautiful as france four now i do not intend what were the gain to dwell with streaming eyes upon the past but yet my love which you may think lies slain perhaps is only wide awake at last my love perhaps which now is a memory although beneath your blows it cringe and cry and bleed to will and must as i foresee still suffer long and much before it die judges you justly when it seems aware of some not all banal compunction and of your memory in its despair reproaching you ah fie it was ill done five i see you still i softly push the door as one o'erwhelmed with weariness you lay but o oh, light body love should soon restore you bounded up tearful at once and gay oh what embraces kisses sweet and wild myself from brimming eyes i laughed to you those moments among all o oh, lovely child shall be my saddest but my sweetest too i will remember your smile your caress your eyes so kind that day exquisite snare yourself in fine whom else i might not bless only as they appeared not as they were six i see you still dressed in a summer dress yellow and white bestrewn with curtain flowers but you had lost the glistening laughingness of our delirious former loving hours the eldest daughter and the little wife spoke plainly in your bearings least detail already twas alas our altered life that stared me from behind your dotted veil forgiven be and with no little pride i treasure up and you no doubt see why remembrance of the lightning to one side that used to flash from your indignant eye seven some moments i'm the tempest-driven bark that runs dismasted mid the hissing spray and seeing not our lady through the dark makes ready to be drowned and kneels to pray some moments i'm the sinner at his end that knows his doom if he unshriven go and losing hope of any ghostly friend sees hell already gape and feels it glow oh but some moments i've the spirit stout of early christians in the lion's care that smile to jesus witnessing without a nerve's revolt the turning of a hair end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 26 of Lavender Lit 101 Collection The Closing Door by Angelina W. Grimke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Closing Door by Angelina 
W. Grimke. I was fifteen at the time, diffident, and old far beyond my years, from much knocking about from pillar to post, a yellow, scrawny, unbeautiful girl, when the big heart of Agnes Milton took pity upon me, loved me, and brought me home to live with her in her tiny, sun-filled flat. We were only distantly related, very distantly, in fact, on my dead father's side. You can see, then, there was no binding blood tie between us that she was under absolutely no obligation to do what she did. I have wondered, time and again, how many women would have opened their hearts and their homes, as Agnes Milton did, to a forlorn, unattractive, homeless girl, woman. That one fine, free, generous act of hers alone shows the wonder quality of her soul. Just one little word to explain me after my father had taken one last cup too many and they had carried him for the last time out of the house into which he had been carried so often my mother being compelled to work again returned to the rich family with whom she had been a maid before her marriage she regarded me as seriously i suppose as she did anything in the world but as it was impossible to have me with her i was passed along from one of her relatives to another when one tired of me on i went to the next well i can say this for each and all of them they certainly believed in teaching me how to work judging by the number of homes in which i lived until i was fifteen my mother was rich indeed in one possession an abundance of relatives and then came agnes milton have you ever i wonder known a happy person i mean a really happy one he is as rare as a white blackbird in this sombre faced world of ours i have known two and only two they were agnes milton and her husband jim and their happiness did not last Jim was a brown, good-natured giant with a slow, most attractive smile and gleaming teeth. He spoke always in a deep, sad drawl, and you would have thought him the most unhappy person imaginable, until you glimpsed his black eyes fairly twinkling under their half-closed lids. He made money, which is called easy money, by playing ragtime for dances. He was one of a troop that are called social entertainers as far as jim was concerned it would have slipped away in just as easy a manner if it hadn't been for agnes for she in spite of all her seeming carefree joyousness was a thrifty soul as long as jim could have good food and plenty of it now and then the theatre a concert or a dance and his gold-tipped cigarettes she didn't care what became of his money oh ag if i close my eyes i can hear his slow sad voice as clearly as though these ten long years had not passed by i can hear the click of the patent lock as he closed the flat door i can hear the bang of his hat as he hung it on the rack i can get the whiff of his cigarette oh ag that you jim I can see Agnes's happy eyes and hear her eager, soft voice. And then, after a pause, that sad voice. No, Ag. I can hear her delighted little chuckle. She very seldom laughed outright. Where are you anyway? It was the plaintive voice again. Here. And then he'd make believe he couldn't find her and go hunting her all over that tiny flat searching for her in every room he knew she was not, and he'd stumble over things in pretended excitement and haste and grunt and swear all in that inimitable slow way of his, and she'd stand there, her eyes shining, and every once in a while giving that dear little chuckle of hers. Finally, he'd appear in the door, panting and disheveled, and would look at her in pretended, intense surprise for a second, and then he'd say, in an aggrieved voice, 
it's not fair agnes it's not fair she wouldn't say a word just stand there smiling at him after a little slowly he'd begin to smile too that smile of theirs was one of the most beautiful things i have ever seen and each meeting it was the same their joy and love seemed to gush up and bubble over through their lips and eyes presently he'd say catch she'd hold up her little white apron by the corners and he'd put his hand in his pocket and bring out sometimes a big sometimes a little wad of greenbacks and toss it to her and she'd catch it too i can tell you and her eyes would beam and dance at him over it oh she didn't love the money for itself but him for trusting her with it for fear you may not understand i must tell you no more generous soul ever lived than agnes milton look at what she did for me and she was always giving a nickel or a dime to some child flowers or fruit to a sick woman money to tie over a friend no beggar was ever turned away empty from her flat but she managed somehow to increase her little hoard in the bank against that possible rainy day well to return at this juncture jim would say oh so sadly his eyes fairly twinkling please ma'am do i get paid today too and then she'd screw up her mouth and twist her head to the side and look at him and say in a most judicial manner well now i really can't say as to that it strikes me you'll have to find that out for yourself oh they didn't mind me he would reach her it seemed in one stride and would pick her up bodily apron money and all after a space she'd disentangle herself and say sternly shaking the while her little forefinger before his delighted eyes jim milton you've overdrawn your wages again and then he'd look oh so contrite and so upset and so shocked at being caught in such a gigantic piece of attempted fraud no he'd say if you only could have heard the mournful drawl of his no now is that so i'm really at heart an honest hard-working man i'll have to pay it back he did i can vouch for it sometimes after this he'd swing her up onto his shoulder and they'd go dashing and prancing and shrieking and laughing all over the little flat once after i had seen scared faces appearing at various windows at times like these i used to rush around and shut the windows down tight two happy children that's what they were then younger even than i there was just the merest suspicion of a cloud over their happiness these days they had been married five years and had no children it was the mother heart of agnes that had yearned over me had pity upon me loved me and brought me to live in the only home i have ever known i have cared for people i care for jim but agnes milton is the only person i have ever really loved i love her still and before it was too late i used to pray that in some way i might change places with her and go into that darkness where though still living one forgets sun and moon and stars and flowers and winds and love itself and existence means dark foul-smelling cages hollow clanging doors hollow monotonous days but a month ago when jim and i went to see her she had changed she had receded even from us she seemed how can i express it blank empty a gray automaton a mere shell no soul looked out at us through her vacant eyes we did not utter a word during our long journey homeward jim had unlocked the door before i spoke jim i said they may still have the poor husk of her cooped up there but her soul thank god at least for that is free at last and jim i cannot tell of his face said never a word but turned away and went heavily down the stairs and i i went into agnes milton's flat and closed the door
you would never have dreamed it was the same place for a long time i stood amid all the brightness and mockery of her sun-drenched rooms and i prayed night and day i have prayed since the same prayer that god if he knows any pity at all may soon soon release the poor spent body of hers i wish i might show you agnes milton of those far-off happy days she wasn't tall and she wasn't short she wasn't stout and she wasn't thin her back was straight and her head high she was rather graceful i thought in coloring she was spanish or italian her hair was not very long but it was soft and silky and black her features were not too sharp her eyes clear and dark a warm leaf brown in fact her mouth was really beautiful this doesn't give her i find it was the shining beauty and gaiety of her soul that lighted up her whole body and somehow made her her and she was generally smiling or chuckling her eyes almost closed when she did so and there were the most delightful crinkles all about them under her left eye was a small scar a reminder of some childhood escapade that became when she smiled the most adorable of dimples one day i remember we were standing at the window in the bright sunlight some excitement in the street below had drawn us i turned to her the reason has gone from me now and called out suddenly agnes milton heavens what is it why you're wrinkling wrinkling where and she began inspecting the smooth freshness of her house dress no your face i exclaimed honest stand still there in that light now just look at them all around your eyes she chuckled how you ever expect me to see them i don't know without a glass or anything and her face crinkled up into a smile there that's it that's how you get them how smiling too much oh no lucy child that's impossible how do you mean impossible you didn't get them that way just wait till i get a glass no don't and she stopped me with a detaining hand i'm not doubting you what i mean is it's absolutely impossible to smile too much i felt my eyes stretching with surprise you mean i said you don't mind being wrinkled you a woman she shook her head at me many times smiling and chuckling softly the while not the very littlest tiniest bit not this much and she showed me just the barest tip of her pink tongue between her white teeth she smiled then and there was the dimple and you only twenty-five i exclaimed she didn't answer for a moment and when she did she spoke quietly lucy child we've all got to wrinkle some time somehow if we live long enough i'd much rather know mine were smile ones than frown ones she waited a second and then looked at me with her beautiful clear eyes and added wouldn't you for reply i leaned forward and kissed them i loved them from that time on here is another memory of her perhaps the loveliest of them all and yet as you will see tingled with the first sadness it came near the end of our happy days it was a may dusk i had been sewing all the afternoon and was as close to the window as i could get to catch the last of the failing light i was trying to thread a needle had been trying for several minutes in fact and was just in the very act of succeeding when two soft hands were clapped over my eyes oh agnes i said none too pleasantly it was provoking there you made me lose my needle bother your old needle crosspatch she said close to my ear she still held her hands over my eyes i waited a moment or so well i said what's the idea please don't be cross came the soft voice still close to my ear i'm not at that she chuckled well i said 
I'm trying to tell you something. Shh, not so loud. Well, go ahead, then. And why must I? Shh. Because you must. I waited. Well, I said a third time, but in a whisper to humor her. We were alone in the flat. There was no reason I could see for this tremendous secrecy. I'm waiting for you to be sweet to me. I am. But why should I have to lose my needle and my temper and be blinded and sweet just to hear something? Is beyond me. Because I don't wish you to see me while I say it. Her soft lips were kissing my ear. Well, I'm very sweet now. What is it? There was another little pause, and during it, her fingers over my eyes trembled a little. She was breathing quicker, too. Agnes Milton, what is it? Wait, I'm just trying to think how to tell you. Are you sure you're very sweet? Sure. I loved the feel of her hands and sat very still. Lucy. Yes? What do you think would be the loveliest, loveliest thing for you to know was, was, there, close, just under your heart? But I waited for no more. I took her hands from my eyes and turned to look at her. The beauty of her face made me catch my breath. At last I said, You mean? I didn't need to finish. Yes, yes. And I'm so happy, happy, happy. And so is Jim. Agnes, oh, my dear, and so am I. And I kissed her two dear eyes. But why mustn't I whoop? I've simply got to, I added. No, no, no. Oh, shh. And for the very first time I saw fear in her eyes. Agnes, I said, what is it? I'm... I'm just a little afraid, I believe. Afraid? I had cried out in surprise. Shh, Lucy, yes. But of what? I spoke in a half whisper, too. You mean you're afraid you may die? Oh, no, not that. What then? Lucy. Her answer came slowly, a little abstractedly. There's such a thing as being too happy, too happy. Nonsense, I answered. But she only shook her head at me slowly many times, and her great wistful eyes came to mine and seemed to cling to them. It made my heart fairly ache, and I turned my head away so that she couldn't see her fears were affecting me. And then, quite suddenly, I felt a disagreeable little chill run up and down my back. Lucy, she said after a little. Yes, I was looking out of the window and not at her. Do you remember Kipling's Without Benefit of Clergy? I did, and I said so. Agnes had Kipling bound in ten beautiful volumes. She loved him. At first that had been enough for me, and then I had come to love him for himself. I had read all of those ten volumes through, from cover to cover, poetry and all. You haven't forgotten Amira, then? No. Poor Amira. She was thoughtful a moment, and then went on. She knew what it was to be too happy. Do you remember what she said once to Holden? Again I felt that queer little shiver. She said many things, as I remember, Agnes. Which? This was after Tota's death. Well, they were on the roof, she and Holden, under the night. Her eyes suddenly widened and darkened, and then she went on. She turned to Holden and said, We must make no protestations of delight, but go softly underneath the stars, lest God find us out. She paused. Do you remember? Yes, I answered, but I couldn't look at her. Well, she spoke slowly and quietly. I have a feeling here, Lucy. And she placed her left hand against her heart. Here, 
that Jim and you and I must go softly, very softly, underneath the stars. Again I felt that unpleasant chill up and down my back. She stood just where she was for a little space, her hands still against her heart, and her eyes wide, dark, and unseeing, fixed straight ahead of her. Then suddenly, and without a sound, she turned and went towards the door and opened it. I started to follow her, but she put up her hand. No, Lucy, please, I wish to be alone, for a little. And with that she went and shut the door very slowly, quite noiselessly behind her. The closing was so slow, so silent, that I could not tell just when it shut. I found myself trembling violently. A sudden and inexplicable terror filled me as that door closed behind her. We were to become accustomed to it, Jim and I, as much as it was possible to do so in those terrible days that were to follow. We were to become used to entering a room in search of Agnes, only to find it empty and the door opposite closing, closing almost imperceptibly, noiselessly, and yes, at last, irrevocably, between us. And each time it happened, the terror was as fresh upon me as at the very first. The days that immediately followed, I cannot say, were really unhappy ones. More to humor Agnes, at first, than anything else, we went softly. But as time passed, even we became infected. Literally and figuratively, we began to go softly under the stars. We came to feel that each of us moved ever with a finger to his lips. There came to be, also, a sort of expectancy upon us, a listening, a waiting. Even the neighbors noticed the difference. Jim still played his ragtime and sang, but softly. We laughed and joked, but quietly. We got so we even washed the dishes and pots and pans quietly. Sometimes Jim and I forgot, but as certainly as we did, there was Agnes in the door, dark-eyed, a little pale, and her, Oh, Jim, oh, Lucy, shh. I haven't spoken of this before, because it wasn't necessary. Agnes had a brother called Bob. He was her favorite of all her brothers and sisters. He was younger than she, five years, I think. A handsome, harem-scarum, happy-go-lucky, restless, reckless daredevil, but sweet-tempered and good-hearted and lovable withal. I don't believe he knew what fear was. His home was in Mississippi, a small town there. It was the family home, in fact. Agnes had lived there herself until she was seventeen or eighteen. He had visited us two or three times, and you can imagine the pandemonium that reigned at such times, for he had come during our happy days. Well, he was very fond of Agnes, and as irresponsible as he seemed, one thing he never failed to do, and that was to write her a letter every single week. Each Tuesday morning, just like clockwork, the very first mail there was his letter. Other mornings, Agnes was not so particular, but Tuesday mornings she always went herself to the mailbox in the hall. It was a Tuesday morning about four months, maybe, after my first experience with the closing door. The bell rang three times, the postman's signal, when he had left a letter. Agnes came to her feet, her eyes sparkling. My letter from Bob, she said, and made for the door. She came back slowly, I noticed, and her face was a little pale and worried. She had an opened and an unopened letter in her hand. Well, what does Bob say? I asked. This, this isn't from Bob, she said slowly. It's only a bill. Well, go ahead and open his letter, I said. There, there wasn't any, Lucy. What? I exclaimed. I was surprised. No, I don't know what it means. It will come probably in the second mail, I said. It has sometimes. Yes, she said. 
I thought rather listlessly. It didn't come in the second mail, nor in the third. Agnes, I said, there's some good explanation. It's not like Bob to fail you. No. He's busy, or got a girl, maybe. She was a little jealous of him, and I hoped this last would rouse her, but it didn't. Yes, maybe that's it, she said, without any life. Well, I hope you're not going to let this interfere with your walk, I said. I had thought, she began, but I cut her off. You promised Jim you'd go out every single day, I reminded her. All right, Agnes Milton's conscience, she said, smiling a little. I'll go then. She hadn't been gone fifteen minutes when the electric bell began shrilling continuously throughout the flat. Somehow I knew it meant trouble. My mind immediately flew to Agnes. It took me a second or so to get myself together, and then I went to the tube. Well, I called. My voice sounded strange and high. A boy's voice answered. Lady here named Mrs. James Milton? Yes, I managed to say. Telegram for use. It wasn't Agnes, after all. I drew a deep breath. Nothing else seemed to matter for a minute. Say, the voice called up from below, what's the matter with you's up there? Bring it up, I said at last. Third floor, front. I opened the door and waited. The boy was taking his time and whistling as he came. Here, I called out as he reached our floor. It was inside his cap, and he had to take it off to give it to me. I saw him eyeing me rather curiously. You Mrs. Milton? he asked. No, but this is her flat. I'll sign for it. She's out. Where do I sign? There? Have you a pencil? With the door shut behind me again, I began to think out what I had better do. Jim was not to be home until late that night. Within five minutes, I had decided. I tore open the yellow envelope and read the message. It ran. Bob died suddenly. Under no circumstances come. Father. The rest of that day was a nightmare to me. I concealed the telegram in my waist. Agnes came home finally and was so alarmed at my appearance, I pleaded a frightful sick headache and went to bed. When Jim came home late that night, Agnes was asleep. I caught him in the hall and gave him the telegram. She had to be told, we decided, because a letter from Mississippi might come at any time. He broke it to her the next morning. We were all hard hit, but Agnes, from that time on, was a changed woman. Day after day dragged by, and the letter of explanation did not come. It was strange, to say the least. The Sunday afternoon following, we were all sitting, after dinner, in the little parlor. None of us had been saying much. Suddenly, Agnes said, Jim. Yes? Wasn't it strange that father never said how or when Bob died? Would have made the telegram too long and expensive, perhaps, Jim replied. We were all thinking, in the pause that followed, the same thing, I dare say. Agnes's father was not poor, and it did seem he might have done that much. And why do you suppose I was not to come under any circumstances? And why don't they write? Just then the bell rang, and there was no chance for a reply. Jim got up in his leisurely way and went to the tube. Agnes and I both listened, a little tensely, I remember. Yes, we heard Jim say, and then, with spaces in between, Joe? Joe who? I think you must have made a mistake. No, I can't say that I do know anyone called Joe. What? Milton? Yes, that's my name. What? Oh, Brooks. Joe Brooks? But Agnes waited for no more. She rushed by me into the hall. Jim! Jim! It's my brother, Joe! To be continued in October issue of The Birth Control Review. End of The Closing Door by Angelina W. Grimke.
Section 25 of Lavender Lit 101 Collection Invocation by Rene Vivienne Reading by Matt Perard this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Invocation by Rene Vivian. Et yo torne sans fin vers les splendeurs étiens, nous évacuons le froid, le angoisse et les torments de tes bazirs plus d'eau que la mille d'hyacinth amante qui versas impérieusement devant les aphrodita dont les sportifs sourires dépassent en croate les fléchés de les héros la rage et le clair de la lyre safa de lesbos les cycles attentifs penchant pour entendre les lambeaux de tes chants ton visage et pereur et des roses de ever recouvertes de cendres et ton les nuptions ignore les soleils ta chevelure en droit au reflux des maris comme les alpes marines et les cendres carottes et tes lèvres Desperis, poivant le pays des oeufs, que te importe les éloges éloquents des poètes, et toi, dans les fronts larges, hélas, des éternités, que importants les frissons des strophes inquiétés, les éblouissements et les sonorités, la musique des flots et remplis d'hommes oreilles, se remue de la mer. Que maman a assez mort de mort dans le rythme en samil comme de l'or à corde au parfum de paphos apprendez nous les secrets de divine douleur apprendez nous les super la implacable caresse oui pleure les plaisirs flétre parme les fleurs longue de l'espos Charm de Mytilene, apprendez-nous le ver de or que ton rea et tufa, de ton harmonious halen, inspire-nous, safa. End of Invocation by Rene Vivian. Section 27 of Lavender Lit 101 Collection. I Sing the Body Electric by Walt Whitman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. I Sing the Body Electric by Walt Whitman. 1. I sing the body electric. The armies of those I love engirth me, and I engirth them they will not let me off till i go with them respond to them and discorrupt them and charge them full with the charge of the soul was it doubted that those who corrupt their own bodies conceal themselves and if those who defile the living are as bad as they who defile the dead and if the body does not do fully as much as the soul and if the body were not the soul what is the soul two the love of the body of man or woman box account the body itself box account that of the male is perfect and that of the female is perfect the expression of the face box account but the expression of a well-made man appears not only in his face it is in his limbs and joints also. It is curiously in the joints of his hips and wrists. It is in his walk, the carriage of his neck, the flex of his waist and knees. Dress does not hide him. The strong, sweet quality he has strikes through the cotton and broadcloth. 
to see him pass conveys as much as the best poem perhaps more you linger to see his back and the back of his neck and shoulder side the sprawl and fullness of babes the bosoms and heads of women the folds of their dress their style as we pass them in the street the contour of their shape downwards the swimmer naked in the swimming bath seen as he swims through the transparent green shine or lies with his face up and rolls silently to and from the heave of the water the bending forward and backward of rowers and rowboats the horseman in his saddle girls mothers housekeepers in all their performances the group of laborers seated at noontime with their open dinner kettles and their wives waiting the female soothing a child the farmer's daughter in the garden or cow yard the young fellow hosing corn the sleigh driver driving his six horses through the crowd the wrestle of wrestlers two apprentice boys quite grown lusty good-natured native-born out on the vacant lot at sundown after work the coats and caps thrown down the embrace of love and resistance the upper hold and under hold the hair rumpled over and blinding the eyes the march of firemen in their own costumes the play of masculine muscle through clean setting trousers and waist straps the slow return from the fire the pause when the bell strikes suddenly again and the listening on the alert the natural perfect varied attitudes the bent head the curved neck and the counting such like i love i loosen myself pass freely am at the mother's breast with the little child swim with the swimmers wrestle with wrestlers march in line with the firemen and pause listen count three i knew a man a common farmer the father of five sons and in them the fathers of sons and in them the fathers of sons this man was of wonderful vigor calmness beauty of person the shape of his head the pale yellow and white of his hair and beard the immeasurable meaning of his black eyes the richness and breadth of his manners these i used to go and visit him to see he was wise also he was six feet tall he was over eighty years old his sons were massive clean bearded tan-faced handsome they and his daughters loved him all who saw him loved him they did not love him by allowance they loved him with personal love he drank water only the blood showed like scarlet through the clear brown skin of his face he was a frequent gunner and fisher he sailed his boat himself he had a fine one presented to him by a ship joiner he had fowling pieces presented to him by men that loved him when he went with his five sons and many grandsons to hunt or fish you would pick him out as the most beautiful and vigorous of the gang you would wish long and long to be with him you would wish to sit by him in the boat that you and he might touch each other four i have perceived that to be with those i like is enough to stop in company with the rest at evening is enough to be surrounded by beautiful curious breathing laughing flesh is enough to pass among them or touch any one or rest my arm ever so lightly round his or her neck for a moment what is this then i do not ask any more delight i swim in it as in a sea there is something in staying close to men and women and looking on them and in the contact and odor of them that pleases the soul well all things please the soul but these please the soul well five this is the female form a divine nimbus exhales from it from head to foot it attracts with fierce undeniable attraction i am drawn by its breath as if i were no more than a helpless vapor all falls aside but myself and it 
books art religion time the visible and solid earth and what was expected of heaven or feared of hell are now consumed mad filaments ungovernable shoots play out of it the response likewise ungovernable hair bosom hips bend of legs negligent falling hands all diffused mine too diffused ebb stung by the flow and flow stung by the ebb love flesh swelling and deliciously aching limitless limpid jets of love hot and enormous quivering jelly of love white blow and delirious nice bridegroom night of love working surely and softly into the prostrate dawn undulating into the willing and yielding day lost in the cleave of the clasping and sweet-fleshed day this the nucleus after the child is born of woman man is born of woman this the bath of birth this the merge of small and large and the outlet again be not ashamed women your privilege encloses the rest and is the exit of the rest you are the gates of the body and you are the gates of the soul the female contains all qualities and tempers them she is in her place and moves with perfect balance she is all things duly veiled she is both passive and active she is to conceive daughters as well as sons and sons as well as daughters as i see my soul reflected in nature as i see through a mist one with inexpressible completeness sanity beauty see the bent head and arms folded over the breast the female i see six the male is not less the soul nor more he too is in his place he too is all qualities he is action and power the flesh of the known universe is in him scorn becomes him well and appetite and defiance become him well the wildest largest passions bliss that is utmost sorrow that is utmost become him well pride is for him the full-spread pride of man is calming and excellent to the soul knowledge becomes him he likes it always he brings everything to the test of himself whatever the survey whatever the sea and the sail he strikes soundings at last only here where else does he strike soundings except here the man's body is sacred, and the woman's body is sacred. No matter who it is, it is sacred. Is it the meanest one in the laborer's gang? Is it one of the dull-faced immigrants just landed on the wharf? Each belongs here, or anywhere, just as much as the well-off, just as much as you. Each has his or her place in the procession. All is a procession. The universe is a procession with measured and perfect motion. Do you know so much yourself that you call the meanest ignorant? Do you suppose you have a right to a good sight, and he or she has no right to a sight? Do you think matter has cohered together from its diffuse float, and the soil is on the surface, and water runs, and vegetation sprouts, for you only, and not for him and her? 7. A man's body at auction, for before the war I often go to the slave mart and watch the sale. I help the auctioneer. The sloven does not half know his business. Gentlemen, look on this wonder. Whatever the bids of the bidders, they cannot be high enough for it, for it the globe lay preparing quintillions of years without one animal or plant, for it the revolving cycles truly and steadily rolled in this head the all-baffling brain in it and below it the makings of heroes examine these limbs red black or white they are cunning in tendon and nerve they shall be stripped that you may see them exquisite senses lifelit eyes pluck volition flakes of breast muscle pliant backbone and neck flesh not flabby good-sized arms and legs and wonders within there yet within there runs blood 
the same old blood the same red running blood there swells and jets a heart there all passions desires reachings aspirations do you think they are not there because they are not expressed in parlors and lecture rooms this is not only one man this the father of those who shall be fathers in their turns in him the start of populous states and rich republics of him countless immortal lives with countless embodiments and enjoyments how do you know who shall come from the offspring of his offspring through the centuries who might you find you have come from yourself if you could trace back through the centuries eight a woman's body at auction she too is not only herself she is the teeming mother of mothers she is the bearer of them that shall grow and be mates to the mothers have you ever loved the body of a woman have you ever loved the body of a man do you not see that these are exactly the same to all in all nations and times all over the earth if anything is sacred the human body is sacred and the glory and sweet of a man is the token of manhood untainted and in man or a woman a clean strong firm fibred body is more beautiful than the most beautiful face have you seen the fool that corrupted his own live body or the fool that corrupted her own live body for they do not conceal themselves and cannot conceal themselves nine oh my body i dare not desert the likes of you and other men and women nor the likes of the parts of you i believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with the likes of the soul and that they are the soul i believe the likes of you shall stand or fall with my poems and that they are my poems man's woman's child's youth's wife's husband's mother's father's young man's young woman's poems head neck hair ears drop and tympan of the ears eyes eye fringes iris of the eye eyebrows and the waking or sleeping of the lids mouth tongue lips teeth roof of the mouth jaws and the jaw hinges nose nostrils of the nose and the partition cheeks temples forehead chin throat back of the neck neck slow strong shoulders manly beard scapula hind shoulders and the ample side round of the chest upper arm armpit elbow socket lower arm arm sinews arm bones wrist and wrist joints hand palm knuckles thumb forefinger finger joints finger nails broad breast front curling hair of the breast breastbone breast side ribs belly backbone joints of the backbone hips hip sockets hip strength inward and outward round man balls man root strong set of thighs well carrying the trunk above leg fibers knee knee pan upper leg under leg ankles instep football toes toe joints the heel all attitudes all the shapeliness all the belongings of my or your body or of anyone's body male or female the lung sponges the stomach sac the bowels sweet and clean the brain in its folds inside the skull frame sympathies heart valves palate valves sexuality maternity womanhood and all that is a woman and the man that comes from woman the womb the teats nipples breast milk tears laughter weeping love looks love perturbations and risings the voice articulation language whispering shouting aloud food drink pulse digestion sweat sleep walking swimming poise on the hips leaping reclining embracing arm curving and tightening the continual changes of the flex of the mouth and around the eyes 
the skin, the sunburnt shade, freckles, hair, the curious sympathy one feels, when feeling with the hand the naked meat of the body, the circling rivers, the breath, and breathing it in and out, the beauty of the waist, and thence of the hips, and thence downward toward the knees, the thin red jellies within you or within me, the bones and the marrow in the bones, the exquisite realization of health. Oh, I say these are not the parts and poems of the body only, but of the soul. Oh, I say now, these are the soul. End of I Sing the Body Electric by Walt Whitman Section 28 of Lavender Lit 101. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sphinx by Oscar Wilde. Recorded by Algie Pug. To Marcel Schwab in Friendship and Admiration. In a dim corner of my room, for longer than my fancy thinks, a beautiful and silent sphinx has watched me through the shifting gloom. In violet and immobile, she does not rise, she does not stir, for silver moons are naught to her, and naught to her the suns that reel. Red follows grey across the air, the waves of moonlight ebb and flow, but with the dawn she does not go, and in the night-time she is there. Dawn follows dawn, and nights grow old, and all the while this curious cat lies couching on the Chinese mat, with eyes of satin rimmed with gold. Upon the mat she lies, and leers, and on the tawny throat of her flutters the soft and silky fur, or ripples to her pointed ears. Come forth, my lovely Seneschal, so somnolent, so statuesque. Come forth, you exquisite grotesque, half woman and half animal. Come forth, my lovely languorous sphinx, and put your head upon my knee, and let me stroke your throat and see your body spotted like the lynx. And let me touch those curving claws of yellow ivory, And grasp the tail that like a monstrous asp Coils round your heavy velvet paws. A thousand weary centuries are thine, While I have hardly seen some twenty summers Cast their green for autumn's gaudy liveries. But you can read the hieroglyphs On the great sandstone obelisks, And you have talked with basilisks, and you have looked on hippogriffs. Oh, tell me, were you standing by when Isis to Osiris knelt? And did you watch the Egyptian melt her union for Antony, and drink the dual drunken wine, and bend her head in mimic awe to see the huge proconsul draw the salted tunny from the brine? And did you mark the Cyprian kiss white Ardon on his catafalque? And did you follow Amenalc? the god of Heliopolis? And did you talk to Thoth, and did you hear the moon-horned Io weep, and know the painted king to sleep beneath the wedge-shaped pyramid? Lift up your large black satin eyes, which are like cushions where one sinks. Fawn at my feet, fantastic sphinx, and sing me all your memories. Sing to me of the Jewish maid who wandered with the holy child, and how you led them through the wild, and how they slept beneath your shade. Sing to me of that odorous green eve, when, crouching by the marge, you heard from Adrian's gilded barge the laughter of Antinous, and lapped the stream, and fed your drouth, and watched with hot and hungry stare the ivory body of that rare young slave with his pomegranate mouth. Sing to me of the labyrinth, in which the twy-formed bull was stalled. Sing to me of the night you crawled across the temple's granite plinth, when, through the purple corridors, the screaming scarlet ibis flew in terror, 
and a horrid dew dripped from the moaning mandragoras and the great torpid crocodile within the tank shed slimy tears and tear the jewels from his ears and staggered back into the nile and the priest cursed you with shrill psalms as in your claws you seized their snake and crept away with it to slake your passion by the shuddering palms who were your lovers who were they who wrestled for you in the dust which was the vessel of your lust what leman had you every day did giant lizards come and crouch before you on the reedy banks did gryphons with great metal flanks leap on you in your trampled couch did monstrous hippopotami come sidling toward you in the mist did gilt-scaled dragons writhe and twist with passion as you passed them by and from the brick-built lycian tomb what horrible chimera came with fearful heads and fearful flame to breed new wonders from your womb or had you shameful secret quests and did you harry to your home some nereid coiled in amber foam with curious rock crystal breasts or did you treading through the froth call to the brown sidonian for tidings of leviathan leviathan or behemoth or did you when the sun was set climb up the cactus-covered slope to meet your swarthy ethiop whose body was of polished jet or did you while the earthen skiffs dropped down the grey nilotic flats at twilight and the flickering bats flew round the temple's triple glyphs steal to the border of the bar and swim across the silent lake and slink into the vault and make the pyramid your lupinar till from each black sarcophagus rose up the painted swarthed dead or did you lure unto your bed the ivory horned tregelephos or did you love the god of flies who plagued the hebrews and was splashed with wine unto the waist or pushed who had green beryls for her eyes or that young god the tyrian who was more amorous than the dove of ashtaroth or did you love the god of the Assyrian, whose wings, like strange transparent talc, rose high above his hawk-faced head, painted with silver and with red, and ribbed with rods of ore calc? Or did huge Apis, from his car leap down and lay before your feet, big blossoms of the honey-sweet and honey-coloured nenephar? How subtle, secret is your smile! Did you love none then? nay i know great ammon was your bedfellow he lay with you beside the nile the river horses in the slime trumpeted when they saw him come odorous with syrian galbanum and smeared with spikenard and with thyme he came across the river bank like some tall galley argent sailed he strode across the waters mailed in beauty and the waters sank he strode across the desert sand he reached the valley where you lay he waited till the dawn of day then touched your black breasts with his hand you kissed his mouth with mouths of flame you made the horned god your own you stood behind him on his throne you called him by his secret name you whispered monstrous oracles into the caverns of his ears with blood of goats and blood of steers you taught him monstrous miracles white ammon was your bedfellow your chamber was the steaming nile and with your curved archaic smile you watched his passion come and go with syrian oils his brows were bright and widespread as a tent at noon his marble limbs made pale the moon and lent the day a larger light his long hair was nine cubits span and coloured like that yellow gem which hidden in their garments hem the merchants bring from kurdistan his face was as the must that lies upon a vat of new-made wine the seas could not in sapphire the perfect azure of his eyes his thick soft throat was white as milk and threaded with thin veins of blue and curious pearls like frozen dew were broidered on his flowing silk on pearl and porphyry pedestalled 
he was too bright to look upon for on his ivory breast there shone the wondrous ocean emerald that mystic moonlit jewel which some diver of the colchian caves had found beneath the blackening waves and carried to the colchian witch before his gilded galliot ran naked vine-wreathed corybants and lines of swaying elephants knelt down to draw his chariot and lines of swarthy nubians bear up his litter as he rode down the great granite paven road between the nodding peacock fans the merchants brought him steer tight from sidon in their painted ships the meanest cup that touched his lips was fashioned from a chrysolite the merchants brought him cedar chests of rich apparel bound with cords his train was borne by memphian lords young kings were glad to be his guests ten hundred shaven priests did bow to ammon's altar day and night ten hundred lamps did wave their light through ammon's carven house and now foul snake and speckled adder with their young ones crawl from stone to stone for ruined is the house and prone the great rose marble monolith wild ass or trotting jackal comes and couches in the mouldering gates wild satyrs call unto their mates across the fallen fluted drums and on the summit of the pile the blue-faced ape of horus sits and gibbers while a fig tree splits the pillars of the peristyle the god is scattered here and there deep hidden in the windy sand i saw his giant granite hand still clenched in impotent despair and many a wandering caravan of stately negroes silken shawled crossing the desert halts appalled before the neck that none can span and many a bearded bedouin draws back his yellow striped burnous to gaze upon the titan thews of him who was thy paladin go seek his fragments on the moor and wash them in the evening dew and from their pieces make anew thy mutilated paramour go seek them where they lie alone and from their broken pieces make thy bruised bedfellow and wake mad passions in the senseless stone charm his dull ear with syrian hymns he loved your body oh be kind pour spikenard on his hair and wind soft rolls of linen round his limbs wind round his head the figured coins stain with red fruits those pallid lips weave purple for his shrunken hips and purple for his barren loins away to egypt have no fear only one god has ever died only one god has let his side be wounded by a soldier's spear but these thy lovers are not dead still by the hundred cubit gate dog-faced anubis sits in state with lotus lilies for thy head still from his chair of porphyry gaunt memnon strains his lidless eyes across the empty land and cries each yellow morning unto thee and nihilus with his broken horn lies in his black and oozy bed until thy coming will not spread his waters on the withering corn your lovers are not dead i know they will rise up and hear your voice and clash their cymbals and rejoice and run to kiss your mouth and so set wings upon your argosies set horses to your ebon car back to your nile or if you are grown sick of dead divinities follow some roving lion's spore across the copper-coloured plain reach out and hail him by the main and bid him be your paramour couch by his side upon the grass and set your white teeth in his throat and when you hear his dying note lash your long flanks of polished brass and take a tiger for your mate whose amber sides are flecked with black and ride upon his gilded back in triumph through the theban gate and toy with him in amorous jests and when he turns and snarls and gnaws oh smite him with your jasper claws and bruise him with your agate breasts why are you tarrying 
get hence i weary of your sullen ways i weary of your steadfast gaze your somnolent magnificence your horrible and heavy breath makes the light flicker in the lamp and on my brow i feel the damp and dreadful dews of night and death your eyes are like fantastic moons that shiver in some stagnant lake your tongue is like a scarlet snake that dances to fantastic tunes your pulse makes poisonous melodies and your black throat is like the hole left by some torch or burning coal on saracenic tapestries away the sulphur-coloured stars are hurrying through the western gate away or it may be too late to climb their silent silver cars see the dawn shivers round the grey gilt dialed towers and the rain streams down each diamonded pane and blurs with tears the wannish day what snake tressed fury fresh from hell with uncouth gestures and unclean stole from the poppy drowsy queen and led you to a student's cell what songless tongueless ghost of sin crept through the curtains of the night and saw my taper burning bright and knocked and bade you enter in are there not others more accursed whiter with leprosies than i are abana and par far dry that you come here to slake your thirst get hence you loathsome mystery hideous animal get hence you wake in me each bestial sense you make me what i would not be you make my creed a barren sham you wake foul dreams of sensual life and Attis with his blood-stained knife were better than the thing i am false sphinx false sphinx by reedy sticks old charon leading on his oar waits for my coin go thou before and leave me to my crucifix whose pallid burden sick with pain watches the world with wearied eyes and weeps for every soul that dies and weeps for every soul in vain end of the sphinx by oscar wilde section 29 of lavender lit 101 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monday or Tuesday by Virginia Woolf Recording by Eden Ray Hedrick Monday or Tuesday Lazy and indifferent, shaking space easily from his wings, knowing his way, the heron passes over the church beneath the sky, white and distant, absorbed in itself, Endlessly the sky covers and uncovers, moves and remains. A lake? Blot the shores of it out. A mountain? Oh, perfect! The sun gold on its slopes. Down that falls. Ferns, then, or white feathers, for ever and ever. Desiring truth, awaiting it, laboriously distilling a few words. For ever desiring. A cry starts to the left another to the right. Wheels strike divergently. Omnibuses conglomerate in conflict. Forever desiring. The clock asseverates with twelve distinct strokes that it is midday. Light sheds gold scales. Children swarm. Forever desiring truth. Red is the dome. Coins hang on the trees. Smoke trails from the chimneys. Bark, shout, cry iron for sale and truth radiating to a point men's feet and women's feet black or gold encrusted this foggy weather sugar no thank you the commonwealth of the future the firelight darting and making the room red save for the black figures and their bright eyes while outside a van discharges miss thingamy drinks tea at her desk and plate-glass preserves fur coats. Flaunted, leaf-light, drifting at corners, blown across the wheels, silver-splashed, home or not home, gathered, scattered, 
squandered in separate scales, swept up, down, torn, sunk, assembled, and truth? Now to recollect by the fireside on the white square of marble, from ivory depths words rising shed their blackness, blossom and penetrate, fall in the book, in the flame, in the smoke, in the momentary sparks, or now voyaging, the marble square pendant, minarets beneath, into the Indian seas, while space rushes blue and stars glint. Truth? Or now, content with closeness? Lazy and indifferent, the heron returns. The sky veils her stars, then bears them. End of Monday or Tuesday by Virginia Woolf